Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. Please take your seats. Okay, I have received notice from the Minister for Infrastructure that she wishes to make a statement. Before I call the Minister, I remind members here in the Chamber that in light of social distancing being observed by the parties, the Speaker's ruling that members must be in the Chamber to hear a statement if they wish to ask a question has been relaxed. Members participating remotely must make sure that their name is on a speaking list if they wish to be called. Members present in the Chamber must also do, this, do so 
uh, but may do so by raising in their place as well as notifying the business office or spe speaker's table directly. And I do remind members to be concise in asking their question. I also remind members that in accordance with long established procedure, points of order are not normally taken during the statement or the question period after. And I call to the Minister for Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And with your permission and in compliance with Section 52 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, I wish to make the following statement to the Assembly in respect of a joint British Irish Council ministerial meeting of the Collaborative Spatial Planning and Housing Work Sectors held virtually on 25 February 2021. This was a joint ministerial meeting which I co chaired with the Minister for Communities, Minister Hargey. Given the joint nature of the meeting, I would propose to make a statement to members in respect of the spatial planning elements of the meeting and understand that Minister Hargey is making a similar, separate statement in respect of the housing elements of the same meeting. To ensure appropriate community representation at the meeting, members will note that Junior Minister Middleton was also in attendance and is aware that I am making this statement to the Assembly today. Members will be aware that the British Irish Council established in 1999, is a forum for its members to discuss, consult and use best endeavours to reach agreement on cooperation on matters of mutual interest within the competence of its members' administrations. The British Irish Council Collaborative Spatial Planning Work Sector is chaired by my department on behalf of the Executive. The group provides a constructive forum for facilitating thematic evidence exchange sharing of best practice and promotes practical collaboration. The joint ministerial meeting held on the 25th of February focused on the joint work that the collaborative spatial planning work sector has recently taken forward in conjunction with the housing work sector and considered how these work sectors can enable BIC member administrations to continue to work together on the key areas of planning and housing particularly in the context of the impact of COVID-19. As I have previously highlighted, the Executive was represented at the joint ministerial meeting by myself and Ministers Hargate and Middleton. The Government of Guernsey was represented by Deputy Victoria Oliver, President of the Development and Planning Authority. The Government of Ireland was represented by Mr Dara O'Brien, TD, Minister for Housing, Local Government and Heritage, and Mr Peter Burke, TD, Minister of State for Local Government and Planning. The Isle of Man Government was represented by the Hon. Tim Baker, Minister for Infrastructure, and the Hon. Ray Harmer, Minister for Policy and Reform. The Government of Jersey was represented by Deputy John Young, Minister for the Environment and Deputy Russell Leiby, Minister for Housing and Communities. The Scottish Government was represented by Mr Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, and the British Government was represented by the Right Honourable Christopher Pincher MP, Minister of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government. The Welsh Government was represented by Julie James, Minister for Housing and Local Government. Ministers considered and reflected on the papers from each of the work sectors that were presented at the ministerial meeting, which included a discussion on challenges and opportunities for the housing and spatial planning sectors. Ministers also endorsed a joint publication prepared by both work sectors on key spatial planning and housing challenges associated with an ageing population entitled Creating an Inclusive Future Vision for Ageing Populations. The booklet focuses on the implications of the changing demography of the BIC administrations and the potential impact of an ageing population on spatial planning and housing. It builds upon a symposium event on ageing, which was held in Belfast in November 2019, and aims to provide key advice for those working in housing and spatial planning and share some best practice examples of how places and the housing within those places can be developed to meet the needs of our ageing populations. Ministers also noted and agreed the content of a forward work plan for the collaborative spatial planning work sector up to 2023. The forward work plan identifies a number of areas of focus, including the contribution of spatial planning to the revitalisation of towns, the contribution of spatial planning to building better places in the context of the COVID recovery, continued sharing of best practice in relation to the national and regional planning frameworks, 
and the promotion of expert learning and experience sharing across the member administrations. I believe the agreement of this forward work plan is particularly timely and aligns with many of the ambitions of my own department in terms of creating better places in which people want to live, do business and spend their leisure time. As an Assembly, we have already acknowledged that we need to revitalise our town centres and as we start to emerge from the pandemic and the focus moves to a post-COVID recovery, an opportunity exists to consider how spatial planning can support our places to build back better and tackle the climate crisis. I believe that in this context, the British Irish Council continues to offer an essential framework for sharing challenges and best practices across the administrations. Finally, I want to place on record my thanks to those ministerial colleagues across the BIC member administrations who participated so productively in the joint ministerial meeting, and I look forward to learning about the outcomes arising from the Collaborative Spatial Planning Forward Work Plan and Associated Ministerial Meeting, which it was agreed should take place in 2023. I am happy, Mr Speaker, to take questions from members in respect of the spatial planning elements of the joint ministerial meeting. Thank you. And I call the Chairpartner of the Committee for Infrastructure, Michelle McElveen. In creating an, an inclusive vision for our ageing population. And a great deal of focus in development plans in the UK and other countries over the years is very much focused on the youth and largely excluded older people. And cities and towns are not the exclusive property of the youth, and it is important that spatial planning policies are developed to be as inclusive of all groups as possible. Um, certainly, the constituency I represent is one of the oldest demographics. Um, age demographics in Northern Ireland. The pandemic has highlighted the great lack in some areas of open public space for exercise. And we all know the benefits in terms of mental wellbeing of access to green space and nature. Does this new joint approach recognise the importance of green space and will the minister take more proactive steps to protect green space in our towns and villages? And in terms of an ageing population, will the Minister be looking at embedding policies which are not only age friendly but also dementia friendly? And again, my constituency is not only one of the oldest populations but one with the highest incidence of dementia. And very finally, Mr Speaker, um, given that the councils are significantly down the road in terms of the development of their LDPs, what impact will this new approach have in relation to those plans and their reassessment and adoption? Very sorry about that, Minister. Uh, my apologies. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm away ahead of myself this Monday morning. It shows you how eager I am to get the business done today. And uh, it wasn't about here and his dulce toes as opposed to your own. But anyway, I call the Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and, and I thank the Chair for her comments and her questions. I absolutely agree on the importance of ensuring that as many citizens as possible can access open spaces. As the Chair uh, of the Infrastructure Committee rightly points out, it delivers multiple physical and mental health and wellbeing benefits. And I think that's certainly one of the things that we have learnt the value of as a result of the pandemic. The Member will be aware of the investment that I have announced in our Greenways. The Member may also know about the £5 million contribution that my department made to the revitalisation fund, which was a joint venture to support councils uh, by my department, the Department for Communities and DERA. And my contribution is about ensuring that we can maximise open and accessible spaces for all of our citizens. I agree with her that we do face challenges of an ageing demographic in terms of our population and our planning, housing and health sector will have to adapt to meet it. I also agree with her in the importance of not just ensuring that facilities and spaces are accessible and inclusive and safe, but that they are also dementia friendly. Uh, this is an area that I have a particular interest in and have worked with the sector uh, in my capacity as an MLA. And I want to acknowledge the great work that's being done by some of our councils to make their council areas uh, dementia friendly uh, places. So happy to continue to support all of that work. As the member points out, um, the councils are advancing their new development plans um, and my departmental planning officials have oversight of the LDB programme so we will be working with them closely um, to ensure that we are, it's a phrase, building back better together but we all have a role, I have it at a strategic level but a critical role has to be played by our local councils in terms of their local development plans and their community plans as well. Nicole Cattleboyle. 
Margaret Concord, I'm glad the Minister answered that question. <laughs> uh, just following on from the previous question, I mean, the Minister is keen on active travel, and I'm just wondering, was there any discussions to bolster active travel? Because, you know, we've learned through COVID that you know, there's an opportunity now for people to live uh, more active and healthier lives. And as part of any planning process or any, any planning regulations now, could you ensure that active travel is built in in any physical infrastructure? Um, I can assure the member that um, the representations that were made across all of the governments and the administrations were very strong on this point. They talked about the importance of making sure that we provide more opportunities for active travel for all of our citizens, talked about that being a key element in the revitalisation of towns uh, and village centres because of the benefits uh, that it will bring. Um, we talked about the importance of people-centred place shipping. Uh, and it was fascinating because while we may have different terminologies in terms of the strategies at each uh, you know, of our governments are moving forward. There was great commonality in terms of the challenges, but also the opportunities that we see to embed active travel and embed climate action at the heart of everything we do. So it certainly is a shared ambition across all of the BIC administrations and something that I think will be a strong element um, when the final reports are carried out on the Forward Work Programme. Nicole Dolores Kelly. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for a statement that is clear. The Minister values the uh, relationship across these islands, east, west, north and south, and the shared learning around Brexit, COVID and uh, uh, climate change. But, Minister, you, 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 your statement particularly referenced uh, spatial planning. I just wonder, in terms of designing out crime, uh, particularly if we are looking at the needs of older people and the fear of crime, is a particular anxiety amongst older demographics? thank the member for her question. She does raise a very important point on the need for collaboration and partnership working right across these islands. You know, I've said time and again the challenges that we face, be it Brexit, COVID, the climate emergency, no, no borders. And what struck me at the meeting was how valuable getting to listen to other ministers was in terms of the challenges. But the strategies that they're bringing forward, some are at a more advanced stage than other places, so it was hugely beneficial and it's something that I remain committed to. Um, on the issue of designing out crime, that is a very uh, important point, uh, and I know that it's an issue that councils and local communities in particular are working on, I'm conscious even of my own constituency in North Belfast. But I also think we have to be very careful that we don't just see designing out crime as getting up communities, it needs to be much more holistic in its approach. So it is about the design of places. It's about engagement with young people. It's about um, a policing response. It's about community empowerment. It's all of those things. And certainly, yes, planning and spatial planning has a role to play in all of that. Nicole Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Minister for her statement. Um, the statement refers to the challenges of COVID of climate change and an ageing population, and it endorses uh, the document creating an inclusive fu future vision for our ageing populations. So my question to the Minister is, um, uh, in uh, creating that opportunities for the future, uh, which recommends that uh, properties and residents should be uh, developed along existing transport routes, where there will be short walks, where there will be proximity to urban centres, and service that can be easily accessible. Uh, my question to the Minister is, does she feel that, that there is a need to change any of our current uh, planning regulations and guidance, uh, or to give additional uh, interaction and discussion with our councils as they are finalising area plans? I thank uh, the member um, for his question. Um, I always think that there is room for improvement in the planning system, and the department has undertaken a number uh, of measures. Um, one of them, in particular, because it's something that I feel very strongly about, is our engagement, improving our engagement with communities. So, the member may be aware of the community engagement partnership. Uh, that I recently announced, and it's all about improving the community's experience of the planning process, but also making sure that they can have uh, a much more influential role. One of the things I'm very mindful of is that the planning process is very difficult to navigate, and it has such a huge impact on communities' lives. Communities should be more involved in the shaping, feel comfortable to navigate, to object, to support. Uh, and so that's an area of work that I would like my officials to continue working on at a departmental level. But you're right as well in our engagement with local councils and through the local development plans and their community plans. I think there's huge opportunities here to do things differently and to do them better. Nicole Andre Muir. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her statement. A uh, major piece of legislation which underpins planning in the Northern Ireland's 2011 Planning Act, and as the Minister be aware, there is a review under, being undertaken in relation to that. Can the Minister provide an update in relation to that and also provide an assurance that nothing will be off limits in terms of that review and all feedback will be duly considered? Thank you. Thank the member for his question. Um, the review of the implementation of the Planning Act is ongoing. On the 15th of February, the Department issued a call for evidence to a targeted list of stakeholders and interested parties asking for their views, and responses are requested by the 15th of March. Um, the call for evidence has been posted on the Department's website, and while it is primarily targeted at identified stakeholders, anyone who wishes to express their views will have the opportunity to do so, which I think is important. Uh, the focus of the review is on the implementation of the legislative provisions of the Act itself and the extent to which the original objectives of the Act have been achieved. This will then inform whether there is a need to retain, amend or repeal any provisions of the Act. Um, the review will also provide an opportunity to consider any improvements or fixes which may be required to the way in which the Planning Act has been commenced and implemented in subordinate legislation. Issues with the planning system that have arisen as a result of the coronavirus pandemic will be considered uh, as part of this review as well, and this may not always require legislative change. Uh, once the responses to the call for evidence have been collated, the Department intends to engage further with the Committee for Infrastructure before summer recess to set out and discuss the views received and the Department's suggested response. I call Liz Kimmins. I thank the Minister for her statement. I see the contribution of spatial planning to the revitalisation of towns as well as COVID recovery was agreed to be an area of focus for the sectors moving forward. And it's vital that we um, help our local towns and businesses to come out of COVID on a strong footing. Um, the Parklet scheme in Belfast is one that has attracted the eyes of many and it's a very innovative way, I suppose, of adapting to the new dispensation that we find ourselves in and, and helping businesses. Um, in that way, and I would encourage the minister to, to work closely with councils across the north um, in, in the further rollout of this initiative. Um, I have written to the minister recently about uh, uh, interest in this scheme for Newry, and I just wanted to ask if this is something that was discussed um, on, on, a, on a broader basis, obviously, but with, at the meeting, and if the case for parklets across the north has been strengthened coming out of the meeting. Thank you. Question. Uh, we did not get into a discussion on parklets per se, but what we did discuss was the need to reimagine uh, our spaces in our town centres to make them more accessible and um, better in terms of people to, to visit and to spend their money supporting local businesses. So it is something that I would be keen to continue to work with councils on. Um, the member did reference the Ormo Road parklet. It has been a huge success, and I would like to see many more of them developed right across Northern Ireland. Can we please bring the member Martina Anderson into the spotlight, please? Can I call on Martina Anderson to ask her a question? Uh, thank you, thank you, Minister. Um, Minister, the, the issue of wastewater capacity is one of the biggest issues facing housing and planning in the north. And there are plans underway to build, for instance, a wastewater treatment pump at the Derry Donegal border. So the lack of sewage capacity does not literally block the development of 4,000 housing units in the border area of Skeg. So, Minister, this could potentially benefit from the collaborative spatial planning that your statements address. So, was the issue uh, with regards to sewage and rather than back to back development, but collaborative development, collaborative spatial planning development in places like Derry and Donegal discussed or raised at the meeting? I thank the member for her question. While the issue of water and wastewater infrastructure was not referenced at the meeting, the member is right to highlight it here today. There has been historic underinvestment in our water and wastewater infrastructure, and as a result, there are some 116 locations now across Northern Ireland that are either at or almost at uh, maximum development capacity, and that will inevitably have a knock-on effect in terms of development, whether that is building the many new homes that we need, uh, building schools, uh, building hotels once we get through this. So it is a huge challenge. 
It's a huge challenge as well when we reflected upon the next price control period. Some £2 billion has been identified for capital investment. Um, so I will continue to engage with my executive colleagues on this matter, uh, because if we are to realise and deliver on our um, ambitions and our outcomes and our programme for government, then we do have to have significant and sustainable investment in our water and wastewater infrastructure, which underpins it all. I remember Mark Durgan. I call Mark Durgan. I thank the Minister for her statement and answers thus far. A member has already spoken or asked about the importance of the revitalisation of our town centres. Did the Minister at the meeting discuss with or take the opportunity to learn anything from her counterparts from other regions that might inform her actions to revitalise town centres, previously struggling, but now many of which are facing decimation? Thank the member um, for his question. Um, I think that, as I say, I was heartened by the fact that all of the administrations recognised the importance of the revitalisation uh, of our town centres and our villages. Uh, we did reflect on the fact that our town centres were struggling pre-COVID, uh, and the reality is that life will change now as a result of COVID, and our high streets will take on a very different format, and they need to be supported to do that. I think what we need to be doing is making our town centres uh, attractive places for people to want to visit, uh, to spend money, uh, but to spend time. Um, and so I'm keen and remain committed to working with councils to do that. I think one of the initiatives um, that was discussed at the, the meeting was the 20-minute um, to town uh, approach by the Scottish Government, um, ensuring that towns and facilities are within a 20-minute walkway. I certainly think that's something you know, that has, will bring huge benefits to citizens and something that you know, I want to look at much carefully as well. They call Dagla Magalier. Um, um, I note that the, the Minister has made reference to spatial planning in the context of revitalising towns, and, and I uh, very much welcome that there. Our towns are under pressure, and no doubt the announcement today of the closure, the plans to close uh, 15 Bank of Ireland branches throughout the north, and towns like Strabane and Lesnesky will come as an hour body blow. Can I also uh, ask, ask the, the, the Minister that was the, was the issue of rural needs discussed in the context of spatial plan? Because the Minister will hopefully appreciate that, as for me, being a representative of the rural West, we have a very historical issue of regional imbalance. And if we are to get uh, use spatial plan correctly to address regional imbalance, then rural needs will have to be taken into account. I thank the member for his question, and I share his concerns about the impact of closures announced today uh, across the island by the, the Bank of Ireland. I can assure him that rural, uh, the needs of rural communities was discussed um, at our meeting. Uh, in fact, one of the agreed areas for the forward work programme around the contribution of spatial planning to the revitalisation of towns makes, spe uh, sorry, makes specific reference to how the sector will explore the urban and rural dimensions of town revitalisation, particularly in the context of uh, post-COVID recovery, and that this work will consider how positive placemaking can support revitalisation in our rural areas as well, and the decarbonisation agenda, which I know is a significant challenge for our rural communities, given they, they don't have the same level of accessibility to public transport um, you know, as other places would have. So yes, the, the needs of urban, or, uh, urban communities, but also the needs of our rural communities as well, was discussed. And I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the Minister uh, for her statement. Uh, Minister, you, you have, uh, and uh, within your statement, and as the questions have gone gone along, you have made much reference to the involvement of the community in, in the initiative, and, and, and that is that is quite right. Can I ask you, Minister, that that is sometimes a, a phrase that is used or a word that is used. We're involving the community. What does community mean in terms of making decisions around this? And there are, Minister, those groups and bodies who have particular interest in the development of whatever asset or factor of life for our ageing population. And in community development, would the Minister give weighted preference to those bodies as development takes place? around spatial initiatives to those bodies representing the needs of the ageing population? 
I thank the member um, for his question. And you know, he is right to point out that we talk about um, community involvement and community participation, and sometimes it can be a slogan as opposed to very de demonstrative um, action. To reassure him around the plan and engagement partnership that I have convened, it is specifically to look at how to enhance the quality and depth of community engagement in the planning process at both the regional and local planning levels and help to improve the planning system experience uh, for you users. Um, the partnership provides an opportunity for sharing experience, good practice and learning gained through the operation of the planning system since the reforms were introduced in April 2015 and for considering what more we can do to enhance uh, community involvement. Um, the cross-section of people on the partnership as well should assist with ensuring that a wide range of experience and views inform the work so that we're not just hearing from, quote, usual voices. Um, the response to the invitation to participate in the partnership is very encouraging, as is the level of interest shown by the general public. The member will know that the majority of planning applications are determined at the local council level. Um, but I do think, as I've said in response to other questions, that community development plans as well as local development plans provide a real opportunity to better involve our communities at every level and I always think there's an obligation on all of us to ensure that we are where we can trying to be creative and reaching out to hear the voices of those who don't feel that they um, can get access to processes in the same way so I think whether we term it the harder to reach groups I think that there's a responsibility on all of us to make sure that we are trying as best we can to listen to as many voices across the community I always operate from a principle that local people know best, so the member will know that the Blue Green Fund, for example, I was very clear I'm not imposing change from on high. It doesn't work. It's not sustainable. So it's about kind of supporting communities to drive change and lasting change from the ground up. Nicole Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her statement and her answers so far, especially on raising the voices of those traditionally silenced within the uh, community on plannings. We need to have equal rights of appeal in our Planning Act as a starter. Um, but the Minister says in her statement that an opportunity exists to consider how spatial planning can support our places to build back better and address the climate challenge. But there's no mention of climate-based reforms of planning in the Forward Work Programme. So does she agree that it is not a challenge but a crisis that we face and that there is not an opportunity but an urgent need to address climate breakdown? And how does she envision the spatial planning work sector of the BIC playing a role in improving accountability within our planning system when it comes to climate impacts? I thank the member for her question. I think the challenge in all of this is there was multiple administrations at a meeting and there were many topics that we would have liked to have discussed and there are many areas that we would have liked to focus on in our forward work programme, uh, but we had to be targeted. But I can assure the member that under the agreed forward work programme on the contribution of spatial planning to building better places in the context of the COVID-19 recovery, we have made it clear that consideration will also be given to how post-COVID placemaking can contribute to supporting the green economy and the decarbonisation agenda and contribute to improving mental health and wellbeing, interlinked with our agreed uh, commitments around the revitalisation of towns and our villages as well. And that concludes questions on the statement. Could I ask members to please take your ease for a moment or two?
Thank you, members. I have received notice from the Minister for Communities, Ms. Deidre Hargy. She wishes to make a statement. Minister. Thanks very much. Um, so just with your permission, I wish to make the following report of the British Irish Council Collaborative Spatial Planning and Housing Work Sectors Joint Ministerial Meeting via a virtual format on the 25th of February. This is a joint ministerial co-chaired uh, with the Minister of Infrastructure, from whom you have just heard, and I will make a statement to the Assembly in respect of the housing elements of the meeting. Minister Mallon addressed the Assembly on the spatial planning aspects of the meeting. Gary Middleton, MLA Junior Minister in the Executive Office, also represented the Executive at the meeting. This report has been endorsed by, our jun by Junior Minister Middleton, and he has agreed that I make the housing element of this statement on behalf of both of us. The British Irish Council was established in 1999 as a forum uh, for its members to discuss, consult and use best endeavours to reach agreement on cooperation on matters of mutual interest. The British Irish Council housing work sector is led by the Executive, and this group has proved to be a constructive forum for facilitating thematic evidence exchange and practical collaboration. The meeting last Thursday focused on the housing work sector programme of work, as well as the joint work uh, that the two groups had undertaken recently. The meeting also considered how the future work of the housing work sector can enable BIC uh, member administrations to continue to work together on key areas of planning, housing and particularly in the context of the impact of COVID-19. The meeting was jointly chaired, as I say, by myself and Minister Mallon um, on behalf of the Executive. Ministers considered and reflected on the papers from each of the work sectors that were presented at the ministerial meeting which included a discussion on challenges and opportunities of improving housing supply. Ministers also endorsed a joint publication prepared by the Spatial Planning and Housing Work Sectors, with the key uh, spatial planning and housing challenges associated with an ageing population, entitled Creating an Inclusive Future – Vision for Our Ageing Populations. The booklet acknowledged the changing demographics are an important issue and one which needs to be considered in terms of increasing the supply of social and affordable homes for some of the most vulnerable within our communities. The booklet highlighted a number of examples of emerging innovations in the design and completion of housing units, and I am keen to continue working with planning colleagues to maximise the role of the planning system in terms of increasing housing supply. Indeed, this work will inform the development of the housing supply strategy, which I am bringing forward for the executive consideration in this mandate. This strategy will explore and seek to find answers in terms of how we can increase the supply of quality, sustainable and affordable homes. The key principles and examples of best practice outlined in the joint housing and CSP work sector booklet can help inform this work. Ministers also noted and agreed the content uh, of the forward work plan for the housing work sectors, which identified areas of focus for the work sector over the next three years. The really obvious point is that they are all facing the same challenges, that there is so much that we can learn from each other. The first area of focus for the housing work sector by ministers is the challenge presented by climate change. The challenge um, affects us all. Constructing new homes generates pollutants that accelerate global warming. And similarly, the heating the homes uh, we all have, as well as building new homes, means that we will end up burning more fossil fuels. About 14 per cent of our greenhouse gas emissions come from our homes. And to be carbon neutral by 2050, this has to change. We will need to find new ways to ensure that these challenges do not limit the supply of homes, and particularly for those in society who need our help the most. This is an issue that we all must address, and I am particularly keen for officials to work with other BIC administrations to come up with solutions to the challenges which affect all of our societies. The second area is the provision of suitable, affordable housing. And I strongly believe that housing is a basic need and right for all. Our executive policy as set out a new decade new approach agreement aims to achieve a fair and compassionate society that supports working families and protects the most vulnerable. 
Crucial to this is ensuring that every household has access to good, quality, affordable and sustainable homes that are appropriate to fit their needs. And indeed, housing should be a standalone outcome in the forthcoming programme for government. I am therefore always interested to hear how policy makes um, policymakers tackle the difficult issues. And I know my officials engage regularly across the administrations to share experience, knowledge and information. Ongoing engagement through the British Irish Council and the delivery of the work plan will be helpful in terms of informing my ambitions around the housing agenda, which amongst others will seek to expand the range of affordable intermediate housing options available. The final area of focus um, is around housing role in social, or sorry, health and social care. And I am particularly pleased to see this being considered as part of the forward work plan. I have seen at first hand throughout this pandemic how an effective joined up collaborative approach between the housing sector, health professionals and the third sector can make a huge difference to those in acute need of support. This work has been critical and provided support and refuge to those who otherwise may have been left to face a truly desperate situation. For example, my department has worked closely with health and social care professionals to support the chronically homeless. There have been some of the most vulnerable people in our society, and at the start of this pandemic, I am very pleased that they, or sorry, I am very concerned that they would have been left uh, exposed. This work included uh, the Department of Health housing rough sleepers with no uh, right to homeless assistance. And I want to take the opportunity to thank the Minister um, for Health and his assistance so that everyone on our streets was able to come inside and comply with government guidance around shielding, self-isolation and social distance. It's a collaboration like this which makes a real difference to people on the ground. Unfortunately, this issue is common across all the big administrations and was discussed at the meeting last week. And collaboration on this and other issues where housing impacts on health and social care will be further explored as part of the ongoing work programme. Finally, I want to put on record just my thanks to ministerial uh, colleagues across these islands who participated productively in the meeting. And I look forward to the further meeting on the housing work sectors, which will take place in 2023. Thank you, Minister. Uh, before I call the Chair of the Communities Committee, I would remind the House that I have quite a lot of people on my list, and there's an R for questions, so uh, the Chair of the Committee uh, will get a bit of leeway, but if I could ask people to just be succinct uh, in the questions that they ask. I said a bit of leeway, uh, Mrs Bradley, not too much leeway. I call the Chair of the Communities Committee, Paul Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for bringing this statement um, forward today. And the statement that talks about improve, improving housing supply and how we increase the supply quality of sustainable and affordable homes. Um, Mem Minister, we know that the councils have been asked to demit, uh, submit their draft community plans, which, amongst other things, details GP surgeries, libraries, and many other services. Yet planners and developers don't seem to look at this when future proofing, especially when it comes to affordable housing. They think affordable housing should be the housing that is stuck out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, Minister, how can you ensure that any future social and affordable housing is in an area using our Council's community plans that is suitable for lifelong living um, in an area where we see an ever-increasing ageing population? Thanks very much. Well, this is a, a critical area um, when you look at housing supply, when you look at the waiting list and indeed where homes are being built. And obviously, primarily, my focus is on increasing the supply of social homes affordable homes also comes into that equation. I am looking at a housing supply strategy which starts to look at these issues and mapped with that obviously has to be the availability of publicly owned land um, and obviously the local development plans which councils are exploring comes into question around that. We are doing a fresh mapping exercise across the departments and indeed across local government looking at available land in the time ahead. I'm also looking at obviously introducing ring fencing in areas of highest need in terms of housing uh, waiting list as well. And I think it's a combination of all of those. I mean, obviously, in discussions with the Minister of Infrastructure as well, in terms of looking at the plan and process, the changes that need to be made. Councils obviously need to take a responsibility as well, and I know uh, many have. Obviously, they have all ambitions for growth. That has to be sustainable growth um, as well. 
but there needs to be a prioritisation in terms of housing. And I know this has caused a debate and conversation amongst many of the councils. I know many who are coming forward um, in terms of public inquiries around their local development plans have included uh, thresholds or limits around uh, social and affordable homes. Um, and I want to work with local government in the time ahead to ensure that that is prioritised as they develop their local development plans, but indeed also where they can identify other pieces of public land in their ownership and indeed across government to ensure that we do look at housing. Um, in terms of dealing with some of the issues around homelessness and all of the vulnerabilities that we've listed, creating more homes is one of you know, the quickest way in terms of doing that. And obviously, as we move forward with the strategy on housing supply, um, we will start to identify what we need to be doing in the time ahead. Now, uh, Fast Starleaf, if we could bring up the member for Foyle, Ms. Karen Mullen. I uh, thank the Minister for her statement. Um, can the Minister provide an update on her own plans to increase the stock of social and affordable social and affordable housing here? Yeah, well, I think um, obviously the statement was read out by uh, Carl Nee Cullen when she was temporarily in as Minister um, at the end of last year in terms of a revitalisation of the housing executive. So that looks at the financing issues, the ability to be able to build social housing again as well. I am obviously looking um, at the supply strategy. Uh, we are working on that at the moment. We are also looking obviously at the right to buy, and there will be a consultation um, in terms of that because of the loss of social homes um, over the last uh, few decades as well. Um, and also, as I say, we are looking at the land for public housing, public land for public housing doing a remapping exercise of available land that we can identify in terms of the housing. Obviously, work uh, will be taking place with the Minister for Infrastructure, as was brought up earlier in terms of the wastewater um, sewerage infrastructure and what we need to be doing in terms of future connections. We are also going to be starting to look at new work um, as well in terms of how we can build homes more quickly. So, for example, building off-site, looking at new methods of construction. Um, and we're going to be engaging with the housing executive, housing associations and others as we start to bring forward these plans. They are at an early stage of design, um, and I will hope over the coming months um, that I can bring more intensive, um, I suppose, discussion papers in terms of what I'm proposing to do in the time ahead. But the ultimate aim is to be more ambitious with our housing development programme in terms of the social housing that we can bring forward also looking at the issue of intermediate rents, but then also looking at affordable housing as an option for people as well. Mr. Mark Durkin. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her statement and answers thus far. The Minister has referred to plans announced by her predecessor and party colleague to reclassify the housing executive landlord function to a mutual or cooperative designation to enable it to borrow and build. I may be mistaken, but I believe that the transfer of 85,000 public homes would be the largest ever on these islands. Did the Minister have an opportunity, or has she had an opportunity, to discuss with counterparts from elsewhere the impact that such transfers in their jurisdictions have had on rents and security of tenure? There was no direct discussion at the meeting um, last week in terms of this area of work, but obviously the supply of housing, increasing social and affordable housing is a key or a work programme that we're looking to do in the time ahead. The statement that was given last year on the housing, which was welcomed by all in this chamber, that something needed to be do done, our current housing system is broken. I think people across these benches would recognise that. We do need to see change because those who are on the housing waiting list demand it in terms of ensuring that we can increase and be more ambitious around the supply of our homes. We obviously also need to look at, I mean, the housing executive at one point over, owned over 240,000 homes, and that has been reduced now to just over 80,000 homes, as you talked about. So we need to deal with these fundamental issues and obviously looking at the finance, allowing the housing executive to be able to build and have the finances to do that is going to be crucial. If I can find a way of doing that by keeping the function as it is at the moment, then that's what I am exploring in terms of those options. 
um, and also other options in terms of looking at, co at a cooperative. I am clear that any change will be in consultation with tenants. It will also be in consultation with those on the waiting list and with the housing executive and others as well. I am also um, ensuring that there will be ownership in terms of that if it is a different model to what is there now, that tenants have to have a central role in terms of the ownership and in terms of where we are going to be taking this forward. Uh, we are still at an early stage in terms of those plans, in terms of looking at the reports and drawing up. Part of that will be looking at other jurisdictions, looking at models of best practice. Obviously, the new chief executive of the housing executive, who is incoming, has extensive experience on this across this island and across the islands as well. And obviously, I will be working closely uh, with Grania and others um, as we meet these challenges in the time ahead. Mr. Andy Allen. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her statement. Minister, your statement makes reference to creating an inclusive and future vision for our ageing population. Minister, I have recently been contacted by uh, some of our ageing population in homes up in Notanagoni uh, who are being uh, uprooted from their homes. So, Minister, can you outline what you intend to do as part of this vision to ensure that people who have lived in our communities for all of their lives are not uprooted from those communities and forced to move to other areas? Well, I think the big thing around housing supply and looking at it in future, we are becoming an ageing population. People are getting older, and that presents its own unique and specific challenges. But I also think, I mean, I want to maintain communities and traditional communities that have been there as well. And in terms of building communities, I think the, uh, the point was touched on in the previous questions. Or sorry, it might have been Paula that said it there, that it's not just about building homes, it's about the services and the infrastructure that goes around that in terms of having sustainable communities. I think as we're starting to look at all of this, I mean, I do want to look at a co-design approach. So working with communities, working with the various age groups and sectors, as we start to look at what the future trends and needs of our communities are. That will also be done on a geographic basis as well in terms of communities that have been there, how they are going to grow and develop, looking at their future needs, trying to look at what social housing provision will look like and also affordable homes as well. That may mean if those who want to downsize or upsize, we need to be looking at that in a longer term way. It also means working with local councils. I mean, the touch it was pointed there in terms of the local development plans. I know councils have ambitious plans for growth. So what will that look like in the time ahead if we're starting to utilise more town centre and city centre spaces where traditionally they haven't been built in um, over the last 30 to 40 years? And there's an, a real opportunity to do that, particularly when you're looking at the economy and what way working trends may work in the future in terms of office accommodation and other unutilised buildings. Is there an opportunity to look at more city centre living, for example, as well? And that shouldn't be at the expense of displacing or forcing someone out of their home. That shouldn't be what it's about. It should be around choice. So where people want to live, the type of accommodation that they feel uh, also meets their needs as well. And we need to start planning more longer term in terms of meeting those needs uh, in the future. And that's not just in the next year or five. You're talking in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. What will that look like? And how do we make sure that we design housing, how we design communities, how we design infrastructure um, to go along with that, and indeed the issue even of climate um, change and the impact as well. And obviously, I sit on a cross-departmental uh, working group that has recently been established with infrastructure, economy and also uh, DERA in terms of looking at these challenges and what we need to be doing over the next 20, 30 and 40 years. If there's a specific question, sorry, in terms of the Nakanagoni, Andy, I'm um, more than happy to come back to you or speak to you after this on the specifics. Ms. Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you very much, Minister. Um, I'm delighted to, see, to hear your reflections on the flexibility of tenure to ensure that people can stay within their community when the, car the house that they live in is no longer fit for purpose as they grow older. But I wanted to come back to this point, Minister. Um, while we can talk plenty about the growth and the development of new housing, we still have 85,000 houses in the housing executive, and many of those require a significant amount of investment and retrofitting to enable um, our zero cost 
carbon targets by 2050. We could do that earlier. I'm just wondering if any discussions had come forward about the people who are existing social tenants and how we're going to fit, make their houses fit for purpose. Yeah, well, I think this is part of the, the key in terms of the revitalisation statement that was given last year in the House, because there are financial challenges which the housing executive face, not only in terms of investing in new homes and, and having the ability to build again, but also in the existing stock, um, which there are some that are in, in poor conditions. Um, they do need upgraded. We know that we have some of the highest numbers in terms of fuel poverty. Um, across Europe, not even just across these islands. Um, and there is specific challenges that we have to face um, over the next couple of years and indeed over the next few decades as well. As I say, in terms of the working group uh, looking at climate change and the challenges, I do sit on that, as I say, with infrastructure, economy and DERA. And obviously one of the areas looking at is in terms of boiler replacements, the work that needs to be done, looking at the retrofitting of properties. And obviously this is going to have a huge financial impact, but it also has the ability in terms of building the green economy, looking at job creation um, in that sector as well. But also in terms of new housing that's coming on site, how do we make sure that we design those that they're fit for purpose for the next 20, 30, 40 years. We're just not looking a couple of years in advance, that we're actually ensuring that we're uh, looking a few decades in advance in terms of that climate. Uh, there is a target. Obviously, we're, we have another meeting. We've only had one meeting of that cross-departmental group. There will be a follow-up meeting, and from that, there is a specific work uh, stream in terms of looking at boiler replacements, the retrofitting of properties, also changing our housing build standards. And indeed, they need upgraded um, desperately in terms of building standards. Um, and looking at that in the time ahead, obviously, also within the private rented sector, where the majority of families, and particularly children, now live, um, it's not in the social. I'm also going to be looking at bringing um, a private rented sector uh, piece of legislation within this mandate forward, again looking at health and safety conditions within the private rented sector to ensure that landlords are upgrading um, the properties and ensuring that they're safe um, and of a good standard um, of living as well. So there's, a, there's a, a variety of work streams that are ongoing at the moment. And as I say, once these start to develop into concrete plans, I will be bringing them forward um, to the committee and also to the chamber as well. Mr. Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank the minister for her statement so far. Um, minister, in the statement you mentioned about the climate change for building new homes with 14% of our greenhouse gas emissions from our homes and trying to be carbon neutral by 2050. And just uh, like my colleague Kelly Armstrong uh, mentioned, um, our own social housing um, can't even get sorted by the housing executive. What, what guarantees can you actually give this assembly that we can actually hold the housing executive to account for issues such as cavity wall insulation or roof insulation, which we can't even get them to sort out now? Thank you. Yeah, well, I think, Member, thanks for your question. It is an important area. I mean, obviously, we know the challenges of the housing executive in terms of the historic debt, um, in terms of issues around corporation tax and others. Uh, the main reason for the housing statement back in November of last year was to start to seriously look at those issues. We have been talking about them for over 10 years, but we have not really seriously moved on them or looked at them. That has started to change, obviously, from that statement last year. We're saying that this needs to be a priority, that if we want to look at upgrading the existing properties that are there, if we want to be more ambitious in terms of our house building programmes to build more social homes, we need to deal with those historic issues around the debt. Um, so we're starting to look at that at the moment. Work plans are being developed. We're also looking at teams and experts that can help us with that work um, at the moment within the department, working with the housing executive, but also looking at external bodies as well. I suppose the role of the British Irish Council will allow us to look at best practice in other places, look at the challenges that have been impacted in other places as well. We want to bring all of the homes, the existing stock that the housing executive has, up to um, a good standard. There are building regulations as well that obviously need to change also, um, and that needs to happen as well. And in terms of making sure that we're building new homes that are fit for purpose, 
We have to deal with the historic issues in terms of the debt. We have to look at ways to allow the housing executive to borrow in order to look at a more ambitious house building programme, but also then the issue of, um, I suppose, maintaining their existing stock. Tied in with this is obviously the rental, the assessment of rents and making sure um, that there is a trajectory around rents, but making sure as well that we do maintain some of the lowest rents across these islands. And indeed, we do do that through the housing executive at the minute. But there is an investment challenge there, um, and work is ongoing at the moment on the back of the statement in November to start to really look at that in a more serious way, to put teams around it in terms of coming up with proposals and changes that we need to bring. There are obviously ongoing discussions with DOF, with British Treasury as well, around some of the historic debt corporation tax issues. They are still ongoing at the moment, and once we have a conclusion around those, I will obviously be bringing that to the executive. Um, to the committee and indeed then to this chamber as well. Mr. Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the Minister's statement today. Minister, I think uh, Mr. Andy Allen was referring to a case in Knocknagoni uh, Avenue where, for the last 10 years, discussions have been going on about the future of the masonettes and the shops. My understanding is, my confirmation is, that the Housing Executive have made a recommendation to you and they are awaiting for a decision from you, Minister, on the future of, of that block, which I believe it was demolition was the recommendation. But can I say to you, Minister, I, I welcome this, this statement today and particularly welcome the, the, the fact that. Um, you're beginning to identify the role of housing uh, and the provision of housing in a much wider uh, sense than just the provision of a house. And particularly within the uh, final area of focus, uh, you understand that the housing's role in health and social care. Minister, it is my belief that we will never, certainly in the Belfast area, see the provision of bungalows again. I hope I'm wrong in that. But there are many folk who, um, in the future, will look towards a bungalow and will never sustain a bungalow, and yet they will be offered accommodation in apartments. There is nothing wrong with apartments for a certain age of person, I think, but when many people reach a mature age, they are looking for the peace and quiet that can be established within the boundaries of their own home. And that, generally speaking, at that age is, is a bungalow. Minister, can you give consideration to the provision of bungalow type accommodation for those who you are dealing with in, in, in this statement? Well, thanks very much um, for your question. That's an important one. And I suppose all options are being looked at at the moment. When you look at housing supply, when you look at the future need in terms of population. Uh, trends and demographics, then all of those issues have to be considered. Um, land and availability of land obviously becomes critical as well, and I do think that's why the local development plans are crucial. Um, we know that many councils have an ambition for growth in terms of housing growth for those plans. I know they are looking at the ageing population and maybe how future trends and how people live in the future are taken into account of that as well. I think it will be important then when we're looking at all of these plans that we actually engage with people. So those who are on the transfer list, those who are on the waiting list, uh, those who are also in, in housing as well. Then we engage with the different sectors um, and, and the different age groups as well in terms of looking at uh, future housing needs and supplies. So that's all into question in terms of the type of home, because I do get, I mean, I dealt with it even as a councillor in Belfast, and you'll know this yourself, Robin, and Belfast City Council, that you know, communities that have been there a long time are used to the area in which they live in. Uh, they want to often stay in that area as well, but they want to have the availability of homes you know, to meet their needs. I think that's why looking at those areas, ring fence and particularly areas of highest need as well in terms of housing, to ensure that we are building more possible homes where people want to live. Um, because I don't want a scenario that people are being forced to move 10, 15, 20 miles away. Um, and again, there's a breakdown in the social fabric and their support networks. So we do want to look at this in the time ahead. I mean, there is a commitment that that will include um, different types of homes that meet the needs of those older people. Huh? 
Yes, oh, well, all of that's in options. Yes, all of that will be considered. A former speaker should know not to chunter from the back bench like that. Um, Mr. Sean Lynch. My uh, previous last Colin Gom Guercus are asking Ratchis Shin, given the positive impacts of the initiatives you have mentioned in your statement, Minister, do you intend to increase the level of collaborative work with the Department of Health to market? Thank you. you know, this is an important area, and thanks for the question. And I think the pandemic, like in many areas, um, has really shone a light on issues that we know and have been there. I think um, some of the good work that's been done has obviously been through housing officials within my department and also with health officials within the Department of Health. There's been real practical steps that have been taken and collaborations that have ensured that no one um, is homeless on the streets in vulnerable categories. Um, we have also looked at those who have no recourse to public funds to ensure that housing was made available um, to those in the height of the pandemic. If that can be done in the height of a pandemic, it, it should be done um, outside of the pandemic as well. Um, and I think there is a willingness between my department and also with the Department of Health that we increase that collaboration, that we look at joint cross-departmental working groups um, on this issue. I know even in terms of the anti-poverty strategy and the impact there as well, there is a cross-departmental working group, and obviously housing will be a key component um, around that also. So the answer is yes. Um, we obviously have a memorandum of understanding that was agreed between the departments and also the housing executive looking at issues of accommodation, and I think we can only increase that collaboration and understanding in the time ahead. I have asked Starleaf, the member for Fermanagh and South Tyrone, Ms Gemma Dolan. Minister, um, you've already touched on this slightly, but the private rental sector is one where we're hearing of increasing difficulties for tenants, both in terms of costs and conditions. What measures can the Minister put in place to address this? I am looking at the private rented sector at the moment, and I will, within this mandate, be bringing forward proposed legislative changes and strengthening protections in the private rented sector. That will look at issues around health and safety, checks that need to be um, conducted within that sector as well. We're obviously, I'm also looking at issues around letting agents and some of the precarious, um, I suppose, characteristics and, and behaviours that have been taking place there as well. Um, and I'm drawing up, I suppose, a bill at the moment in terms of looking at strengthening um, protections for those. Uh, within the private rented sector. That also looks, I mean, again, during the pandemic in terms of the notice to quit period, issues like that, we were able to make changes as a result of the pandemic. So all of these issues are being considered at the moment. And indeed, I'll be bringing forward a proposed bill um, to the executive and also to the communities committees very shortly. Mr. Justin McNulty. Minister, tell me what discussions you have had with the Minister for Infrastructure and the Minister for Finance in relation to upgrading existing wastewater treatment capacity to enable the construction of social housing in places like Newry and elsewhere. Well, there's been ongoing discussions and even through work streams, um, as I touched on earlier, in terms of the issues around climate change, but also looking at issues that we need to do around infrastructure. There's ongoing collaboration um, between the departments looking at this issue, even within the draft budget at the moment, in terms of RRI borrowing. The two key areas that are in that draft budget is housing and infrastructure, um, because I think it is um, a recognition um, that the two issues are linked. I had a meeting recently um, with the, the Minister for Infrastructure in which this issue was raised again. Um, and I know that we are looking forward to a follow up meeting to talk specifically in terms of infrastructure needs and housing needs in the time ahead. So, discussions are ongoing at the moment, obviously, within the programme for government as well. These are two areas that have been identified. I do believe within the programme for government, housing needs to be a specific outcome um, as part of that. And I do hope that the executive, on the back of the public consultation, will agree to that also in the time ahead. Mr. Roy Beggs. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. The statement spoke of special planning um, 
and the, the challenges of ageing population and, and that climate change. And the Minister has also indicated that people want to live close to where they grew up. Now, in Larne Town, two multi-storey flats have been brought down some years ago, and the third and final one is in the process of being brought down. So my question to the Minister is, will she reassess the relatively modest plans to build social housing in that public space, given all the assets that come with it, its, its central location, uh, accessibility to uh, essential services and facilities for both those who would be 55 plus and indeed anyone else in need of social housing. It meets all the criteria spoke, spoken about. Yeah, no, thanks very much. And I know I've written just recently, I signed off on a specific question on this um, last week to the member as well. And I suppose in terms of the housing development programme at the moment, I mean, that is based on the current need. Um, at the moment in terms of where the housing need is. Obviously, I do uh, recognise that we're not building enough social homes uh, to meet the growing need and the growing demand. And, and indeed, that's been exacerbated as a result of the COVID pandemic as well, when you look at the issue of homelessness. So we do need to be more ambitious in terms of our housing plans. In terms of work that's going forward and projected need and how people want to live in the time ahead, um, work is ongoing around local development plans, obviously around the programme for government, in terms of the engagement that is happening with infrastructure and others. We are um, continuously looking to identify public land in terms of housing, but the housing uh, development programme is obviously primarily where the housing need is. Uh, that's where the homes will be developed in the time ahead. And obviously, we do need to be building more homes. When you look at the housing programme at the moment, in terms of just on the numbers um, where there's housing stress, I mean, West Belfast, North Belfast, the kind of foil area, we definitely have, need to have more houses um, built in those areas. Um, in terms of the specifics, I mean, the Lauren issue, I know I've written to you directly um, on that, Roy, but um, it will be based on what the housing need is in that area at that time. If there are other plans in terms of growth plans, I mean, we will be linking in with the local development plan. We will be looking at issues of affordable housing and what that is going to look like at the time ahead. But they are at an early discussion at the moment, and we will start to pick up pace over the coming months. Ms. Liz Kimmins. I thank the Minister for her statement and her ongoing steadfast commitment to, to housing and, and the provision of housing. Um, can I ask the Minister what work is ongoing within the Department to identify uh, the land that is needed um, to meet uh, the housing demand? Thank you. Well, there was an initiative um, going back which was around the public land for public housing, which was obviously commissioned as part of asset management strategy action back in 2016 and 17. Obviously, there were a number of housing sites um, that were brought forward as part of that, and indeed developments were built and people are now living in those homes. But we do need to be more ambitious um, in terms of looking at that. We need to be working again with local councils because the local development plans are a critical area, and particularly looking at public land, which are in council ownerships as well, um, in terms of ring fencing and targeting those areas for housing. We are reviewing the public land for housing um, at the moment. Uh, we are also doing an assessment. We are engaging with other government departments um, to look at availability of land and matching that against where the need is, but also where the projected growth is in terms of LDPs. I am obviously working with the Department of Infrastructure in terms of looking at infrastructure needs um, and what needs to run along beside that as well. So all of this work is being brought up, at the uh, up to date sorry, at the moment. Um, and it's part of the housing supply strategy that we're starting to devise. So once all of that's completed, again, that information and work programme will be shared with members. May I have asked Starleaf uh, if we could call up Mr Daniel McCrossan, the member for West Tyrone. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, thank you also for the uh, answers to your questions so far. Uh, the Minister rightly referred to the blight of homelessness across these islands, but the pandemic demonstrated that rough sleeping is not inevitable and is a consequence of political and budgetary choices. Are there other policy initiatives that colleagues elsewhere have implemented that the Minister is exploring? And moreover, 
uh, what impact will the finance minister's rejection of her bid for homelessness services have on the numbers of homeless here over the next 12 months? Well, I think in terms of the budgetary challenges, I mean, it's not a rejection by the finance minister, which I'm sure the member will know. It's the fact in how our budgets are made and how the block grant is given over. We were given a flat budget, um, which has been passed on to the executive as a whole and which all departments face. And in real terms, when you're dealing with a flat budget, that means a cut and that means an impact on services. Um, and I do think collectively we need to be highlighting this with the British government and Treasury um, and in terms of the impact that this will have, particularly still in the midst of a pandemic. And I do think that that's an area that we need to critically look at. As I said earlier, the work that we've been doing with health and housing in terms of looking at the issue of homelessness and those who find themselves rough sleeping on the streets, there has been a lot of good work um, that has been done that has obviously needed resource to do it. And we have managed to do that through the COVID monies um, that has been looked at. Again, we're obviously reviewing the homeless strategy and we're working with the housing executive with supporting people programme and with others. Um, I do see housing obviously as a fundamental right. That's why I do think it has to be included as a key outcome in the income and programme for government. And then there has to be an agenda as to how we're going to address that issue. I did touch on, I mean, there are huge investment challenges in terms of housing bills, in terms of the housing executive. And indeed, some of these may take a bit longer, but the work has started in terms of starting to deal with the, I suppose, the broken system that we have at the moment and trying to fix that and repair that. Obviously, we can learn from other areas. I mean, it was touched on just briefly at the meeting um, that homelessness and the challenges around that is an issue for all of the administrations. Um, and my focus is to ensure that we do have an increased um, supply of social housing. Um, that we do have a, a renewed homeless strategy in order to deal with this issue um, and that the financing needs to come forward with this. So I would hope that this Assembly, along with all of the parties in the executive, can be making representations um, and also urgent requests of the British Government and Treasury to change the proposed budget at the moment to one that is more ambitious, the one that is about investing in public services, which includes social housing. Being unable to see Mr. Macrossan, it almost had the feel of being in a seance or something. You just had this voice from the galleries. I call Ms. Rachel Woods. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank, you, thank the Minister for her statement and comments. Um, specifically, she's made on future proofing. She'll know my interest in and the need for zero carbon passive house standards, insulation, and retrofitting. And I also note the mention of collaborative work addressing homelessness in light of the pandemic. But we need to continue to provide permanent housing solutions for people who are homeless and to ensure that these are sustainable going forward. But with regard to the housing supply strategy, will the Minister be bringing this to the Executive with a budget and resource attached? Point, I take points of order at the end of the statement, but I'm happy to after that. Yeah, no, thanks very much. Well, obviously, the work is ongoing around the housing supply strategy um, at the moment, um, and we're looking at all of those issues. That work will have to be costed in terms of what this is going to look like. And um, I mean, I suppose you're right. For somebody that's homeless, I mean, the fundamental issue is to have a home, is to have a roof over their head. If there are issues around complex needs, then they need to be supported um, because the home in itself won't do that. And we have found um, in terms of some of the issues that people who have gotten a home have then lost it again. They haven't been able to sustain it. And that is an issue um, and a critical area that we do need to fix. Obviously, in terms of the housing first agenda, in terms of the supply, uh, we do want to work with the supporting people. We're working with um, the housing uh, sector, organisations such as Housing Rights and others, um, in terms of looking at these issues that, I mean, I agree, housing itself won't deal with all of the issues. Um, and I suppose our work with health has showed that during the pandemic, the collaboration with health that we do need to build on health and social care. We need to make sure that they're not working in silos, that they're working collaboratively um, and they're, that they're working collectively together, that the two services are stitched in um, to one another. Um, and I think from the work that has been done, people do see the value. They've seen the impact of it. And I think it has re-energised officials within both departments to ensure that we continue and that we step up the work um, and the focus around that in the time ahead. 
Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you. Mr. Principal, De Deputy Speaker, I've heard very few questions or answers arising out of the subject matter of this statement, which probably is a reflection of the lack of substance in the statement. But the statement does say we can learn so much from each other. Could I ask the Minister what has she learned from other administrations? And is that just a platitude, bearing in mind that this group is not going to meet for another two years? Well, I don't do platitudes. Other people may do platitudes, Member, but I don't. Um, and I do think, I mean, I recognise when the last meeting took place, I wasn't in this assembly. The institutions, obviously, after that were down for a period. But the work programme between officials did continue. Um, there has been collaboration across the different um, areas, and indeed many members who were at that meeting was their first time going to such a meeting because of elections and everything that has passed in between. Um, I think the, the issue is around how I suppose officials um, on an ongoing basis collaborate and engage. I know that there has been collaboration around the issue of responding to the pandemic, how we respond to those people who find themselves on the streets and homeless. We have uh, had cross, um, I suppose, engagement on health and social care and the need to collaborate, and we have shared direct examples with other jurisdictions um, on that need. We have also looked at the issue around public land for public housing, and indeed there has been some sharing and collaboration. I think if you get the details and the reports and the work plans and read them, you will see that work um, that is being done at the moment. If I put it all within the statement, I would be here for another two hours, and then I am sure the member would say that I am talking too much um, as well. So Obviously, I did not want to be accused of such a thing, um, so I thought that I would keep the statement uh, short in the time ahead. There has been collaboration. Um, but I suppose my focus now is on the revitalisation programme, on increasing the supply of social housing, looking at the issue of affordable housing and dealing with the historic debt issues that the housing executive has been impacted. We will be engaging those other areas within the BIC um, in terms of have they faced similar challenges, what, how, how have they overcome them. Um, but we do that as a matter of course between official engagement. That concludes questions to the Minister. Mr McNulty, you had a point of order. Yes, uh, I do not think my colleague Daniel Crossan will appreciate his contribution to this important matter as being akin to comments from a seance. Um, I think the Chair should reconsider those comments in that context. Does the member care to tell me which standing order he is referring to? I could not possibly refer to which standing order that actually refers to, but I do feel. I do feel it is completely inappropriate. Really? Well, your comments are now on the record. I think the rules and, rules and behaviour of courtesies in the House remind members to be of good nature and good humour at all times, and I think that Mr McCrossan would appreciate that was what it was. Do you wish to make another point of order? Very funny. Well, humour is obviously a subjective matter and not related to in the standing orders of the House. If members would take their ease for um, a few moments, uh, we will move on to the next item of business. Thank you, members. The next item of business on the order paper is the first stage of the damages return on investment bill, and I call upon the Minister of Justice, Mrs. Naomi Long. I beg to introduce the damages return on investment bill. Can I ask the clerk to please read the long title. 
a bill to make provision in relation to the assumed rate of return on investment of particular damages awarded in personal injury cases. That constitutes the bill's first stage, and it shall now be printed. The, <coughs> excuse me, the, next, the next item on the order paper is a motion to suspend standing orders 10 to 10 4. Could I ask the clerk to please read the motion? That standing orders 10 2 to 10 4 be suspended for 1st of March 2021. I call the Minister for Finance to move the motion. Moved. Last concordo. Thank you. Before we proceed to the question, I would remind members that this motion requires cross community support. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it, as there are ayes from all sides of the House, and there are no dissenting voices. I am satisfied that cross-community support has been demonstrated. The next two motions are to approve the supply resolution for the Spring Supplementary Estimates 2020-21 and the vote on account 2021-2022. There will be a single debate on both motions. I will ask the clerk to read the first motion, then call upon the minister to move it. The minister will then commence the debate on both motions. When all who wish to speak have done so, I shall put the question on the first motion. The second motion will then be read into the record, and I will call upon the minister to move it. The question will then be put on that motion. If that is clear, then we will proceed. Can I ask the clerk to please read the first motion? That the motion relating to the supply resolution for the Northern Ireland Spring Supplementary Estimates 2020 2021, as detailed on the order paper, be agreed. I call upon the Minister for Finance to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. The motion has been moved. The Business Committee has allowed up to four and a half hours for this debate. The Minister will have 30 minutes to allocate at his discretion between proposing and winding. The Chair of the Finance Committee will have 10 minutes to speak. All other speakers will have seven minutes. I call upon the Minister for Finance to open the debate upon the motion, Mr Conor Murphy. As you have set out, this debate covers the supply resolutions. The first resolution seeks the Assembly's approval of the 2020-21 spending plans of the departments and other public bodies as set out in the spring supplementary estimates, which were laid in the Assembly on Tuesday, 23 February 2021. Alongside the SSEs, the 2021-22 vote on account was also laid, and it will be the subject of the second supply resolution. I will now speak on both of these. The first resolution before the House relates to the supply of cash and use of resources for the current year 2020-21. Since the main estimates in October 2020, the Executive has continued to manage public expenditure, the public expenditure position, including the allocation of additional funding received from Treasury as well as the reallocation of existing resources. To date, the Executive has allocated over $2.9 billion in additional resources. These are unprecedented levels of allocations. The detail of those allocations are a matter of public record and are published on my Department's website. Before Christmas, the Treasury announced an increase in the amount of COVID funding guaranteed to the Executive in 2020-21 to $3 billion which provided an additional $200 million of resource Dell. Initial indications were that the Treasury would look favourably upon requests to carry over uh, this, uh, to the next year, and therefore it was not allocated as part of January monitoring. However, Treas Treasury subsequently advised this flexibility would not be granted, and I have therefore urged my colleagues to bring forward proposals to spend this money on further COVID support. To ensure the additional funding from Treasury was not lost, a number of departments have included headroom in their estimate to provide legal cover for any further allocations. Allocations have already been made to a number of these departments, and details of these have been set out in my written statements to the Assembly. However, even after meeting departmental bids, unallocated funding remains, and in the absence of any further proposals, my department will take forward work on additional grant support. I had hoped that a broad hardship scheme to support businesses that have not received any support to date would be put in place. Unfortunately, that has not happened. So once again, it falls on LPS, a rates collection agency, to provide support to businesses. Unfortunately, the rates database held by LPS is not capable of delivering a broad hardship scheme. 
But as far as possible, I will try to incorporate businesses that haven't yet received support. I will bring a paper to the Executive on this shortly. On 15 February, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury announced that a further £327 million would be allocated to the Executive and confirmed that this can be carried forward in full until 2021-22. This £370 million breaks down into £238 million resource, £75 million capital and £14 million financial transaction capital. Given that departments have been considering ways to spend the available uh, beyond the January monitor round, it has not been possible to introduce the bill norm along normal timeframes. The recent decision by Treasury and carryover has meant agreeing allocations at a much later point in the year than usual. Therefore, both accelerated passage and suspension of Stanton Order 42.5 are required in order to secure royal assent by the end of the financial year. The COVID-19 crisis has necessitated unprecedented, immediate and extraordinary public expenditure. The need for the process to be expedited is to ensure that departments do not run out of cash. This bill is essential to authorise all allocations that have been agreed in the, between the main estimates and now. Alongside the SSEs, which are for 2020-21, there is also the vote on account. This vote on account provides authority for departments to spend in the first few months of 2021-22. I would like to emphasise that this vote on account does not represent the setting of the 2021-22 budget. That is something the Executive will be doing in the coming weeks, and I will be bringing to the Assembly before the end of March. Rather, the amount for each department in the vote on account is, in most cases, set approximately at 45 per cent of the 2020-21 provision and is designed to ensure that departments can continue to deliver services until the main estimates and Budget No. 2 Bill, which will be based on the final budget, are presented to the Assembly for approval in June. Last concord, there are a number of procedural issues which I must also address. First of all, on behalf of the Executive, I request and recommend the levels of supply set out in these two resolutions under section 63 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998. Also, as is normal for a budget bill, accelerated passage is required for the legislation, and indeed there is a specific provision for this in the Assembly Standing Orders, Standing Order 42.2. I understand that the Finance Committee has already agreed to grant accelerated passage, and I want to place on record my appreciation of the Committee's vital role in agreeing this important step in this financial process. In addition to assure that this bill receives royal assent in advance of the end of the financial year, I require the Assembly's approval to suspend Standing Order 42.5 to allow the passage of this bill in less than 10 days. Given the timing of funding allocations, reallocations and uncertainty around the carry forward of additional Treasury funding, it was not possible to bring, this, bring forward this bill any earlier. Doing so would have either hindered departments' ability to use the funding available or resulted in significantly more headroom being included. Last concord, I am sure members are aware that today's debate on this resolution is time limited, and I would encourage members to use their limited time to focus on the issues specifically related to the 2020-21 supply resolution before us. Members will have ample opportunity to debate the Executive's 2021-22 budget, not just when the budget is announced before the end of March, but also when I bring the 2021-22 main estimates and budget number two bill to the Assembly later in the year. For now, the focus should be on this budget bill and associated spring supplementary estimates, which are essential for the delivery of vital public services such as schools and hospitals, as well as supporting local businesses and the economy. It is vital that we debate the legislation and pass it through expediently. Last concord, I am looking forward to putting the Executive's final spending plans for the 2021-2021 on a legal footing through the spring supplementary estimates before you today, together with the corresponding budget bill, which we will debate tomorrow. I request the support of members for resolution for the 2020-21 and also the resolution for the vote on account to allow services to continue to be funded into the first few months of 2021-22, and I beg to move. Thank you, Minister. I call the Chair of the Finance Committee, Dr. Steve Aiken. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. And may I indeed thank the Minister for his remarks so far. On behalf of the Finance Committee, I would like to thank the Minister for his opening remarks on the supplementary resolu or supply resolutions relating to the spring supplementary estimates and the vote on account. The Minister's officials have kindly provided written and oral explanations of the estimates and the vote of account at a number of Finance Committee meetings. On behalf of the Committee, I would like to thank him for, his, for this and express the hope that these useful engagements will continue in a spirit of cooperation, as indeed they have done for the remainder of this mandate. 
Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, the committee finds these exchanges with officials to be most instructive. In fact, I think I can certainly say that members have learnt something brand new every single time our officials come and speak with us. In tomorrow's debate, I will, with your indulgence, address this further and speak very briefly on the issues relating to accelerated passage for the Budget Bill. For now, I will address the supply resolutions. To put it mildly, this has been an unusual year. In order to deal with the very serious regional consequences of a global pandemic, our Government has made very significant additional sums available to the Executive. There have also been some underspends, as various functions have had to stop or be curtailed, and the associated finances have had to be redirected. This has made the reconciliation of the main estimates and the spring supplementary estimates utterly different from previous years, and allocations from the UK Government in excess of the three billion of resources. The subsequent executive allocations often had to be made at short notice and outside of the usual monitoring round process. Furthermore, and as we are all aware, the executive still apparently finds itself, even now, with considerable underspent sums of perhaps over half a billion pounds. Thanks to the special carryover arrangements with HM Treasury, some of this will be spent in 2021-22. However, to us, it seems that quite a lot of money remains to be dispersed in the current financial year. The committee has recently urged the minister to work with his executive college to bring forward new schemes or bolster existing schemes, particularly for under-supported business sectors, in order to use up this money and for other good and applicable causes. In order to allow for departmental flexibility in this regard, the estimates show a headroom of nearly $1 billion, even though the available resource is considerably less than this. I think, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, members, and even sometimes officials, have struggled to keep abreast of the multiple allocations and to understand the use of headrooms in the estimate. I would ask, in its response, whether the Minister would provide a further explanation of the latter and perhaps also take to issue a kind of epilogue to the estimates, which will provide a final record of where the last allocations have been made in 2021. In respect of the vote on account, it is understood that it provides finance to allow existing services to continue in the early months of 2021-22, pending the passage of the second Budget Bill. The Department advises that existing services should be read as including not only services for which sums have been appropriated before 31 March 21, but also services in respect of which specific legislation has recently been passed or is at present under consideration. Thus, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, the vote and account is not always simply a financial float which allows things to continue just as they are for the first few months of the next financial year. It can be a bit more than that. It can allow other new services to start. Even, that isn't, even if that isn't the case this year, this always makes the vote and account worthy of the scrutiny of the committee and indeed of every member of this House. Turning to the Department for Finance itself, this has benefited from additional allocations of over $200 million to cover the cost of business support measures, including the localised restrictions support scheme. Support scheme. I think members have had concerns about the speed of payments and the limited support for some hard-pressed and apparently forgotten sectors. However, I think having said, having said that, the Committee was pleased by the very rapid disbursement of support, well in excess of £100 million, which took place between December and January. The Department retains headroom with £300 million to cover the possible cost of additional support measures. Perhaps again, if he can, the Minister might tell us a little more about what he has in this regard particularly for those sectors which have not as yet benefited significantly, i.e. the travel industry, issues such as driving schools. I think every member of this Assembly can give you issues where the small companies and medium companies have had difficulties in these issues as well. I think as Chairperson it is also important to warmly welcome the rates holiday for businesses and to recognise the challenge that LPS has had to rise to in respect of the provision of a programme of rates relief. On behalf of the Committee, I would like to endorse both supply resolution motions. I would just like to make a few short remarks uh, from my perspective as the Ulster Unionist Party spokesperson in finance. 
During the reading of the supply estimates and at the committee meeting last week, there was much discussion about support for the Victims' Payment Scheme. And one of the things that has exercised many members of this Assembly, and indeed many of the victims who are out there, is when this funding is due to come to the victims and when that is likely to happen. This month marks the 49th anniversary of the despicable attack on the Abercorn Bar. And for those of you who are nowhere, Jennifer McKern is still waiting. We have an opportunity here to make sure that those victims know when that money is due to come to them. And indeed, having expectations raised last week when we were in the Finance Committee, which have been changed by comments and clarifications from the Department itself, I think it is all beholden on us to make sure that this much needed money for the victims of terrorism actually gets to them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. I call Dr. Kiva Archibald, the Chair of the Economy Committee. Um, go Margaret. Can, last can call you. Um, and I rise to speak as Chair of the Economy Committee, and I intend to speak on the in-year monitoring rounds, the several COVID allocations, unspent funds, and the difficulty for the committee in being able to scrutinise budgets this year. The Department for the Economy has been delivering schemes to help businesses and individuals cope with the impact of restrictions on their livelihoods. I want to put on record the Committee's appreciation for the hard work and dedication of the Department's staff. All credit must be given to the work for the work that has been done against a very difficult back backdrop to deliver support. Concordia, you will be aware that in the summer there was an exercise whereby the Department for the Economy made 32 bids across 13 themes, including assistance to business, skills and youth training, tourism, the energy strategy and university research. The Department of Finance made a number of urgent allocations to the Department as part of that exercise, including $23.1 million for interventions for apprenticeships and the further education safe learning. The Department's 32 bids were considered key to addressing the economic recovery. These bids and a further six inescapable pressures, totalling £88 million resource Dell in 2021, with future resource Dell funding commitments of £63 million up to 2023-24, and an ongoing recurrent commitment of over £8 million per annum. The modelling for COVID response measures has been difficult. Over £50 million in underspend was returned to the centre in the summer from the Department's initial COVID schemes. The Committee has campaigned for greater flexibility for movement of funds across COVID relief schemes, and thanks must be given to the Finance Minister for the additional flexibility that has been introduced. The relaxation of restrictions last summer gave false hope for our direction of travel, and the Department's bids in the summer exercise reflected the belief that a recovery phase approached. However, we now know this was overly optimistic and again required the return of substantial funds which could not be spent. As late as December, the Minister briefed the Committee that the Department was looking at a shortfall of approximately £140 million in its budget going forward. She highlighted a considerable shortfall of approximately £70 million in funding that would have come from EU sources that it is not anticipated to be replaced by the British Government's Shared Prosperity Fund. By the January monitoring round at the beginning of this year, things had changed. The expectation that a recovery phase was beginning was gone and we find ourselves in the current restrictions and lockdown. As part of January monitoring, the Department submitted bids of £33.9 million for five inescapable non-COVID pressures, five COVID-19 bids totalling £54.7 million to support economic recovery, and one high-priority bid of £8 million in respect of higher education for quality-related research. £17.6 million of resource Dell easements were identified and utilised in other departmental spending, including £3.8 million towards meeting the ESF shortfall. Additionally, the Minister sought £16 million for Invest NI to replace an ERDF shortfall. Additionally, £93 million received for the High Street Voucher Scheme was returned and has been included in bids for 2021-22. The current lockdown restrictions meant a number of anticipated spends could not be utilised as previously planned. A further £12.4 million in COVID support funding was returned to DOF as it could not be utilised during the current restrictions. However, the Department indicated it would seek over £200 million in annually managed expenditure for 2021-22 to cover commitments that have been made. 
at Prevlas Cancorlia, this perhaps gives some illustration of the financial roller coaster that the Department for the Economy has been on over the past year. And as you will appreciate, this has made the committee's scrutiny rule very difficult to fulfil. However, the committee remains committed to providing as much scrutiny as possible. And I will now make some brief remarks as Sinn Féin economy spokesperson. Um, as I outlined, it has been a very diff, um, difficult and busy year in terms of bids and allocations from all departments, but particularly the Department for the Economy. The Finance Minister will be aware that the Department for the Economy handed back some £54 million in COVID funding in January, and since then, bids for further supports from DFE haven't been forthcoming. And this is despite groups of businesses, as the Chair of the Finance Committee highlighted, remaining to have little or no specific support. The Finance Minister will be aware because these are issues that have been raised with him and it has been well rehearsed that there is a good case for support to be made available. This includes for travel agents who everyone will recognise have been badly hit. They've been out significant sums from returning deposits and having lack of any new bookings. There are also independent agents who don't have premises and so have had little other support. There are some self-employed people who have been failed by the British Chancellor because they became self-employed too late. Uh, to, in the previous tax year to uh, qualify for the self-employed income support scheme and who were self-employed too long to qualify for DFE's scheme. This could be rectified by the Economy Minister making a bid for funds to extend the criteria of the existing scheme. And another sector badly hit is the events sector. Uh, they had previously missed out um, from supports and are not included in the uh, the tourism and hospitality support scheme, and again, this could be rectified by bidding for more funds uh, for that scheme and amending criteria. With 250 million to be allocated, it's difficult to justify not bidding to support businesses and workers that are struggling. And we all recognise the significant work that departmental officials are putting into delivering schemes and appreciate that. But there are people out there who are really struggling, and it's important that all efforts are made to get support to them while that money is available, especially if it's a case of relaxing or amending criteria of existing schemes rather than designing new ones. Perhaps the Finance Minister could update us on any discussions or bids that have been made in respect of further business supports. And just a final point before I finish, the Minister will be very aware that the Tory Chancellor is due to make a budget statement this week, and I'm hopeful that there will be an announcement of an extension to the furlough scheme. I'm sure the Minister would agree that businesses and some sectors in particular are going to require support to continue beyond the end of April. And I would ask that the, the Finance Minister continues to make the representations that I know he has been in respect of that, and also to urge the Chancellor to finally move to support some of those that he left excluded for the past year. And obviously, we're going to debate the uh, incoming year's budget tomorrow, so I'll keep my remarks in respect of that till then. Thanks. Thank you. And now, via Starleaf, if we could call up the Chair of the Education Committee, Mr Chris Little. Move on. I call the... Chair of the Health Committee, Mr. Colin Gildernew. Gorby Agat, Prayer Last Can Call You. I welcome the opportunity to speak today on behalf of the Health Committee and will provide some information on the Committee's consideration of current financial pressures. We are all aware that this has been a very difficult and indeed a challenging year. The unprecedented pandemic has meant that a lot of the original budget planning had to be put on hold and resources directed towards the Executive's response to COVID-19. While we understand the reasons and the need to redirect budget and, fund and funding, it has left the Department of Health and the wider public in a very difficult position and needing to consider in the coming years how it can recover and restart vital services with considerable and growing backlogs. We have seen the widespread postponement of elective surgery and of services. The recent publication of waiting lists has only highlighted the difficult position that the Department finds itself in. We find ourselves in a position where we have over 320,000 people waiting for their first outpatient appointment, with over 50 per cent waiting over one year, when the target is that no patient should wait longer than one year for their first appointment. The statistics for inpatient day case and diagnostic waiting times 
also make for bad reading. And yes, we can and we should outline the difficulties with COVID, but this goes beyond COVID and only outlines the need for the Department to drive forward the transformation programme and ensure that our wonderful and dedicated health and social care professionals have a system in place that is efficient, effective and reactive to the needs of the population. I do at this point want to pay a particular tribute to all those health and social care staff who, over the past year, have went away above and beyond what was expected or should be expected of them and have strove to ensure that everyone has had the care and support that they have needed. In relation to transformation, it is therefore concerning that at a committee meeting just a couple of weeks ago, the Department's Director of Finance briefed the committee and outlined that the funding available does not allow the Department to undertake a transformation programme with any level of ambition and that there won't be enough money in the budget next year. In relation to the 2021 budget, the committee did receive briefings from the Department throughout the year, and the Department received a number of different allocations throughout the year in relation to the response to COVID-19. The Department has advised that following the Executive's agreement to allocate additional funding of £175 million to purchase additional PPE, the post-January monitoring round position was almost £7.3 billion resource and £358 million in capital. The Committee welcomed the flexibility that there has been over the past year in allocating spend within the Department, but it did raise concerns in relation to £90 million being surrendered by the Department in the January monitoring round. The Committee would like to see better budget planning and prioritisation over the next budget period. This has also highlighted the need for multi-year budgets moving forward which will allow better planning and enable the Department to take forward a number of transformation projects rather than relying on monitoring rounds to fund need. I would also outline the difficulty that the Committee has in scrutinising the health and care budget, given that the Department of Finance, the Department of Health and the Trusts all allocate money under different headings, which can make it difficult to follow the funding. I would encourage those involved to progress towards clear line of sight in budgeting, which would increase transparency and improve scrutiny in what is a very large and complex budget. And if I may, Priyolas Kankolia, I would like to make a few remarks as uh, my role as Sinn Féin spokesperson for health. Many of the challenges that the health and social care sector currently faces predate, though have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. It is undeniable that through 10 years of Tory austerity, our health and social sector has been starved of the very resources it needs to provide a reliable and efficient system of health and social care. For example, waiting lists are not a new development. They have existed long before the arrival of COVID-19 and are the result of the long-standing financial pressures caused by Tory austerity. This pandemic has exacerbated these waiting lists, and we are now in the terrible reality where life-saving red flag surgeries and procedures are cancelled, causing additional intolerable suffering to patients all across the North. There is little evidence to date that there is any real proactive planning taking place within the Health Department, for example, the workforce planning that is needed to even begin to recommence many of the non-COVID health procedures that patients have been waiting for for such a long time. Forward planning for health and social care requires long-term surety of funds, and therefore, rather than reliance on monitoring rounds, we need to see multi-year budgets moving forward that will allow for effective and efficient planning and development of a health and social care sector that serves the health needs of our population. We are also told by the Department of Health that the long-awaited and much-needed transformation project will be less ambitious than previously thought because the funding simply does not exist. That is hugely disappointing and does not garner well for an improved health and social care sector in the future. As previously mentioned, it is with consternation that I note the £90 million surrendered by the Department in the January monitoring round, when there are so many priorities in the areas of health and social care that could easily have benefited from that funding. It is worrying that with the health care system showing so many stresses, the Department of the Minister could not identify an area of health where this money could have been spent. Of particular concern to Sinn Féin is that the pandemic has brought into sharp focus the impact of health inequalities across our more deprived communities, where infection and death rates from the pandemic were significantly higher. Time will tell if the damage done as the problems of long COVID surface 
to further impact upon the health of our less well off. Finally, we in Sinn Féin are concerned that the Department of Health has opted to carry out a high-level screening exercise rather than a full equality impact assessment of the Department of Health's draft budget 21-22. Using a high-level screening exercise is a completely inadequate means of gathering the information that is needed to assess the relevant equality impacts or opportunities. Therefore, the Department of Health should proceed to do a full equal equality impact assessment. Thank you, members. It has just turned 1.54, and that being the case, I propose that we should suspend this sitting of the House in order to allow question time to take place at 2 p.m. When we return to this item of business, the next speaker on the list is Mr Declan McAleer, the Chair of the Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee. By your leave, the House is suspended. Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary, program signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. All right, members, um, now time for questions to the Minister for Infrastructure, Kerstin Edenaira Infrastructure, Agus Gerem, Sir, and Dr. Keeva Archibald, Lesson Cage Cage Dr. Archibald, I now call Dr. Keeva Archibald to ask the first question. I'm going to get last can call you, Kerstin Edenaira. Question one, please. Thank the member for her question. Uh, with the pandemic continuing, private bus and coach operators, like many others, are dealing with an extremely difficult situation, particularly due to the shutdown of the tourism industry. I am pleased to have already delivered support to many operators in the sector through my first support fund, which closed just before Christmas. 140 valid applications were received for the first financial assistance scheme, and to date, most of those applications have been considered, with the one remaining application being processed at pace. 99 applications have been assessed as eligible for the scheme, resulting in payment. The main reason for ineligibility is that some operators are still profit-making despite a decline in business. However, the scheme has been set up to provide funding only when losses have been incurred to help those most in need and ensure value for money. The evidence presented to my department has confirmed the ongoing impact on the sector since September. The First and Deputy First Ministers have therefore agreed to my request for a further determination and designation under the Financial Assistance Act for a second financial assistance scheme. It will provide further support for the period between 1 October 2020 and 31 March 2021. I have engaged with the sector in the scheme and intend to launch it in early March. I thank the Minister for her response. The Minister will be aware that representatives of the sector have raised significant frustrations with the first scheme, with the high level of ineligibility and others not receiving full payment. Can I ask the Minister for her assessment of the scheme and whether she believes it is serving the needs of industry and for the Minister to commit to engaging with representatives of the sector? who believe their concerns aren't being heard. I thank the member for her question. Um, I have engaged with the sector and my officials have engaged with um, sector representatives again as recently as this month. And we have considered their written submissions and their suggestions. The sector had articulated concerns with the first scheme and I understand the issues they have raised. In developing the second scheme, uh, therefore, the £100,000 maximum cap has been removed. Officials are working to ensure that there are no limitations placed on payments due to state aid rules, and they will also seek to improve communications with operators. They were three of the issues that the sectors had raised with us. However, uh, many of their other requests have not been able to be taken on board as they do not meet the test of value for money. For example, payments will not be made to profit-making businesses, and in addition, administration and scrutiny of claims and sign-off by accountants are still needed to protect value for money. But I can assure the member that we will continue to engage closely with the sector because they are in a turbulent times, and obviously with the ongoing impact on the tourism industry, they will be effective for quite some time. Called Keith Buchanan. 
Minister for answers so far. Minister, the first scheme had a, a reach out to 67% of the, of the total people that were eligible, so 67% of the industry. Do you think that is a high enough figure, and will the second scheme catch more people or bring in more people into the scheme? And as the colleague across the way referred to, are you intended to have more dialogue with the, the operators within the next week or two before the second scheme is launched to make that 67% raise? thank the member for his question. Um, a total of 140 valid applications were received. This was once the duplicate applications and those uh, bus operators who provided no evidence were disallowed. As of today, I can confirm that 99 applications um, have been assessed as eligible for the scheme, while 40 applicants have been notified that they did not demonstrate that they meet the eligibility criteria. Uh, that's because they were not making a, a loss, and this scheme is very much about targeting support at those um, who need it. As I said, there is one remaining application and my officials are working at pace to progress this. Um, in terms of taking on the feedback and learning from the first scheme, we have made changes to the second scheme reflecting the concerns raised by the sector and we will of course continue to engage with them going forward. I call Mike Nesbitt. I thank the member uh, for his question. The department uses the GB system of speed limits. Our policy document called Setting Local Speed Limits in Northern Ireland is publicly available on the department's website, and this outlines our approach when setting speed limits outside of the system. Our system of speed limits primarily uses the presence of street lighting to distinguish between urban and rural environments. Broadly speaking, where street lighting is present, the speed limit will be 30 miles per hour. Elsewhere, the national speed limit applies unless indicated by traffic signs. The department considers a number of factors when assessing the need for a lower speed limit on a road, including the average speed collision history and the function of the road. We also consider the demographics as well as the needs of local people, including vulnerable road users, and the level of community support for a reduced speed limit. As Minister responsible for promoting and improving road safety, I want to work actively with partners to reduce death and serious injuries on our roads, and setting appropriate speed limits is part of the solution. However, I firmly believe that attitudes to speeding have to change. Drivers need to view speed limits as a limit and not a target. And my department's public information campaigns repeat the message that speeding is not acceptable. I also believe my commitment to providing part-time 20 miles per hour limits at 100 schools, as well as helping to improve road safety at schools, will go some way to changing attitudes and behaviours, but all road users also need to play their part. Mr Nesbitt, for a supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister and Commander for the 20 mile an hour um, initiative. Uh, I, I asked her officials if they would look at the speed limit at Teal Rocks on the peninsula side of Newton Arts, following concerns from a young mother about the number of accidents and her belief that a pedestrian may be killed. Uh, your officials said no, but I understand of the nine relevant factors for changing a speed limit, one is reducing public anxiety. So could I ask the Minister if she would take a personal interest in, in reviewing that speed limit? Thank the member for his question. I am aware of his correspondence on this matter, and officials will relook and, and assess the situation. Um, in terms of the public anxiety, it is a, an important uh, factor, and it's one that I want to try to address, address, not just on an individual basis, but collectively. And so the member may be aware that there are a number of activities being carried out through my department's multimedia approach to kind of address public anxiety and also to send a very clear message as well to vulnerable road users that their safety is important and that we as a department want to do what we can to make all of those who use our roads feel safe. Call Michelle McElveen. And like my constituency colleague, I have asked for a review of the speed limit along the A20 Portafire Road, as well as the A21, the A22 and the A23 within the constituency, none of which have been reduced despite accidents. Unfortunately, and perhaps unfairly, the Department has a reputation for not wanting to act until there is a fatality. Can I ask the Minister if it is not time to review the national speed limits with a particular focus on single carriageways in the countryside and on the edge of towns? 
I thank the member for her question, but I hope she will understand that I would have to very strongly refute any suggestion that the Department sits back and only takes action when someone uh, is injured. We take our commitments on road safety very seriously. Um, in relation to uh, changing the, the national speed limit, um, there are no current plans to change the current system of speed limit as the Department's view is that the approach has flexibility to take into account local conditions when determining the appropriate limit. Our current policy for setting speed limits does contain a desire to assess speed limits on the upper tier Class A and B road network, the outworkings of which would have informed a possible assessment of the ongoing applicability of the national speed limit, the consideration of which was contained within an action of the road safety strategy to 2020. Um, my department remains uh, committed to doing what we can to address road safety. And while there are no current plans within this mandate uh, to change the speed limit, uh, I want to assure the member of my ongoing commitment to doing what we can to improve safety on our roads for all of our users. I thank the Minister for her answers so far. Minister, whilst the rollout of the 20 mile an hour zones is a very welcome development, I know a number of schools were disappointed that they weren't included in the initial rollout. What assurances can the Minister give that she will prioritise the further rollout of this scheme as um, part of her road safety programme? Thank you. I thank the member for her question. And I was delighted to be able to commit funding from this year's budget to introduce uh, part-time 20 miles per hour speed limits at around 100 schools. And I am pleased that good progress is being made to implement this programme. I am determined to make the roads around all of our schools safer for everyone. And it is therefore my intention that many more schools will have a part-time 20 miles per hour speed limit outside their gates. Of course, the scale and extent of any future programmes will be dependent on the funding allocated to my department. I'll under Muir for a question. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. As the Minister will be aware, the default speed limit in urban areas is 30 miles an hour. But in Wales uh, this summer, they're going to trial in eight areas a reduction to 20 miles an hour. Has the Minister given consideration to trial in that in some areas in Northern Ireland? Thank you. Thank the member for his question. Um, I've been very much focused on the rollout of the 20 miles per hour in the 100 schools, but I'm also very conscious of initiatives that are taking place across these islands. And I always ask my officials to very closely monitor any of the pilots and ensure that I am updated on feedback and can give consideration as to the merits or otherwise of similar initiatives in Northern Ireland. Uh, could we please bring Paula Bradshaw into the spotlight? Question three, right, please, Paula Mr. Brassett, Speaker. Yeah. I thank the member for her question. Uh, the flying of flags and the attachment of emblems to departmental street lighting columns is an offence under the Roads Order 1993, and my department has the power to remove them from its property. One of my department's primary considerations is the safety of the public, and where unauthorised flags or attachments pose a hazard to road users, my department will always seek to remove that danger. While, where there is no such danger, my department will liaise closely with other key stakeholders to seek to develop a solution. While recognising my department's responsibility, the reality is that if we, as a society, are to find a sustainable and lasting solution to the problem of illegal flags and emblems, then we must all step up. This includes not only me and my department, but also other executive leaders, as well as members of all parties within the Assembly. The area is being explored by the Commission on Flags, Identity, Culture and Tradition, set up as part of the Fresh Start Agreement, and I understand that a report has issued to uh, the Executive Office. I wrote jointly with the Justice Minister on the issue of flags to the Executive Office on the 18th of September last year, and have asked for sight of the Commission's report so that collectively we can make progress in this important and challenging area. Ms Bradshaw for a supplementary. Um, thank you, Minister. Um, the um, Executive Office re responded to a written question for me regarding um, the Commission's report that you have just outlined and indicated that the two junior ministers are establishing a working group to look at their recommendations and findings. Can you confirm whether or not your department's officials have been invited onto that and what role you think they could play on it? Thank you. I thank the member um, for her question. Um, I'm not. 
aware of a working group being set up um, and so I can't comment on the involvement of my officials or otherwise but it's certainly something that I will take a look at. What I am conscious of is that you know with the Justice Minister I wrote to the Executive Office on the 18th of September but unfortunately have yet to receive a response to that correspondence. I am very committed to doing what I can to address this long-running problem in our society but as I said in my initial response we will only find a lasting sustainable solution when we work collectively and together. Okay. Call Doris Kelly for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. I think it's deeply troubling that uh, you wrote on such an important issue on the 18th of September, because in my constituency and others, we have seen the erection of very sinister posters of late, and people would question why they are allowed to remain on the street furniture. So I just wonder, Minister, do you share my concern that the Executive Office isn't showing uh, due diligence and consideration of this report, and, and have you any reason why, uh, given that your department would play such a centre role that hasn't been shared with yourself as, as yet? Thank the member for a question. Unfortunately, um, I'm not in executive office, and so uh, I cannot answer questions on their behalf. Um, what I can do is say that I am up for trying to address this wider societal problem with all of my executive colleagues and with all political parties in this House, uh, with all councils uh, and all communities. It is a long-running issue. Uh, we need to address it. Uh, as you say, we have seen the erection of posters on Brexit, the Irish Sea border. We have seen, you know, uh, inflammatory messages throughout our history that cause intimidation and great upset. I think it's long past time now as a society that we came together and we found a lasting solution. Colroy Biggs. Speaker, the Minister has rightly acknowledged that she already has the power to remove uh, many barriers, banners should, should she so wish. But since the creation of the border down the RIC, we have a very aggrieved unionist community. And there has been no attempt uh, to gain cross-community support and, the, and to honour the protections within the Belfast Agreement. So my question to the Minister is, does she acknowledge that where her officials to attempt to remove peaceful, democratic banners which have been uh, erected, non-threatening banners, would she acknowledge if they were removed that they would be likely to be replaced by many, many more? I thank the member for his question. Um, I understand that there is a sense of anxiety within the unionist um, community, um, but that requires leadership. Uh, that requires honesty. And the truth is there has been no change to the Constitution. And so I would urge people, when they're, when they're making comment, to not use terminology like guerrilla warfare, to be very mindful that our words have serious impact. And when people are feeling anxious, we should be honest with them and we should be trying to address those anxieties. In the executive, I brought forward uh, a suggestion that we would, as an executive, find consensus to request a three-month extension to the grace period while trying to find pragmatic solutions to the difficulties that businesses are facing, while also working to maximise the opportunities that can be presented. To date, I have not, unfortunately, been able to secure the support of my unionist colleagues in doing that, but I have no interest in causing division. I have no interest in causing anxiety. All I want to do is to work hard as a Minister for Infrastructure with my executive of colleagues so that we can improve the lives of all of our citizens, whatever their political persuasion. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, just following on, Minister, what is the Department's current approach in dealing with the issue of flying of flags and, and banners? And also, has she any uh, statistics in relation to the number of times the Department has been asked to remove such items? I thank the member for his question. Um, where flags have not been attached securely to lampposts, it is possible that the detachment of flags and other materials from lampposts and other street furniture could potentially distract or injure road users. Fortunately, there have been no significant incidents of this nature to date. Um, in terms of the, the numbers of flags and banners that we have successfully removed, we have discreetly removed a small number of flags and banners over recent years, but records of this are not kept. Records were previously kept, but this practice ceased around six years ago. I call Mervyn Storey. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answer. However, I have to take uh, issue with her when she says that her department does take measures to remove such emblems whenever in my own constituents in the village of Risharkin, having written to previous Minister Kennedy, having raised it repeatedly, we still have in the village of Risharkin uh, signs from Republican organisations 
which have, do not have the support of the community. They should have been removed a long time ago, and it is a failure on the part of your department to deal with this issue in a village that has been subjected to a lot of intimidation in the past, part of which emanates from those illegal Does the member have a question? That, that when are they going to be removed, and can I have an assurance that they will be removed? I thank the member for his question. Let me be unequivocal. I have no support or truck for the erection of flags or emblems that cause intimidation to anyone. But this is the complexity of the issue. In a previous question, Mr Roy Beggs appealed to me to not remove emblems that have been erected in one part of Northern Ireland, and you now have a request for a removal in another part. The reality is that the Minister for Infrastructure, whatever political party they are in, will never be able to find a lasting solution to this issue. It requires political leadership. It requires the executive coming together and addressing this issue holistically and collectively and responsibly. Here, Mr. Cara Hunter, I call Cara Hunter. Question four, please. I thank the member for her question. Last week, I was delighted to announce plans for a new park and ride scheme at Dungiven. This will provide around 150 spaces adjacent to the junction of the new A6 Dungiven to Drumahoe Dual Carriageway with the Feeney Road, and will help to deliver cleaner, greener, sustainable transport for the local community. My department will now begin the pre-application discussions with Causeway Coast and Glensborough Council as a precursor to applying for planning permission later this year. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister for her answers so far. Minister, this is fantastic news for the people of Dungiven, uh, and I know you've worked hard uh, to provide the park and ride. Uh, on the matter of accessibility, can I ask the Minister, will there be a shuttle bus provided to get people from Dungiven Town out to the park and ride? I can confirm to the member that the department is working closely with TransLink to consider operational requirements for public transport through Dungiven when the park and ride is completed. TransLink are committed to continue to provide an appropriate level of service to Dungiven, and we will certainly look at that request in order to assist the local community. I thank the Minister for her responses um, and I welcome the progress and the announcement last week after meeting with the, the Minister and raising the importance of this scheme. Um, indeed, the right public transport infrastructure will help public transport bounce back after the pandemic. Can I ask the Minister for a timescale on the delivery of this project and whether it will be in place when that section of the A6 is completed and whether um, cycling infrastructure will be in place as well to encourage active transport? Can I add it? I thank the member for her question. Um, subject to successful land acquisition, planning approval and procurement, I would anticipate that the park and ride site could be operational to coincide with the completion of the A6 dueling scheme in 2022. I can also confirm that there will be active travel in terms of a walking and cycling link uh, to the park and ride as well, because we need to be maximising all opportunities to increase active and sustainable transport and to be offering our citizens increased choice. I call Mervyn Story. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I am intrigued by the Minister's commitment in terms of delivering planning, in particular this issue. In the light of the unac unacceptable delays within the planning system, particularly within Causeway Coast and Lanes, is that an issue that she will look at to ensure that there is a process in place which gives an outcome and not what we have had for too long in that area? Delay, delay, delay. Thank the member for his question. The member will be aware, uh, as a veteran uh, MLA, that we moved to a two-tier planning system, and so a significant number of applications fall to the local councils to be processed. Um, the member will also be aware of the improvements that my department is undertaking at a strategic and regional level to improve the planning process and its efficiency. And of course, we will continue to work with councils to support them. I would encourage the member, if he has concerns about the planning processes within uh, his local council to be raising that directly with them also. I call Jonathan Buckley. Question number five. 
I thank the member for his question. Um, Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced the Union Connectivity Review in June 2020 with no communication beforehand with any of the devolved administrations, even though I had previously raised my concerns with Grant Chaps, MP, the Secretary of State for Transport. Following the announcement in August 2020 that Sir Peter Hendy would be chairing the Union Connectivity Review, I held further discussions with my counterparts in the Welsh and Scottish Governments to discuss our shared concerns regarding Section 46 of what was then the Internal Market Bill, which would give the British Government the ability to directly spend on projects within Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, even if those policy areas normally fall under devolved competencies. Accordingly, in September, a joint letter was sent to the Secretary of State for Transport, setting out our significant concerns and reminding him that devolution must be respected and that locally elected, locally accountable ministers are best placed to make local decisions. I spoke to Minister Shapps again in October to restate my concerns, and I met with the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland soon after and reaffirmed my determination that decisions on local infrastructure priorities are determined by local ministers. I also provided the Secretary of State with a list of priority infrastructure projects as determined by New Decade New Approach. Members will be aware that I met with Sir Peter in uh, December 2020 to discuss the Union Connectivity Review in detail and outlined my concerns and again affirmed my opposition to any extravagant vanity projects. I heard nothing further on the matter until media reports in February that agreement on a tunnel between Scotland and Northern Ireland was shortly to be approved. While my officials have been in touch with the Department for Transport and have been assured that this is not the case and that news articles had greatly overstated the situation, I have made my position extremely clear. I am the Minister for Infrastructure and devolution mandates me to take decisions that will improve the lives of citizens here. Mr Buckley for a supplementary. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker and thanks to the Minister for her response. Albeit I know that the Minister received uh, late notice of the Union Connectivity Review, since June there has been a lot of time in which the Minister's Department can become involved and help we are seeing. Now, the Minister has form for talking down east-west connectivity. So can I ask her, has the Minister or her Department submitted any written evidence regarding Northern Ireland's need for infrastructure as a part of UK connectivity? These are exciting projects that have the, up, the ability to transform the Union in relation to connectivity and infrastructure, and would she please outline if she has or has not submitted that information? As I said to the member, I met with Sir Peter Hendy. I have also written uh, to the Secretary of State and to Grant Chaps uh, and to a number of government ministers. In fact, I have written as recently as today, again, to remind the ministers of their commitments in New Decade and New Approach to turbocharging infrastructure. Members in this House rightly raise concerns about the fact of potholes, street lighting, uh, and yet here we have a proposal for three tunnels and a roundabout under the Isle of Man. Uh, that is clearly a vanity and distraction pro pro a project. Um, if money is coming our way, I will ensure that it is spent on infrastructure projects that we have all committed to, ministers across all political parties, and that the British government has committed to in New Decade and New Approach. I think that Simon Hoare summed it up perfectly. Uh, he described this project uh, as the following. The trains could be pulled by an inexhaustible herd of unicorns, overseen by stern, officious dodos. A push-me-pull-you could be the senior guard, and puff the magic dragon, the inspector. Uh, let's concentrate on making the protocol work and put the hallucinogenics down. Call Jim Allister. Thank you. I just say to the Minister, I think she should be better than that. But I do have to say this. It's quite clear from her first answer. She has expended a great deal of energy opposing connectivity. But could I ask her specifically about the A75? Uh, she told Mr Beggs, in answer to a written question on the 15th of July, that her departments had not yet had detailed discussions with their Scottish counterparts about the South West Transport Scotland, the South West Scotland Transport Study, which is, includes improvements to the A75. Has she yet had those discussions, or is she so besotted with, right. with these other issues that she has no time? 
I thank the member for his question. I am keen to see the A75 and A77 upgraded. These key links into Scotland and England are clearly of significant importance to Northern Ireland trade. Upgrading the routes would reduce journey times, improve journey time reliability and increase safety on the routes and complement the relatively recent improvements that have been completed on the strategic links to Larnport. However, while I am supportive, I am conscious that these roads are in Scotland, and I therefore recognise that this is very much a decision for Scottish ministers. My departmental officials are familiar with the South West Scotland Transport Study, um, and one of the key aims of this transport study is to consider the rationale for improvements to key strategic corridors, including the A75 and the A77, with a focus on access to the ports at Cairn Ryan. My officials remain ready and willing to engage in detailed discussions discussions with their Scottish counterparts in relation to this transport st study. This has been uh, delayed uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we expect that discussions will take place very soon, with this study feeding into the Scotland Strategic Transport Project Review 2, which is expected to report towards the end of this year. The member will also be aware that I am in very regular engagement with my ministerial counterpart uh, in Scotland, and of course I will continue to raise this issue when we meet. I can get a brief question in from Mr Aiken and uh, hopefully a brief answer to conclude. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, and for the Minister and for answer so far. Obviously, we are all against fantasy bridges, fantasy tunnels and fantasy roundabouts. But indeed, could the Minister say why she is still committed to the narrow water bridge when, in fact, what she should be doing is using the investment for that to be used to dealing with our own infrastructure problem with our roads at the moment? I will be very succinct, Mr Deputy Speaker. Narrow Water Bridge is a commitment to new decade, new approach, the basis upon which your party, my party and the other parties in this chamber entered into the executive. Would members refrain from making commentary from the seated position, please? It does interfere with, with the recording, but it also has bad manners. That, that concludes our oral questions on this. We now move to the topicals. And uh, I call Mr. Tom Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. De Deputy Speaker. Minister, can I ask what plans you have to reinstate the driving test for key workers, such as our health workers, ambulance staff, uh, fire service, etc., where the, the driving is a key part of the work that they're involved in? I thank the member for raising this issue. It is an important one. And the member will know that during the initial lockdown period, the DVA assessed requests from key workers to provide them with priority driving test appointments once driving tests resumed. Um, the DBA has received a number of requests from key workers requesting that they restate a priority service for them to avail of early appointments. The DBA is actively considering the facilitation of priority requests from key workers whose jobs are ancillary to medical, health or social care services and who are required to drive for the purposes of their work. However, this approach would be based on engagement with the relevant employers rather than with the individual learners to provide the DBA with a list of any relevant staff that fall within this priority group. I am pleased to report that in working uh, with the ambulance service, we have been able to facilitate a number of driving tests, and so we are very keen to do what we can to ensure that those who need to get driving tests, who are on the front line, putting their lives at risk to save ours, are supported to do so safely. Mr Buchanan, for a supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that response. Can the Minister give any indication? I know she has said they facilitate, uh, facilitated some ambulance drivers, but can she give any indication of a time frame when it will likely be opened up for all of the key workers that require this type of a, uh, the licence for their work? I thank the member for his question. Um, our work is ongoing to ensure that when restrictions enable us to do so, that we can open up uh, the driving test facility to um, all of our customers. Um, I'm not able to give a definitive date at this time as to when it will be opened up to priority workers, but I can assure you that we are working with key employers to address this issue, and I'm happy to provide the member with a further update. Before we move to the next question, just to notify members that question number eight has been withdrawn. I give Nisha Yerim Sir Kiva Archibald for your cash. I call Kiva Archibald. Um, Gormagat, last can call you. Um, can I ask the Minister for an update on the planning application for Casement Park, please? Yes. 
Thank the member for her question. Um, since my announcement in October recommending planning approval for the redevelopment of Casement Park, I am pleased to advise that there has been considerable progress towards issuing the final planning decision, following both the Council and the applicant conferring that they agreed with the Notice of Opinion to approve the application. Departmental officials have been working at pace to progress the required planning agreement, which must be in place before the final planning decision can issue. I look forward to the final planning decision issuing for this project, as I am of the view that the project will give a real boost to sport across our island, the local economy, and finally give the GAA its home minister. Um, and I thank the Minister for her response. The Minister will know that the Casement Park project can have a transformative um, impact in West Belfast and the, the wider Gaelic Games community, and we all want to see this project delivered. Um, but can the Minister explain why, five months after she made the very welcome announcement, the planning approval process has not yet been completed and is causing further delay? I thank the member for her question. Uh, the member will be aware, um, and anyone will be aware if they have a keen interest in this application, that it is extremely complex. But I can assure the member that my officials are progressing it at pace uh, and properly. And um, officials remain committed to working on this. And I have made, made clear my view that I remain committed to doing this. So work is ongoing at pace. But of course, as with all planning applications, they must be processed quickly but properly. I call Roy Bakes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. There is widening acknowledgement that the current EU trading arrangements uh, with the United Kingdom and the Northern Ireland Protocol are causing difficulties for both the haulage sector and indeed small businesses in particular. So, my, my question to the Minister given that uh, respected EU commentators such as Tony Connolly are advising that there is some, a degree of rethinking going on, does the Minister agree? that it would be wise not to spend money on capital projects which may not be needed. I thank the member for his question. I'm not entirely sure which capital projects um, he is referring to. What I'm doing is progressing executive flagships. Uh, I'm also trying to progress where possible and where funding permits um, commitments that we've made in a new decade, new approach. I think my frustration is that I'm not able to progress more capital projects that will be transformative for our citizens. I certainly don't see investment in any of the executive flagships or any of the commitments that we've all signed up to uh, as a waste of money. Roy Biggs for a supplementary. <coughs> Sorry, the Minister hasn't picked up my line of questioning. I'm talking about the, the planned infrastructure at our ports, which is currently being built, and which, if uh, there are changes occur, as, as there is increased recognition of the difficulties, if in particular there is an SPS agreement, which I understand virtually every party except Sinn Féin in the Chamber uh, is, is supportive of, much of those uh, infrastructure uh, being built will actually not be needed. I thank the member for his question. I think if I could just answer by going to the heart of the issue, this is about implementing the protocol. Uh, this is a, a legal requirement on the DERA minister, on all ministers within the executive, and I, it's imperative that, that, that the protocol is implemented. But as I said, there are difficulties, no one's denying that, and of course that's why the SDLP has been proposing an extension to the grace period, uh, but also that why we work to address and find pragmatic solutions to the difficulties hauliers are, are facing, for example, that we also work hard to maximise the economic opportunities that are there to be had for our businesses right across Northern Ireland. Call Michelle McElveen. Mr. Speaker, I refer the, the Minister back to a written question which I asked in relation to the provision of additional shelter on the Strangford Ferry for foot passengers, including school children, to protect them from inclement weather, to which the Minister suggested that they wear suitable clothing. I am sure the Minister would not find it acceptable for anyone close to her to travel around Belfast on an open top bus in the rain and then go to school in wet clothes. As social distancing is likely to be with us for some considerable time, will the Minister give a commitment to seriously look at alternative types of shelter for the ferry? I thank the member for her question. Um, she has a keen interest uh, in the Strangford Ferry, so we will be aware of the additional services that we have put on to cater for school children. 
Um, the mitigations and the measures that are in place in Strangford Ferry have been carried out following risk assessments and in line with the public health advice. We have liaised very closely with the Department of Health. Of course, I don't want to see any child uh, in the rain heading to school, but the challenge, as I think are articulated in that um, AQ response, was that we have to balance uh, the need of public health and safety with social distancing requirements, and there's also a safety element as well to a canopy being put uh, across the ferry. So just to assure the member, uh, we continue to look to see if we can find solutions to this, and of course we will continue to revise uh, the mitigations on the ferry and the services right across my department uh, in line with public health Advice as that changes and as hopefully we move through the restrictions. Michelle McElveen for a supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her answer. But, and as the Minister will be aware, residents in the Ards Peninsula use the Strangford Ferry, as others across Northern Ireland use the bus to go to work. Can I ask the Minister if she will commit to introduce a permanent 7 a.m. ferry from Port of Ferry for workers, many of whom are key workers and work in the health and social care sector and construction, who at the moment cannot get to work in time? Thank the member for her question, and I can assure her that we keep the situation under constant um, review. Uh, if a need, if there is a clear need and it's evidence, then of course we will do what we can to cater cust for our customers. As I said, we have put the additional service on in the morning time uh, for school children. We will also be aware that using the blue green fund, I've also um, made we're making uh, changes to the ferry to ensure the particulates uh, are taken out of the system as well, improving the air quality for our customers. So we're always on the lookout to see how we can improve our service. I call Jim Allister. Does the Minister think that it is sensible that the Planning Appeals Commission does not have powers to revoke permissions which, on reflection, were wrong? I refer particularly to the Kells Battery Energy Scheme, which was approved on the basis of being non generating, and now the Department has decreed that such schemes are generating, yet the PAC has no power to revoke. Is that a sensible position? Thank the member for his question. I am aware uh, of an issue with the treatment of energy storage systems in the planning system in Northern Ireland. Uh, following a review of this type of development, the member will know that my chief planner issued an update clarifying the department's position on the 16th of December. The chief planner update clarifies that, for the purposes of planning in Northern Ireland, the department considers that electricity storage development falls within the meaning of an electricity generating uh, station. This uh, chief planner update is not a legislative or policy change and is instead provided as clarification from the Department. Local planning authorities are therefore advised to adopt this position when processing applications for electricity storage facilities such as battery energy storage system. I am aware that the member has written to me in respect of revocation of the planning uh, per permission, but I understand that Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough Council have decided not to revoke planning permission for the Kells uh, battery energy storage system, which is a discretionary Council power under section 68 of the 2011 Planning Act. Mr. Allister, for supplementary, sorry. And of course, it wasn't Antrim and Newton Abbey Council that gave the, the Planning Commission, it was the Planning Appeals Commission. That's my point. Since now, at the patently obvious, that permission should not have been given. The Council don't want to get involved, but the Department has extraordinary revocation powers. Why doesn't it exercise them, and in what circumstances does it exercise revocation powers? I thank the member for his question. While I acknowledge my department does have revocation powers, these powers are a check and balance in the two-tier planning system intended to be used only exceptionally and as a matter of last resort. The Council, as a local planning authority for the area, is both best placed to make this decision and is the authority with the responsibility to do so. This is in keeping with the spirit of the then Northern Ireland Executive's decision to transfer local planning decisions to local councils and create the two-tier planning system. I call Paula Bradley. Thank you. Mr Deputy Speaker, Minister, I very much welcome your announcement last month to do with the proposed development of a cycle route along the Cave Hill and Limestone roads. I know it's early yet, but can you give any indication of when that development might be complete? 
I thank the member for her positive support for it. I think uh, North Belfast has been left behind in terms of, of active travel, and it's something that I'm very keen working with the councils uh, and with other government departments to try to address. Um, at the minute, we're working up um, some suggestions around um, the experimental nature of the scheme, but then we will be moving shortly to a public consultation. Uh, as I've said before, it's important if you're wanting to deliver lasting change that you do it uh, with communities. So we will be moving to consultation with local residents. I know local sporting groups like North Belfast Harriers and so forth have been in touch as well, and also elected representatives. But I would be keen to see uh, cycle provision, uh, greater cycle provision in North Belfast at the earliest opportunity. Paula Bradley for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answer. And Minister, you and I both know North Belfast is not the flat of, flattest of constituencies and does, doesn't often lend itself to many cycle routes. But it's just to ask, I mean, we go out as far as Glen Gormley, um, that those people living in the Greater Belfast area commute into Belfast to work, which we want to see, and we want, it, we want to see that increase. So just to ask, would she look further at other parts of North Belfast? Thank the member for her question. And um, we have written out to all councils, including uh, Antrim and Newton Abbey, as well, for them to bring forward proposals and ideas that we can, with resource or with capital monies, um, support. So very keen to see that we maximise whatever opportunities there are to enhance active travel provision for citizens right across North Belfast. And as you say, it is a hilly place, but there is al always the opportunity now to have an e-bike because we changed the legislation in that regard. Uh, and having used it myself. It's effortless going up a hill, so I would recommend it to the member. <laughs> Jerry Kelly, for on your case, uh, a quick question from Jerry Kelly, and possibly get to fit it in. Could the minister give us an update on the high town incinerator uh, application, please? Thank the member for his question. My officials are continuing to progress the application in line with planning policy. The applicant voluntarily submitted further environmental information to the department in October and December of 2020. I am keen to bring a resolution to this long-standing application for all involved. But if the sound decision is to be reached, it is important the planning system is completely or is completed correctly. The necessary administrative processes have been undertaken, including advertising the um, further environmental information and requesting consultation advice from the necessary interested bodies and public authorities. As my officials will be making a recommendation to me on the planning application, it is important that I consider carefully and take into account all views in reaching any decision that needs to be taken. In the interim, as I hope the member appreciates, it would not be appropriate for me to comment on the individual planning merits or otherwise of this application. Jerry Kelly, supplementary question from Jerry Kelly. I thank the Minister for her answer so far. The Minister will be very aware of uh, it's within her uh, ambit that there's 5,000 signatures um, against this uh, being uh, put forward. I understand that she can't give her decision at the moment, but is she aware of, uh, first of all, anything to do with what sort of uh, costs are being raised in, in terms of this? I'm, I'm referring to um, uh, one in Edmonton in London, which went from uh, five, 650 million to 1.2 billion, and if this has an effect there, and uh, if possible, does she know anything about? Uh, I know there was cross-party, full cross-party support against for the residents and against this incinerator. Has that changed? Has, has she been lobbied uh, to change that? I thank the member um, for his question. I am aware of the number of responses to the planning. Uh, to this particular uh, planning application and the opposition that he has highlighted that exists locally. Uh, as the Minister with responsibility for planning, um, I, of course, will carefully consider all of the representations that are made uh, and will consider very carefully the recommendation that comes before me from my planning officials. That concludes topical questions. If members just take their ease while we move to the next set of questions, please.
Okay, members, we, we'll move now to questions to the Minister for Ju of Justice. Uh, just before we do so, question number eight has been withdrawn. Um, I call Mr Harry Harvey to ask the first question. Mr Harvey. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Question number one, Minister, please. Call the Minister of Justice. At the 1st of February 2021, there were around 10,000 criminal cases compared to approximately 8,100 cases in March 2020. This increase is down significantly from a high of approximately 12,800 cases in the court system in September 2020. Although jury trials have recommenced, the number of new cases coming into the system currently exceeds the number of trials held. It is not possible to accurately determine the overall backlog of cases for civil business in exactly the same manner as for criminal. However, business volumes in the county court are currently around 60% of those in the first 11 weeks of 2020 prior to lockdown. Family court receipts and disposals declined from the start of lockdown. However, the dip in receipts was less marked than those seen in other business areas. Following the reopening of most courts in August, the average number of receipts and disposals has increased significantly and now slightly exceeds pre-lockdown levels. Mr Harvey, first supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could the Minister um, outline how she plans to address the backlog going forward? Thank you. Well, the member will be aware from previous answers of the work that has already been done within the criminal justice system in terms of ensuring that we are able to continue to work our way through the backlog that exists. Court business was initially consolidated into five court hubs in order to facilitate the delivery of urgent matters whilst maintaining the safety of all court users and staff in line with public health advice. Following a series of COVID-19 risk assessments, significant work has been undertaken to make sure court buildings are kept safe, secure and clean, and that social distancing occurs in line with the public health agency guidance. NICS continues to move forward towards full business recovery following the initial peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Only three of the smallest hearing centre venues are now non-operational. These venues will be risk assessed in due course. However, the initial focus has been on the larger venues, which offer greater flexibility. The reopening of the court estate, along with business directions from the Office of the Lord Chief Justice, has seen the full range of services resumed by the end of September 2020, albeit at reduced capacity due to necessary social distancing. Here, Mr. Cal Boylan, for your case, I call Cal Boylan. Carmel, good luck and cordial. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, was access funding available this in, in this financial year? Did you bid for any additional funds to tackle the backlog or minimal mortgage? There are a number of areas where we did um, receive additional funding um, in terms of court service. However, the money that is left at the moment in terms of um, the underspend is not something which we would be able um, to bid for um, and use in this particular year, which is the requirement as things stand. The physical measures which were put in place um, and a number of the other options, including, for example, um, the hiring of external venues to allow for additional circulation space, such as at the ICC centre at the Waterfront Hall, um, all of that has been paid for, um, either through additional receipts from the Department of Finance or um, from reallocation of funding within the business area of the Department of Justice. Um, because where some of our business was not able to be completed earlier in the year, we have been able to use that money in order to support recovery. I call Doug Beattie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and Mr. Thank you. I know there has been an awful lot of work uh, been put into this over this last uh, number of months. Could I just ask, um, I, I know you have been creating uh, COVID um, spaces for jury trials. Could you just let us know how we are getting on with the ones that are due to be finished in April in Antrim, Dungannon and Newry? The work that is being done in the three smaller courthouses, um, which are not operational at the moment, um, they, those are still undergoing risk assessment and that work will be completed in due course. However, by the end of um, the current phase of work, we have actually more um, jury court space available now than we did pre-pandemic. So we have more courtrooms which are able to operate for jury trials at the moment, even with those three facilities closed, than we previously did at the start of the pandemic. I think there are 13 courtrooms which will be able to operate for jury trials. 
There is an issue, um, Mr Speaker, in, in respect um, of jury trials that is not to do with capacity in the system, but actually to do with the complexity um, of the trials. So, for example, where you have multiple defendants, you will also have multiple um, legal teams. You will have a much larger group of people within the court system. And whilst they can be physically accommodated, it does run the risk in trials of that nature of someone within that particular trial system um, to be either identified as having contracted COVID or um, having been exposed to it and needing to self-isolate. And for that reason, those more complex trials are much more difficult to schedule. So most of the jury trials that have been proceeding um, to date have been those that are slightly shorter cases um, that can be seen in a number of days rather than weeks, and also those that have single defendants. Called Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Minister, thank you very much for your, que- for your answers so far. Could I ask um, if family courts will be able to sit into the summer to allow this critical service to continue and avoid further delays, especially when we hear that so many have, people have partners that have used COVID to postpone hearings? Well, I thank the member for her question. The family proceedings courts, um, in which most family cases are dealt with, are part of the magistrate's court tier, and those courts remain open throughout the year. Family care centres at county court level and the high court family division would normally have a recess over the summer. However, judges will be available for hearings at both FCC and high court level during the summer period, as they were last year, where a hearing is considered appropriate. From mid-April 2020, family cases received and disposed of have steadily increased. Following the reopening of most courts in August 2020, the average number of receipts and disposals has increased further and now slightly exceeds the pre-lockdown levels. The number of children's order sittings between July and December were 5% higher than in the same period in 2019. In terms of hours sat, there were 13.5% more hours sat between July and December 2020 than in the same period in 2019. There does come a point, however, where we do need to look at the capacity within the system in terms of the judiciary and others who are qualified to hear cases, as well as the physical capacity and the time available in the courts. And it's about ensuring that there is a proper balance in all of that as we go forward. Um, the Criminal Justice Board fulfils that role in respect um, of the work that we do in the criminal courts, um, but we also um, work on the civil courts as far as is possible. But the member will recognise that many of the control elements are not within the, guise, the, the gift of the Department for Justice when it comes to civil matters. Here, Mayor Jerry Carroll, for your question, I call Jerry Carroll. For Thanks, Deputy Speaker. Thanks, Minister, for answers uh, so far. Minister, given that uh, there have been over a thousand magistrates, defendants received through the court process in relation to TV licence non-payment from March to December of last year, can I ask for your assessment as to how far that is, given there are so many people waiting on uh, court cases for serious crime instances, as you refer to? Thank you. The issue of scheduling um, of of cases in the courts is not a matter for the Department of Justice, it is entirely a matter for the independent judiciary. So it isn't for me to tell them what should be prioritised and not prioritised, and it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on the member's question. Can we bring uh, Colin McGrath into the spotlight, please? Question, Mr McGrath. Uh, Question number two, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is my preference and intention that an advertising campaign will start in late autumn to align with the introduction of the new domestic abuse offence. This will involve a multimedia approach similar to the See the Science campaign that has been running for the last three years. It will be important in raising awareness that that we reach all sections of society, regardless of gender, age, sexual orientation or any other attribute given that anyone can be a victim or an abuser. The campaign will be externally sourced, but it is important that key messaging is developed in consultation with our statutory and voluntary partners, representing as wide a range of views as possible. Tackling domestic abuse is a key priority for me and for the Department, and along with our partners, we are committed to ensuring that both victims and perpetrators are aware of the new offence and that victims are aware of where they can get the help and support that they need. In advance of any new campaign, my department, together with partners, continue to deliver a number of initiatives to raise public awareness of domestic abuse. I relaunched the department's See the Science campaign at Christmas and into the new year, and other organisations similarly undertook campaigns earlier this year to promote the important message 
<coughs> that help remains available, including from PSNI and Crime Stoppers. Awareness also continues to be raised through a media campaign run by the 24-hour Domestic and Sexual Abuse Helpline, ongoing social media activity, as well as work undertaken by our statutory and voluntary sector partners, including policing and community safety partnerships. Case Dorlene Tuck, Colin McGrath, a supplementary question for Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that response. Um, we certainly have welcomed the introduction of this incredibly important legislation and would like to see it implemented as quickly as possible. And an important aspect of that is uh, the messaging that goes with it. But could the Minister confirm uh, that no budgetary pressures will hinder uh, the rolling out of the very important campaign to make sure that there's full awareness within the community of all aspects of this legislation? Well, I expect the cost of an effective three-year multimedia advertising campaign of this type to be around half a million pounds. It is likely this cost will be skewed towards year one in order to allow the development of materials for television and radio. A campaign over three years will provide exposure to a wider audience and ensure longevity of the key messages being delivered. I'm confident that we will be able to take this forward um, and that the Department is committed to do so ahead of the operationalisation of the domestic abuse offence. To the minister for her quest, uh, responses thus far. Um, minister, can you give us an update on the tendering for an advocacy, an advocacy support service for victims of domestic and sexual violence and abuse? The tendering for the support service, as members will be aware, is something um, that I've previously answered questions. Um, on in the chamber. We are at the moment um, working on the basis um, that it is out to tender because we were unable, unfortunately, um, to get the kind of collaborative approach that we had hoped we would have and so have gone to an open tender. At this stage, it wouldn't be appropriate, I don't think, for me to say further um, in terms of, of where we are with that scheme, um, but I would be happy to write to the member um, just to update him at the appropriate time um, as to where the scheme lies. It is, as you know, our intention that we would have a single advocacy service um, and that would be able to provide um, support to victims and witnesses um, in, in, a in a way that is useful, both for domestic abuse and sexual crime. Um, and so that's something that we are progressing with on that basis. Call Rosemary Barton. Thank you. Minister, thank you for your answers so far. Minister, um, in relation to these advocacy support services for domestic violence, uh, can, you get, can you give me an expected timeline when they will be launched? No, I can't, but I will be happy to do so um, in writing to the member. Call Richard Woods for questions. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for answers so far. We do have much to do in terms of awareness, um, no less to on education, domestic abuse, course of control, and what a healthy relationship is. But I would like to ask the Minister about budget. What additional budget and resources has her department allocated to fully implement the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Act once it receives royal assent this year? The member will be aware, as a member um, of the uh, Justice Committee, um, that the draft budgets have been circulated to committees for consideration. As she will also be aware, there is no additional funding um, for any department in this current year. We are in a flat cash situation, and that same is true for the Department of Justice as is true for other departments. Um, if she scrutinises the information which has been sent to the Department of Justice, she will see the allocations um, set out therein. However, it is our intention um, to continue to work through those issues with the Department of Finance um, and to make such representations as we can so that any money that is carried over from this year um, into future years uh, will be able to be utilised against this and a number of other priorities. Question number three, Minister. Um, with your permission, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I intend to group questions three and four. One of my key priorities is ensuring that we do all we can to protect individuals, communities, and businesses in Northern Ireland from organised crime in all its forms. Effective collaboration between governments and law enforcement agencies is key to successfully disrupting and preventing organised criminality. I remain committed in partnership with my colleague Helen McEntee, TD, Minister of Justice to enabling and supporting law enforcement agencies north and south of the border to continue work collectively and proactively to combat organised crime. Cooperation between the Police Service of Northern Ireland and Angarda Shikana and other law enforcement partners is already well established and working effectively. 
Now that we have left the EU, a key priority is to ensure continued access to available resources and measures for effective cross-border and international collaboration to pursue organised criminals, including operational collaboration through the Joint Agency Task Force, Joint Investigation Teams where appropriate, and Europol. We have a good record of working in partnership with our colleagues in the South, including through the Operational Joint Agency Task Force. This was established following the Fresh Start Agreement as part of a concerted and enhanced effort to tackle organised crime and cross-jurisdictional crime. It comprises a strategic oversight group chaired by the PSNI Deputy Chief Constable and Angarda Shikana Deputy Commissioner to determine on an ongoing basis the priority areas in cross-border organised crime. In accordance with the provisions of the inter Intergovernmental Agreement, reports on the, uh, the Joint um, Task Force are presented on a six-monthly basis to the meeting of the respective Justice Ministers under the IGA Framework on Cooperation on Criminal Justice Matters. Following the IGA, meet, the IGA meeting in November 2020, I made an oral statement to the Assembly which included a substantive update on the work of the JATF. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Thank you for that very comprehensive answer uh, to the question and welcome uh, the cooperation both North and South. Uh, Minister, um, can you confirm or do you foresee any challenges to cross-border cooperation, uh, specifically in the context of the post-Brexit environment? The outcome for justice um, in the trade and cooperation agreement that was agreed by the UK and the EU on the 24th of December 2020 replicates most of the key EU justice measures that the UK had access to as an EU member state. The one key area not included in the TCA is continued access to the Schengen Information System, or SIS2, as it's more commonly known. The TCA does, however, allow the UK to negotiate um, a similar arrangement with member states on a bilateral basis through the protocol. We will look to the UK to agree bilateral arrangements, including with Ireland, once the new arrangements have bedded in and a proper gap analysis has taken place. I think it's important to recognise that there is also the wider issue um, with data adequacy, and of course the decision on that is due to be taken within the first six months um, from the agreement being signed. Without that, there will of course be implications um, for the live sharing of data and information between police services. However, at this point, because of the derogation for the first six months, um, that is not yet operational, and there are some um, planned ways of working through that, should it fall without um, a proper data adequacy agreement being in place. However, my understanding is that the likelihood is high of such a data adequacy agreement being agreed. Mark Durkin. Yes, I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Has the Minister engaged with her counterpart in the South to ascertain the veracity of allegations and revelations made in the BBC Panorama programme Boxing and the Mob? Uh, and assess alongside the PSNI and, and Garda the, the reach of organised crime here. I know it's an issue her party colleague Stephen Farry has raised in Westminster. It is not an issue that I have had the opportunity to raise uh, with Minister McEntee to date because we haven't met um, since the programme aired, nor would it be appropriate, I think, for me to speculate on things that are in the media as opposed to assessments that are provided um, to me by the PSNI. We do have, um, I think, a good relationship of working closely together where there are issues, um, and certainly in terms of the priority areas, um, we have advanced issues on financial crime, excise fraud, human trafficking and drug crime, amongst others. And so much of what the member refers to would be picked up by the work of the JATF and indeed the Organised Crime Task Force more broadly. Here Mayor Linda Dillon for New Cash to call Linda Dillon. Thank the Minister for her question so far. Minister, given the executive commitment to tackling criminal gangs, including those masquerading as loyalist paramilitaries, would you agree with me that the First Minister's meeting with the LCC, who purport to represent loyalist communities, communities which I would have to say it looks more like they are intimidating, that that was inappropriate and does not give the kind of leadership that we would expect from a leader of unionism or a leader of this House? Well, far be it from me to opine on how other parties conduct their business, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, 
it, it, it's not a matter for me as Justice Minister in that regard. However, <laughs> it is a matter for me as Justice Minister when all ministers in the executive have signed up to the paramilitary um, programme, uh, when, they have, when they have signed up to tackling the paramilitarism programme. Because that programme requires us all to ensure that where we wish to engage with at-risk communities, where we wish to hear the voices of those who may be vulnerable to paramilitary <coughs> influence, that we do so through the appropriate legal mechanisms, that we don't give any credence or validity to members of paramilitary organisations, irrespective of the community from which they emerge. And I do believe that by giving a platform to people who are still in prescribed organisations or who claim to be, because, Mr Speaker, it isn't for me to know the individuals and their membership, um, but they claim to be representatives of prescribed organisations, I think that is a matter of concern and sends out a worrying message to those in many parts of our community who still live under the coercive control of those same paramilitary organisations. And so I would appeal to all members of this House, including those who seem to find the question amusing, to actually do work with the Department of Justice and right across the community to ensure that no paramilitary organisations have any influence whatsoever um, in the business either of this House or in the business of running our communities outside. Thank you, Minister. And just before we move on to the next question, I would ask members to refrain from making commentary or laughing from seated positions. It's not appropriate during the course of, of these uh, plenaries. Um, I, now I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. With the Chief Constable warning that uh, his police numbers could drop 800 below the 7,500 committed to a new decade, new approach, does the Minister have concerns that this will impact negatively on cross-border cooperation in tackling organised crime? I think it's very clear um, that if there is a drop in police numbers, it will have an impact on policing. There is no alternative. In fact, most of the statutory duties which are performed by my department are heavily reliant on us having the personnel available um, to be able to provide those statutory duties. And as I have made the case at the executive um, and indeed to the committee, there is very little wiggle room um, for the Department of Justice when it comes to our budget, other than um, to see personnel reduced. I don't believe um, that it will impact in the sense that I don't believe that it will be a lower priority for the PSNI. But undoubtedly, um, there will be challenges if we find a reduction um, in the number of officers that are available to the Chief Constable. Members will be aware, of course, that it is a matter for the Chief Constable himself to decide what his priorities are when he receives his funding from the Department of Justice. And so if he is so minded, he can put that into officers or he can put it into other issues that need to be addressed. I'm aware from my conversations with him that he too faces a very challenging environment um, over the next number um, of years. And so we will work with him in order to try to secure the additional finances that would be required in order that such um, reductions in numbers will not be necessitated. But the one thing over which I have no control, Mr Speaker, is the budget that is finally allocated. Um, and when we get that budget allocated, we have no alternative but to live within our means. I call Jim Allister. So I want to ask the uh, Minister about the role of the National Crime Agency in respect of the cross-border task force. Um, can, can you expand a little on how extensive that is? And since that uh, agency does not have a standalone budget, obviously all expenditure eats into the budgets of each constituent part. How far is that an inhibitor? of involvement in the uh, cross-border uh, uh, cooperation agency? With respect to the National Crime Agency, the work and the intelligence that the National Crime Agency can provide in terms of tackling um, cross-border crime, um, not just, I have to say, at the Irish border, but indeed um, cross-border crime um, more widely, is hugely important. It is also important because many of the mechanisms and many of the streams um, of um, organised crime that exist, exist across those borders um, and throughout the rest of the UK, and their supply chains are also um, spread throughout these islands. So I think it's hugely important that um, the, the, the National um, Crime Task Force, or the National Crime Agency, is working closely with the PSNI, um, with the JATF, 
um, and uh, with the paramilitary and organised crime task force in order to ensure that there is a joined up approach on all of those issues. With respect to budget, it is a national agency and therefore um, to some degree their budget is, is outside of my control and jurisdiction. But of course where the PSNI ask for them to undertake particular duties, um, that is a different matter. As the member isn't in her place for question number five, we now move to question number six. Cash Devery Shea, I him, Sir John O'Dowd. When you cast, I call John O'Dowd. Sir, I could ask and call you cast you ever Shea. Question six. I have recently agreed a number of recommendations flowing from the sentencing review. Working work on completing recommendations on the remaining areas of the consultation is at a very advanced stage. An oral briefing to report on the final recommendations is scheduled for the Justice Committee on 15 April 2021. In respect of sentencing for offences causing death by dangerous driving and in advance of making any public announcements, I recently met with the Dolan and McCarraher families who have maintained ongoing interest in the review. This meeting has been widely reported in the press. I provided a written update to the Justice Committee on 17 February regarding the decisions I have reached with respect to sentencing for the case of death by dangerous driving. I anticipate a number of legislative changes will flow from the review, which I consider are best dealt with in a single sentencing bill. I intend to continue the preparatory work for that bill to be introduced early in the next mandate. Case Dorlin Tachig, John O'Dowd, supplementary question for John O'Dowd. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your answers thus far. Minister, I understand as part of the review there are plans or proposals to increase the maximum tariff of 14 years. For, drinking under, or for driving under the influence of drink or drugs. Given that the 14-year sentence was rarely ever used, how can the Minister assure victims of such crimes that justice will be served? Well, the, the actual proposal which has been agreed um, is that we intend to increase the maximum sentence for causing death by dangerous driving um, from 14 years to 20 years. Um, with respect to how that will impact on sentencing, as the member will be aware, every sentence will be set in the courts, um, starting with that maximum framework, um, and then we'll look at the severity of the offence in question and any mitigating factors and indeed any aggravating factors which need to be taken into account in sentencing. So whilst the member is correct to say um, that the current 14-year um, sentence is very rarely used, the fact that all sentences that are given out are based on the 14-year maximum means that if that is increased to 20 years, the proportional um, length of sentencing, even if it is not up to the maximum, will extend um, beyond what it is currently uh, once those changes have been made. It's also, I think, important to note that that is not the only change that is being proposed. Um, we are also talking about increasing. Um, we're, we're also agreed that we're going to have a discretionary life sentence as the maximum sentence available where an offender has a previous conviction for the same offence, that there would be parity in the maximum sentence, um, as is currently the case, whether it is death or serious injury that is called, caused, that we would increase the sentence for death, uh, causing death while driving disqualified to a four-year maximum, that the minimum period of mandatory disqualification for those offences should be four years unless the judge considers there are exceptional circumstances. A repeat offender within a 10-year period for a second or further conviction would be subject to a mandatory minimum disqualification of six years, and that a disqualification should not be capable of being reduced below two-thirds of the disqualification period ordered by the sentencing court or the mandatory minimum period for the offence, whichever is greater. A repeat offender for any of the offences will be disallowed from applying for a reduction of the disqualification imposed before the minimum period and uh, for the, the disqualification has been served, and disqualifications will in future take effect from the date of an offender's release from prison rather than run concurrent with their sentences. I believe that with all of those measures in place, the sentencing structure and framework will be much more robust than was the case in the past. Time for a brief question from Doug Beatty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, just with the, the, um, the issue of the, ter uh, the counter terrorism uh, and sentencing bill, does that affect the review at all? Um, no, it doesn't, um, because the issues dealt with in the counter 
the counter-terrorism and sentencing bill are being dealt with um, specifically as Westminster issues. No LCAM was able to be agreed um, as part of the work of this Assembly, and therefore our sentencing structures will continue um, and our sentencing review will continue unaffected by that because we were not consulting on those matters which are not devolved. That concludes our list of questions. We now move to the period of 15 minutes of topical questions. I guess Iram Sir Trevor Lund for any question. I call Trevor Lund for a question. Uh, Gor Maggot, last come call you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for an update on her department's administration of the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme? Yes, um, and I thank the member um, both for his question and also for his long-standing commitment um, to this issue and indeed the wider issue. Um, of support for victims in our community. Work has been ongoing within the Department to put in place the necessary administration arrangements to enable the Troubles Permanent Disablement Scheme to open for applications this month as planned. That includes the development of an application form and an IT system for online applications. 26 members have been appointed to the Victims Payment Boards <coughs> and sworn in, and Mr Justice McAlinden has been appointed now formally as the President of the Board with effect from today. Capita has also been appointed to design a medical assessment service that will assess the relevant level of disablement for applicants where necessary. The scheme could therefore open this month as planned in order to allow preparatory work on application forms by those who wish to apply. However, the President and the Victims Payment Board are ultimately responsible for deciding on the precise timescale for the launch of the scheme. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for her answer. Um, she has almost preempted my uh, supplementary, by I really want to ask her about the, the time scale for the actual application process to begin. So, when can, can, can potential applicants actually submit an application form? Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the President has advised that in advance in advance of making an application. He would prefer that applicants have access to full guidance on how the medical assessments will be carried out. He has consulted with the main groups representing victims of the Troubles, including the Wave Trauma Centre, Relatives for Justice, South East Fermanagh Foundation, the Eli Centre, the Commission for Victims and Survivors and the Victims and Survivors Service. On the basis of that engagement, Mr Justice McAlinden has concluded that the scheme should not open for applications until the guidance for carrying out the medical assessments has been fully designed and agreed by the Victims Payment Board. I understand that it will take a number of weeks for guidance to be completed on the process for carrying out those assessments. My officials will be continuing to engage with the representatives of the main groups to provide support to victims and survivors, and they will be kept updated on progress with development of the medical assessment guidance. They will also have an important input to the development of that guidance. Mr Justice McAlinden has also indicated that he will keep representatives of the main groups informed of progress on developments, and I am sure that will include an indication of when the scheme will open for applications. While it will be important to take due diligence in developing the medical assessment guidance, I trust that the scheme will open for applications at the earliest possible opportunity. Victims have waited a long time for this scheme, and I am keen to ensure they have access to it as soon as possible. I fully appreciate that some victims and survivors may be concerned that the scheme will not open for applications as they had hoped, but it is important that we take into account the views of the groups who represent and deal directly with victims and survivors and who have indicated their preference not to have a two-stage process, but to delay opening so that a single-stage process can be facilitated. I call Paula Bradley. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Minister, I attended a conference last week and one of the sessions was uh, violence against women and girls. There was a female judge and a female barrister president and they both agreed that the tariffs for domestic abuse needed to be used to their maximum in order to give a clear message that a domestic abuse is not tolerated in our society. Can I ask the Minister what her views on that would be? Well, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, my views on that is that there is nobody better than a judge to make such a, make such a case, because ultimately the tariffs that are given for any case in court are down to the judiciary and not the Minister of Justice. The maximum tariffs are placed in the legislation, but it is up to the judges to decide whether or not they use them. And so I hope um, that the member of the judiciary who has spoken um, passionately in that regard will also convey that to her fellow judges. Paula Bradley for supplementary. 
Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. She is absolutely right, but we do need our judges to take this, this matter of domestic abuse seriously. And can I just then ask the Minister, do you believe that domestic abuse in proceedings bill, um, which has a maximum tariff, I think, of 14 years, though I stand corrected, um, will go some way um, to assisting with this? I think, as I said in, our, uh, in answer to an earlier question, the use of maximum tariffs is the issue um, for the judiciary to decide whether they use them. But I think by setting the tariffs high um, on, on these particular cases, it should send out a clear message to the judiciary from this chamber um, as to the seriousness with which we treat domestic abuse. I know that there will be training provided um, for the judiciary um, through the normal mechanisms um, in terms of dealing with the new offence, and hopefully that is something that will also be explored during that opportunity that they will have to reflect on the new offence and indeed the tariffs attached. I call Alex Easton. Speaker. Um, Minister, last August you started a process of engagement with relevant key stakeholders and families after the debate on Charlotte's Law. I was hoping that you could maybe give me an update on that. Well, I thank the member for his question. Um, I have met with the families as of my officials on an ongoing basis. Um, for a number of months now, and we have looked at a number of proposals uh, which, would, which the families are supportive of, but also we are looking at a number of other proposals which are not part of that particular framework um, to which the member refers in terms of Helen's Law, um, but which we believe may be leverage points within the justice system that may be able to be used to further encourage people um, to disclose where remains of individuals um, are held. I think it is hugely important, um, and having met with the families, I am um, absolutely convinced. It is not just a, a huge injustice on families that they have been robbed um, of a loved one, but to be further deprived of the opportunity to be able to go to their graveside, um, to be able to mark their passing in some tangible way, I think is not just an injustice, but is an insult and is a form of torture against the individuals. Um, who are grieving. And I think it is very hard for people to come to terms with their grief in those circumstances. So we are working actively with the family um, and with my colleagues um, in the department in order to find a way forward that will deliver um, in reality what I think sometimes is promised um, but not delivered by some of the other mechanisms that are around. And it is something that we're looking at very carefully. I would hope to be in a position um, to move forward on this in the near future. Mr. Easton, for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, can I thank the Minister for her answer? And it's, it's quite positive. And um, I note that she had a Twitter feed on the other day about uh, the 16th anniversary of the murder of Lisa Dorian. And I believe she is very uh, genuine on that, as, as am I. Um, can I take from her answer that she is committed to definitely doing something 100% about this? Well, as the member will appreciate, I'm not going to announce um, decisions here in, in the context of questions, um, but I am absolutely genuine um, when I've spoken to both families who have met with us, have worked with us about what it is that they want to achieve and what it is that we will be able to deliver for them. I believe that it is important that we are honest about the limitations of what we can do, um, but at the same time that we try to be ambitious in terms of what we do. So I will obviously announce in due course our intentions in this regard, but I do think that there is an opportunity potentially um, to do something here. I think it has to be recognised that some of those who are involved in these crimes who have disappeared these individuals' bodies and deprived their families of an opportunity um, in order to be able to grieve. I think that some of those individuals will not be swayed by anything that we do in terms of legislation um, or in terms of practice. And I think we need to acknowledge that at the outset. Um, because there are some who are still in denial that those crimes that they even committed those crimes despite the fact that they are serving sentences for them. Um, it is also the case that in some cases no one has ever been brought to justice and in the case for example of Lisa Dorian to which the member refers um, his own constituent no one has even been brought to justice and so the changes which we make to the justice system will unfortunately not benefit that family until such times as someone can be brought to justice. So the most important thing I can say, given the platform I have today, to those who are involved um, and who know where Lisa Dorian's body is and who knows what happened in her final hours, is to reflect on your conscience 
and tell the family the truth, report it to the police, um, and allow this family to grieve the loss of Lisa without further obstruction and without the further torment of not knowing where her remains lie. Um, because what you have done um, is completely wrong. It is completely unacceptable. Um, but you can help now by telling the truth and allowing the family to grieve. Call Chris Little for questions. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Justice Minister what work her department is undertaking to improve civil justice? I thank the member for his question. Modernisation of an area as wide in scope as the civil justice system is a significant undertaking and members will appreciate it will take considerable time. Reform is also not for my department alone. While the Department of Justice is responsible for the operation of the justice system, responsibility for substantive civil and family policy rests with the Ministers of Health and Finance. The Department has, however, made good progress in a number of areas, including provision in the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill to protect victims of abuse from being directly cross-examined by the perpetrator uh, and uh, with the pr uh, protection of special measures. Launch of a pilot to test a streamlined approach to appointing experts in public law proceedings, development of an action plan to encourage the early resolution of family law disputes and launch of a consultation on county court jurisdiction. We are, of course, limited by what we will be able to achieve in what is an, a, a ridiculously short mandate, um, and I plan to focus on areas where the most immediate benefits for citizens can be realised. Work on a possible work programme for the rest of the mandate is ongoing, but I'm hoping to be able to provide further detail to the Assembly in the weeks ahead. The Gillen Review made a, a significant number of wide-ranging recommendations. Many do fall outside the remit of the Department or would have significant financial, operational and cross-cutting implications, so time will be required to consider the proposals in detail. However, I am determined in what is left of this mandate to make further progress. Mr Little for a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answer. And can I ask if she will be working to embed efficient and affordable dispute resolution in civil justice, including in the small claims courts? Well, yes, and the member, of course, is correct that the small claims court um, plays a significant role um, in quick resolution um, in the courts. The Department has recently launched public consultation on increasing the general civil jurisdiction of the county courts, including small claims. The key aim of that consultation is to deliver an effective justice system where citizens have appropriate access to justice with cases resolved quickly and proportionately relative to their value and their complexity. The Department is seeking the public's view on a number of proposals, including increasing the jurisdiction of the county courts from 30,000 to either 60 or 100,000, increasing the jurisdiction of district judges to either 20 or 35,000, and increasing the jurisdiction of the Small Claims Court from 3,000 to 5,000 pounds. The Small Claims Court currently provides speedy resolution for citizens, which is key. It is a particular success of the justice system, offering the sort of affordable and efficient dispute resolution that citizens require, and so I want to build on that. The Department is consulting on increasing a limit last uplifted over a decade ago, so it is important that the financial jurisdiction remains current, but also that we retain the advantages of the small claim system, because, as you will be aware, many people who use the small claims court do so as litigants in person, and therefore it is important that we do not raise the threshold for cases in the small claims court such that those um, who are defendants in the court may decide um, to equip themselves, or may be more likely to equip themselves, um, with significant legal teams, because, as you will be aware, an inequality of arms um, in that regard could present real challenges um, for, for litigants in person. Mr Dixon, I'll be able to fit in a very quick question and answer. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Speaker, Minister, could you perhaps outline to the House the need for urgency in respect of the damages return on investment bill, please? Thank the member for his question. Um, the urgent passage of the bill, which was introduced um, earlier this afternoon, is required to allow a new stable personal injury discount rate to be set that will end the ongoing delays in personal injury claims and allow those claimants who have suffered serious life-changing injuries to receive the full compensation to which they are entitled as soon as possible. The current discount rate was set in 2001. 
The financial investment markets have changed significantly since then, and the rate that we have currently set assumes more of a return than a personal injury claimant would likely make on their lump sum compensation. The risk to claimants is that if they settle now, they'll be undercompensated. However, if a new rate are set under the current law, the rate would reduce so much that it would likely to overcompensate victims, with the result that most defendants would not settle. So, while many personal injury cases can be settled by parties without court hearing, um, the current delays in the settlement of cases as are a result of uncertainty on the discount race, uh, rate. To resolve the uncertainty, I want to legislate for a new framework for calculating that rate that achieves 100 per cent compensation, which is my legal duty. I would hope that we can work with the committee, um, having proposed a, a, committee, uh, a short committee stage um, to allow the, complete, the completion of scrutiny of this bill as expeditiously as possible, ideally so the bill can complete its passage through this House before the summer. Members, that concludes topical questions. If you just take your ease while we change the top table here. Thank you. Okay, members are ready to resume the sitting. Mr. Daglan Magalier has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister for of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, they should raise continually in their places. The member who tabled the question will be called automatically to ask a supplementary. Clerk, please read the question. To ask the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to set out the legal basis for his unilateral decision to halt the construction of port inspection facilities required by the withdrawal agreement. And I call the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. On, on Friday, uh, I instructed officials to halt work relating to the programme for permanent builds at the ports, as well as work on OCR charging. This was done on the basis of DERA having been appointed by the executive to lead on these matters. There are a, no, there are a number of reasonable arguments for taking this uh, approach. Uh, firstly, there is a, a lack of clarity on a range of legal issues which need resolved in respect of the implementation um, of the protocol and indeed the functioning of the internal UK single market. I am also concerned that uh, we do not have the required uh, certainty to forward plan, uh, given a number of factors outside of the control of my uh, department. These include the role of the ongoing uh, discussions, including those at Joint Committee, and the lack of certainty that this presents, the uncertainty around grace periods, and the undeliverable and unworkable requirements for retail uh, consignments if a solution is not uh, achieved. I have also taken uh, the decision uh, in regards to OCR charges, uh, in particular because of my concerns in relation to Section 46 of the Internal uh, Market Act and the requirements that that places uh, upon me. 
I call Declan Magalier for a supplementary. Um, thank you, Minister, for his answer. But does the Minister accept that the vast majority of people will see this as another DUP stunt? Only a very dangerous stunt that will serve the purpose of inflaming tension within loyalism, and unfortunately, from the past, we know where that can lead us to. Well, my concern, um, Mr. Speaker, is for the people of Northern Ireland, and uh, my concern is, is about public money uh, being spent, and my concern is making sure that we have what we need uh, in place um, so that we can serve um, the constituents here uh, that we all uh, represent. Uh, I think because of all of the uncertainty that we have uh, in regards of the legal position and because of the, of the practical barriers uh, that we also have at this time, that it was entirely proportionate uh, and reasonable uh, to take uh, this approach. And I would hope that people would put their views uh, on, on, on Brexit uh, to a side uh, for, for the moment and see what is actually best uh, for the people that we represent. Nicole William Irwin. Mr. Speaker, uh, can I ask the Minister, given the lack of certainty because of ongoing discussions of the Joint Committee and the lack of ratified EU UK trade deal by the EU Parliament and the uncertainty as to the future of the current grace period, how can your department plan with any certainty for infrastructure and recruitment of staff? Well, I think that that is the difficulty that we are presented with now, and, and as I have said, is, is one of the reasons why uh, I, I had. Uh, um, uh, instructed uh, my officials uh, to, to, to put a halt uh, to that work. Um, there are uh, an awful lot of things that are outstanding here at this moment in time, uh, and my question to others uh, would be is how would you propose uh, that we uh, continue uh, when we do not have that certainty? Um, I, I hope there is a recognition uh, that we need changes. Um, uh, I hope there is a recognition of the damage that the protocol is doing. I think that is very, very clear to, to most of us, and certainly uh, in my role, I see the impacts that, that it has had. Uh, so how on earth are we to, to plan uh, for the future when there are so many uncertainties uh, at this moment in time? And that's why I think uh, it was a very reasonable to, step to take uh, on Friday. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Minister, if this was a reasonable step to take, can I ask why you did it late on a Friday afternoon? Can I ask why no official statement has been issued by your department? Can I further ask specifically whether a ministerial direction was sought or issued and whether this order is live in that is your permanent secretary seeking uh, further legal advice on whether he should proceed with your instruction or not? Uh, well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I can um, confirm that I had given an instruction uh, to officials, and I, I have had this raised now a number of times. The timing of this announcement, as if it is somehow uh, inappropriate to do things at certain times uh, of the day or certain days uh, of the week, uh, that is not the case. It is something that I have been looking at. It is um, following the concerns that have been raised uh, with me. And uh, I don't think it's uh, uh, unreasonable in any way uh, for me to want to, to make sure that appropriate action is taken, um, considering the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Nicole Mike Nesbitt. Um, the Minister will be aware that Europe thinks we have got in Northern Ireland the best of both worlds. Uh, would the Minister agree with me? It would be an act of great friendship and neighbourliness uh, to lobby to extend that to our neighbours in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, we could then return to the trading arrangements in the UK and between the UK and Ireland that applied last year and a decade ago. And then the checks would not be at our ports and airports uh, over goods that may or may not end up in the EU, but at Dublin's, or sorry, the Republic's ports and airports over goods that are definitely heading to continental Europe. Uh, and therefore, uh, the EU would take back control of their inspections. Um, we would solve all unionist objections, and the Republic would benefit. So it would be a win, win, win. Well, I think that the member highlights um, a very important uh, point, uh, which is that the checks that are currently taking place uh, are taking place in, in such a way uh, that causes friction between one part of the United Kingdom to another part of the United Kingdom. And this is one of my great frustrations with what is taking place uh, right now, is that there could be goods that are coming from Great Britain into Northern Ireland that are at no risk whatsoever 
of entering the EU uh, single market, uh, and yet there is still that fettering of trade uh, that is taking place. Uh, the member uh, mentions um, uh, some solutions, uh, as, as he would say them, and I think that we need to have a greater discussion uh, around potential uh, solutions and potential alternatives, because that's been shouted down at every opportunity uh, by others. Uh, people have um, stuck to the protocol, thinking that it is um, the solution uh, to the problems that we face. It is not. It is adding to the problems uh, that we face. And I think that it would be um, good if everyone right around this chamber could acknowledge that, that problems exist and actually recognise that the protocol in Article 14 uh, allows for us to find alternatives. Um, the protocol does not have to be set in stone forever. Uh, it does not always have to be there. So let's recognise the problems that are there, not pretend that they don't exist, and actually find uh, alternative solutions to the issues that we're facing. I call John Blair. Again, Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Minister what discussions or consultations took place between himself and uh, the business or sector representative groups relating directly to, to the decision he took uh, in relation to the, the ceasing of the construction of necessary infrastructure at ports and whether he believes he has any support whatsoever from those sectors uh, in the decision he took? Well, I can certainly um, express to uh, the member that I have had a number uh, of representations from, from businesses, both as, as, a, as a constituency member and, and as also uh, with, with other businesses that are um, uh, operating in Northern Ireland that have come to, to see me or, or, or have corresponded with me because of the um, number of problems that they are facing as a result uh, of the protocol. And in fact, um, members from this side uh, of the House have got in contact with me as well and have uh, expressed to me the problems that they are facing and that companies in their constituencies are facing as well. And I think it's, it's, it's disappointing uh, that other members across this House refuse to even recognise uh, that problems exist and that we need an alternative uh, to what is going on uh, right now. I have had so many representations, so many people uh, are concerned about what we are facing uh, right now and are very fearful about what comes after uh, the 1st of April. And that's why I think we all need to work together uh, to, to find solutions. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Speaker. Um, and Speaker, I just want to go back to a quote given by the First Minister just a few weeks ago on the Andrew Marr show when she described Brexit with the protocol in place as a gateway of opportunity for Northern Ireland and the whole of the United Kingdom and asked the Minister what's changed because it's not Brexit nor the protocol in those few short weeks that has led him to take such, uh, such action and whether he believes that the actions and decisions he took on Friday were cross-cutting across the executive departments. Thank you. So unfortunately, uh, Mr Speaker, we're in the position here where we're not able uh, to enjoy um, the benefits of Brexit to the extent, same extent that other people in the rest of the UK are, uh, because we are now uh, facing um, the problem and the growing problem of being cut off from our biggest market, where we do so much of our trade from. And I know people don't like hearing that, uh, but it is the case that we do more trade with GB than, where, uh, with, with any, than with anywhere else. Uh, and so that's a reality uh, that we need to face up to. And it is not simply the case that the protocol needs to be tweaked uh, or, or changed um, in, in some meaningless way. Uh, we need fundamental uh, change and, and, in my opinion, need the protocol uh, uh, to go. Um, I was, uh, my department was given responsibility uh, for this area. Uh, because of the uncertainty that we face coming towards the end of the grace periods, uh, I think this is a, a proportionate and responsible uh, step to take um, because we need that further clarity and that's not what we have right now. I call Jim Allister. I welcome the Minister's move. I trust it was based on a principle of opposition to the protocol and therefore will be carried through with other actions to unstitch the protocol. But could I ask the Minister, has he heard any suggestion from those who demand rigorous implementation how within the protocol he could meet his statutory obligations under Section 46 of the UK Internal Market to facilitate the free flow of goods between Great Britain and Northern Ireland and to strengthen the smooth operation of the internal market. How could that be done within the protocol? And could he explain to the House what it means to have stalled the charges 
and what benefit that will bring to business. So, Mr. Speaker, no, I haven't heard anything uh, from any other side of the House uh, in regards to how I can um, uh, make sure that I'm uh, fulfilling my duties in Section 46 of the Internal Market Act. As the member will know, that places on me a, a duty to have a special regard for three things. First of all, Northern Ireland's place within the internal market of the United Kingdom. Uh, secondly, Northern Ireland's place within the customs union of the United Kingdom. And thirdly, as he pointed out, to facilitate that free flow of goods between Great Britain uh, and Northern Ireland. That is a legal duty uh, that is upon me. Uh, I have to have special regard. And in the House of Commons, when Minister Walker uh, was, um, uh, as the government minister introducing this, said um, that it is fundamental. Uh, that's what special regard means. It's absolutely fundamental. Uh, so it is right uh, that I do all that I can uh, to make sure uh, that I have that, that, that special uh, regard and take on board the concerns that, that are being expressed, which is one of the reasons why um, it is uh, appropriate to have halted the work on OCR charging, because I can think of, of nothing more um, that would fetter the free flow of trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland than charging people uh, to uh, bring, bring their products and goods into Northern Ireland. Call Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the, the Minister has mentioned charging there. Would the, would the Minister outline his views on what impact SPS charging would have on business and consumers here in Northern Ireland if left as is? Yes, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think it would have a significant impact here uh, on businesses uh, in Northern Ireland because every time things are, and goods are brought in uh, to Northern Ireland from Great, Brit Great Britain, and remember um, that it is our largest market and we do a huge volume of trade uh, between Great Britain and uh, Northern Ireland. Um, it, it, of course, will have a, a significant uh, impact, and every time something is brought over, every time those ports are used, it is additional cost for business, it's additional cost for consumers. And the other outworking of that, of course, is that we could end up in the position, and this was highlighted in one of our local papers last week, where I think it was 64% of retailers in GB are now reconsidering whether or not they want to continue to bring items from Great Britain uh, into Northern Ireland. That could then very heavily uh, impact on, uh, on trade uh, here and um, put a further burden uh, on costs and on consumer uh, choice. And, uh, in that regard, I need to make sure that I am fulfilling my duties under Section 46 of the uh, Internal Market Act, uh, and that will require uh, very close consideration uh, of these matters. Philip McGuigan, the call. Philip McGuigan. Uh, John Collier. Uh, Minister, leaving aside the issue of the legality of the decision, and uh, leaving aside the fact that this decision and the way it was made without discussion with your executive colleagues has added further unnecessary worry and uncertainty on retail business and trade here in the North who want to see the protocol work. Uh, you will be aware, Minister, that my uh, party colleague in Mid and East Antrim Council, Ian Ferrari, was visited yesterday by the PSNA, who told him of a threat to his life after uh, disgraceful sectarian graffiti appeared in the, uh, a hall village, linking him to the Irish Protocol. So, Minister, can I ask you uh, if you bear any responsibility in terms of your decision, previous decisions made by your predecessor, other decisions made in unionist-dominated councils, and public utterances and comments made by unionist politicians, you, that you, if you bear any responsibility in the heightened intention which has seen a rise in uh, threats to uh, elected representatives in recent days and weeks? Well, first of all, let me just say, uh, Mr. Speaker, that no matter um, uh, who you are, whether you're in public life or, or not, it is absolutely wrong for people to be targeted uh, in this way because of their views, uh, because of what they uh, may have said. Uh, I think that that is uh, completely wrong, and I have no problem in, in wholeheartedly uh, uh, condemning that as, as someone um, that has um, faced uh, in the last number of days and weeks um, concerning actions taking place at my office and um, uh, the, the type of um, correspondence that we can sometimes get into our, our inboxes, uh, I have no hesitation whatsoever uh, in condemning uh, any such uh, behaviour. But I fail to see how what I have done on Friday could have any way have contributed to that. 
What I'm saying is that we're facing a time of uncertainty. We don't know what is going to be expected of us. We don't know what's going to be required of us in terms of um, what needs to, to take place uh, at the ports. So I have decided um, uh, to, to, to get that to, to stop. And uh, I don't quite see how those two things uh, can be linked. But let's be under no doubt whatsoever. This is a time of, of heightened tensions, particularly uh, in, in the unionist uh, community. I recognise that and I see that, and that's why I think we should all want to try and work together to find uh, those solutions that actually work uh, for people in Northern Ireland and don't cut us off constitutionally and economically from the rest of the United Kingdom. Thank the Minister for his response. Um, can the Minister advise he will be aware of contractual uh, liabilities and commitments in regard to this project and indeed others? Um, can the Minister advise and clarify us, has the project now been cancelled or has it been delayed and has he taken any advice around the legal or financial liabilities associated with either cancellation or delay in the project because there is a contract and the Department is contractually bound to that contract? Well, at this stage, um, Mr. Speaker, what I have sought to do uh, is get further clarity. Um, we don't know what is going to be expected of us, or we don't know uh, what is going to be required. But what I am um, very sure that I want to do is to, is, is to make sure um, that we are keeping value for money and the public purse uh, at the top of the agenda, and making sure that we can do uh, everything we can to protect the public purse. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you. Um, Minister, you spoke about the uncertainty in forward planning. What uh, comfort can you give? Uh, we're coming into a busy time of the year for moving, moving of agricultural stock back and forth between GB and GB into Northern Ireland. Can you give us reassurance that, this, that there will be no hold-ups in relation to that? Uh, well, um, Mr. <coughs> Uh, speaker, I want to, to thank the, the member for, for her work on this, and she has uh, raised this with me uh, before. It is a concern because of the outworkings of the protocol, of the impacts that this will have on the movement of, of livestock, and uh, those consequences are, are, are far-reaching. That's why I think we need to find a better solution uh, than what we have here at the minute, and I'll certainly uh, do all that I can uh, to push the EU and the UK um, so that we find ourselves in a better position than we currently are. Stuart Dixon. <coughs> uh, Minister, business thrives on certainty. Uh, and you told this House a few moments ago that you'd had uh, discussions with various businesses and business organisations. Can you name for us, Minister, those business organisations in Northern Ireland that told you that the best course of action you could take would be to stop the building and to stop the recruitment of employees? Well, um, Mr. Speaker, I've had a number of conversations with various um, businesses, and of course, it would be inappropriate uh, for me to uh, to name at this stage without their permission um, who, who, who I have met with. Um, but I am um, I'm, I'm convinced that this was the, this was the right course of action uh, for me uh, to take, because the member is absolutely right at what he said at the start um, that businesses want certainty, and that's and that and that's something. Uh, that we don't have uh, at the minute. Look, Mr. O'Toole and Mr. Dixon might not like uh, the answers that I have given, uh, but this, but this, but this, these are the actions uh, that I have taken um, because I believe this is in the best interest uh, of Northern Ireland to get the certainty that we required. And here's part of the problem, Mr. Speaker, because we have protocol zealots who want the rigorous implementation of the protocol at all costs. It doesn't matter if there's an alternative that's better for Northern Ireland. It doesn't matter if we can find an easier uh, way of doing things that impact less on the people of Northern Ireland. Their concern is for the protocol and the protocol alone. Call Harry Harvey. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Would the Minister outline what role his department has in ensuring the free flow of goods between GB and NI? Uh, I thank the, uh, the, the member for his, his question, and I think I would refer back to the uh, previous answer that I gave to, to Mr. Alistair. There is, under the Internal Market 
uh, Act, Section 46, which is a requirement uh, on me to have that special regard um, f uh, for Northern Ireland's place within the internal market, uh, within the customs union, and of course to facilitate uh, that trade between Great Britain uh, and Northern Ireland. So that is a responsibility that is on me. However, it's not only a responsibility uh, that is on me, Mr. Speaker. It's also a responsibility on the other devolved administrations on ministers uh, in, in, in Scotland, on ministers in Wales, and indeed um, all UK government ministers. And I have been in correspondence um, with uh, George Eustace and my counterparts in uh, Wales and Scotland, asking them what action they are taking to ensure that they fulfil their obligations under Section 46 uh, of the uh, Internal Market Act. However, I think that there is also a responsibility, uh, not just on um, not just on on us within the UK, but the EU and the UK in the protocol have said um, that um, the measures that they take should impact upon the lives of people in Northern Ireland as little as possible, and that's why I think that it is so important that um, they take action, seeing the consequences, seeing the outworkings of the protocol that they take actions uh, to make sure that we can have that free and unfettered uh, uh, trade. And if there is a diversion of trade, um, that is a problem. And it shows uh, that the protocol uh, is not working because, of, of course, diversion of trade uh, is a reason under Article 16 uh, for, um, the, for, for unilateral action to be taken. Nicole Justin McNulty. Thank the Minister for his coming to the House today and for his answers thus far. Like others in this House and in the community we all represent, I express my frustration around the stunt taken by the Minister on Friday evening. I am not sure who you took your legal advice from. Was it Sammy, Arlene, Jacob or Gregory? It is a smokescreen. It is a farce. You did not halt any building, as building has not commenced. You have not halted the protocol. As there is recognition for both the UK and the EU, the protocol is going nowhere. Will the Minister acknowledge the harm and confusion he has caused? Will he agree with me that this is a Brexit protocol and is a direct consequence of Brexit? Will the Minister acknowledge that the only thing that he has stopped is the publication of his executive's plan for the opening up of the economy, for the returning of life to some sort of normality in the weeks and months ahead? No, Mr. Speaker, I wouldn't agree with any of the points uh, that the member has made. And I, I think um, in this country, all too often, uh, we can get ourselves head up and um, get wound up uh, very quickly. No action that I have taken on Friday has in any way held up or contributed to a slowing down uh, of, the, uh, of the pathway to recovery uh, a document. Um, as I have said a number of times now, the steps that I have taken are a result of the uh, practical barriers and the legal uncertainties uh, that currently uh, exist. Uh, I think the steps that I have taken have been entirely uh, reasonable, and I would ask people uh, whether their opposition to what I have done uh, is, is, is based um, on, on common sense and, and practicality, or is it just based on opposite, opposition to anything um, that they do not like in relation to Brexit and the protocol. I call Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Northern Ireland Protocol has disrupted trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Does the Minister uh, agree with me that it is much better if we can remove the protocol or at the very least install SBS agreements, which would remove much of that friction? And is he curious why some who claim to want such changes are insistent on building uh, structures which may not be needed? Well, I thank the, the member for his question. I do agree. Uh, I think the protocol is completely unworkable. I think it is contradictory. And I do not think it sets out to do what those who drafted it intended for it uh, to do. Uh, and that is why I think that it, that it needs to go. And of course, the, the, the member hit the nail on the head. Um, we want to see that, that free flow, that ease of trade as much as we can between um, different parts of the United Kingdom. And certainly, I would be interested to explore um, possibilities around, around agreements that would uh, limit uh, the amount of friction uh, that, that may exist. And that is why I think it is entirely uh, sensible 
um, that as those issues are being discussed, as the Joint Committee has said that they're going to, to meet again to discuss some of these issues, uh, that it's only right um, that, we, that we wait and, and we see what comes out uh, of um, discussions rather than um, uh, do work which then might never, never be needed to require. And that concludes this item of business. Thank you all. Members, please take a raise for a moment or two. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm speaking today as chairperson of the Air Committee and I'll outline some work the committee has undertaken throughout 2021 on the DERA budget. I start by referring to the additional agri food COVID 19 funding that DERA bid for and was successful in obtaining. Uh, we know that DERA did secure an additional 41.7 million of COVID funding from the executive. Of that funding, $25 million was to provide market interventions in the agri-food sector, $15.2 million to assist councils with higher waste disposal and collection costs, $1.5 million was provided to the fisheries sector. Further $2 million was received from the Department of Health towards the cost of the Agri-Food uh, and Biosciences Institute uh, COVID testing. On the $25 million to support the agri-food sector, the scheme that used up the bulk of the money was of approximately $19 million was paid to 11,300 farm businesses in the dairy, beef and sheep sector and potato sectors. Work is ongoing to assess and process remaining claims from about 20 growers in the potato and autom ornamental horticulture sectors. There is also a scheme for the pig and poultry sector. The committee considered an SL1 for these, to enable these payments at the committee meeting on the 25th of February last week. It includes a financial support package worth $2.2 million for pig producers that were specifically affected by the temporary closure of Cranswick uh, Country Foods in Ballymena. Other COVID-19 uh, funding that have been allocated over the past year, including an initial 145,000 to environmental NGOs, this was allocated in September, 
COVID-19 support is also being provided to the sea fish uh, catching sector, and at the close of the scheme, 171 payments have been made to vessel owners, totaling 1.32 million. In autumn 2020, a further scheme was announced because uh, of continuing depressed markets and prices for landings. The first element involved the temporary cessation of uh, fishing activity uh, by club patrollers and dredgers. Uh, was supported through the European, European Maritime Fisheries Fund and had a total project cost of 1.3 million. Payments totalling 1.1 to 5 million have been made to 66 vessel owners. There was also a scheme tailored to the needs of the smaller vessels that fish uh, for crab and, bluster, and lobster. It offered fish co- uh, fixed cost support to vessel owners. The Air Committee has not yet received the second legis- legislation to enable this scheme to be paid. On the agriculture scheme, the uh, vast majority of money of around 120 5,000 has been paid. We also understand that there will be a scheme for the Loch Ness eel uh, f- fishermen and women. Uh, this is a scheme that has raised serious concerns in the committee, as the need for funding has identified in late summer 2020, but as, as yet nothing has been launched, as the Dear Minister is still considering the scheme's eligible, eligibility criteria. Some 3.8 million of the COVID-19 funding has been uh, allocated towards waste, most of this was to help local authorities cope with the closure of public amenity sites during lockdown and with the reluctance that resulted in increasing fly tipping. In addition, a further bid of £11.4 million for local authorities for July through to March was approved in September. To, to date, 70% of advanced payments, totalling £2.66 million uh, from the first tranche of funding, have been made to councils. I want to move on to the next area of major financial concern for the committee in the year 2021. That is the financial impact to DERA of preparing, preparing for and delivering EU exit. Um, last week, uh, we were informed that during January 2021, our points of entry processed 5,807 shared, uh, uh, com- which are common health entry documents uh, for product of animal origin. That is uh, uh, no, uh, uh, no mean task. It is amazing that so much has been delivered in such a short time. The Euro Committee has also considered the funding required for new inspection facilities to be built at Larne Harbour, Belfast Harbour and Warren Point Harbour. These contractors have been asked to deliver, design and build on both the required facilities and for the contingency arrangements. It is estimated that to operate 24-7 in both Larne and Belfast, there will need to be 25 vets, 75 portal inspectors and 12 admin staff to undertake the work that is required. In addition to that, the local authorities estimate that they will require some 30 additional environmental health officers, and about 18 plant officers and three fish officers. The committee has been informed that most of these local authority staff are in place. As for all, all of this has to be paid for. In 2021, it cost some £45 million, and that includes £5 million contingency cost, and that is coming from the British Treasury. There is yet another uh, issue with EU exit, and that is the future funding to replace the current EU funding. I will cover our concerns about the potential shortfalls in this funding in the budget uh, bill debate tomorrow. The final aspect I wish to draw attention to is the fact that DERA has made no bids in the January monitoring round. The committee was informed that DERA did engage extensively across the department to determine whether co- further COVID-19 funding could be used. We heard that DERA has concerns that it could be sure uh, that, that it could be sure that there is a de- demonstrable and evidence-based need, and that any additional funding could be allocated to recipients by the 31st of March. On this basis, the department has not yet ad- identified any potential bids. The committee was not and is not content with this position, particularly as it did not address the non-COVID bids. Um, that is all I want to say in the capacity as chairperson of the Air Committee. There are just a couple of uh, um, little bits I want to uh, focus back on in relation in, in my position as the Sinn Féin um, Agriculture and Rural Affairs spokesperson. Uh, I just want to touch back on a couple of uh, things which have been um, a, a source uh, of contention and concern for ourselves. Um, one of them being the, the, the Loch Ness the Loch Ness scheme. Like, it is it's incredible that it hasn't been delivered. It's been funded out of the European Marine uh, Fisheries Fund. Other schemes are funded out of the same pot. Have had their money delivered, but this hasn't happened. The Loch Ness um, fishermen and women, and that's that is grossly unfair and it's a source of ongoing contention. Um, the, uh, again, in relation to the ports contract, which has been uh, spoken about here at, at the, at the um, 
the urgent oral just, just there now. But it's fair to point out that the DERA appointed uh, that con the contractors there on the 7th of October with a design and build uh, scheme. So there, there is an issue, and Mr Malone perhaps you raised that just a, a while ago, in relation to the liabilities that now there's slippage in that and the implications for the contractors who are awarded that their um, scheme. And it should be pointed out that you know, despite the issues that have been raised uh, during uh, January and February, there was 5,800 uh, sheds that were uh, processed through the porch. Uh, and again, that's a £45 million contract, a huge, huge contract. Would the member draws uh, remarks to uh, close. Okay. So we'll just uh, conclude remarks. I'll pick up on some more issues tomorrow. Thank you, Graham Elgott. I call Paul Free. Mr Deputy Speaker, and again, uh, we are here at this uh, stage to uh, to debate the spring supplementary estimates, and what a funny year it has been uh, for all of us. A very challenging year uh, for all the departmental officials. And can I put on record my thanks to them all who have come to the committee, as the chairperson has already alluded to. Uh, they have informed us uh, every step of the way, uh, and they have given us a lot of detail uh, during the, the year. Uh, and they have been grappling themselves with the financial figures. Uh, they have also been grappling with us. Uh, so I pay tribute to them all. Uh, and here we are, Mr Deputy Speaker, looking at the spring supplementary estimates. So we have the opportunity to look back on the year we've had financially. And one thing I have always been looking for in this year is a joined-up executive, a cohesive, uh, joined-up, collective decision-making body that will help us fight this crisis. And I must say I have been shocked and disappointed in equal measure throughout the year. One reason being is that whenever I have asked the Finance Minister about a strategy to get us out of both the health aspect and the economic aspect of this, the Minister has always said, Mr Deputy Speaker, that it was all about bids. It was all about bids coming to him and that he would assess those bids and make a decision then. To me, that strikes, that it strikes me that it is not very strategic when a Finance Minister has to wait for bids from other departments. And there is a fundamental weakness in that, Mr Deputy Speaker. But then we look at those bids, and we look at the fact that the Department of Economy made 88 bids. 81 of those were COVID bids, which was the highest number of bids submitted. The Department of Education made 56 bids. 42 were COVID bids. 14 non-COVID bids, which is the highest number of non-COVID bids submitted by any of the departments, even the Department of Infrastructure, 40 bids, 34 of them COVID bids. The Department of Finance submitted one bid only. Health submitted 13 bids, uh, but less seems to be more in this case, as they totaled more than one billion, which is substantially higher in value than any other of the departments. Now, what does that tell us, Mr. Deputy Speaker? That tells us that there were departments there that had strategic thought and were willing, unable, and capable of bidding for finance. And of course, some of the, some of the departments were very successful indeed. The Department of Finance, with their one bid, received that money. Health received 95% of what they had asked for. TEO, 93%, and communities, 89% despite the fact they could not deliver a kickstart. Unsuccessful departments. Department of Economy, 36 per cent successful. Infrastructure, 33 per cent successful. DERA, 31 per cent. Department of Education, less than 50 per cent. And the Department of Justice, less than 50 per cent. Mr Deputy Speaker, there seems to be a trend here. There seems to be a trend. So when you have all these departments and I, I pick out economy and education, who were willing to bring forward bids. It seems to me that the Department of Finance and the Finance Minister refused those bids. Again, there may be reasons for that. He may, he may outline them today. But that does not strike me as a very strategic way of doing government in this executive. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have heard today from some of the chairpersons about criticisms of those very departments that I have named. One of them was the Economy Committee, the Economy Committee with the most bids, remember. And what we can see with that is that they have not, whilst they can criticise other departments, and it's the right to do so, they do not look at themselves as a party when they look at this uh, budget. For we see, as I have already alluded to, 
The Department of Communities couldn't even bring forward a kickstart programme that would have helped bring young people into jobs. I can remember a number of months back asking the Communities Minister why have they not adopted the UK wider scheme? And the answer I got because we are preparing a better scheme. A better scheme. We have no scheme, Mr Deputy Speaker. No scheme whatsoever. And I've also heard from the members opposite blaming Tory austerity once more. Blaming Tory austerity. When is it ever going to end? And of course, yes, those were hard times, but you can't spend money you do not have. In fact, the party opposite can't even spend the money they do have. So it's very important that we consider. And when they talk about austerity, you have to remember that the UP Conference of Supply Agreements brought that money back. The same monetary value that we lost in austerity, the party brought back in that one, in that two, three year period. Yes, I will. Yeah. Appreciate the intervention. Thank the member for taking it. I would just like to challenge you on your last statement in terms of the member opposite or the party opposite not being able to spend money. I'm sure, like the rest of the MLAs in this House, you have had plenty of engagements with excluded NA, and maybe your own minister would want to consider the money that was given back to the centre that could have dealt with some of those people. The members an extra minute. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Uh, uh, extra minute I take, certainly. And if, you have to remember that the Department of Economy delivered over 40 financial support schemes, about half a billion. Now, of course, there have been people excluded, and every single MLA should be fighting for those people, for those sectors. But you know something? You get to a point in a department where your capacity is filled, whereas there are some departments in this place that haven't put their, wheel, haven't put their shoulder to the wheel one bit. Now, I give credit to LPS. The one scheme that they have administered has been very good, and that's a body that's designed to bring money in, to bring rates in, not to push it out. And I'm on record as supporting that and supporting that uh, 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 organisation. But the Department of Finance and other departments, like the Department of Communities, could have done much more. But they have not. And they have failed the people. So what the people out there who are crying out for support wanted, they wanted a joined up executive. They wanted an executive that would come together and strategise a way out of this, both health-wise and economic-wise, and that has not taken place. I, and I, I regret that that hasn't taken place. And I allude to the kickstart failure by the Department of Communities, the member's own minister. Where is the kickstart programme? Where are those jobs that were to be supported, those young people who were to be supported? It's non-existent. You couldn't even deliver a scheme. You couldn't even put a scheme on the ground, but yet there was a scheme ready-made in the UK wider context that could have been adopted and could have been used. And the field, the party opposite, has failed the people in that regard. It's simply not good enough, Mr Deputy Speaker. We must do better. And in this year of crisis, it has proven that whenever the, government, the sovereign government throws money at us, we do not have the ability nor the capacity to spend it, and yet we want more fiscal the powers. Draws remarks to close. Why, when we can't spend the money we're given? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I now call Matthew Till. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, and I uh, rise uh, obviously to support the two supply resolutions uh, before us today. But in doing so, um, we have quite a lot uh, to discuss. Um, in speaking about this year's um, supplementary estimates and the consequential vote and account, um, it is impossible to ignore uh, the unique year that we have just been through, Mr Deputy Speaker, and indeed, obviously, um, basically all members have referred to it. When we debated the spring supplementary estimates last year, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we were reflecting on updated spending estimates for a period in which there were no executive ministers to take spending decisions and no assembly to formally legally approve the spending. Whilst welcoming the fact that we were back here to actually scrutinise spending, speaker after speaker last year highlighted that we needed to improve our long-term budgeting and we needed to improve our scrutiny. You would need to be an especially positive thinker, and while we are, and we are, I suppose, all trying to be positive thinkers at the minute, to argue that our budgeting processes have noticeably improved since these institutions returned. And in terms of scrutiny, uh, well, uh, literally anything would be an improvement on what we did for the previous three years, which was zero. It is, first of all, important to acknowledge that this has been the most unprecedented of years. 
it would be deeply unfair to look at the volume of in-year spending adjustments uh, in financial year 2021 uh, and simply in a narrow way complain uh, about the scale of changes. Clearly, obviously, the unprecedented and unpredictable nature of the pandemic meant that large in-year adjustments were inevitable, uh, with new Barnet consequentials being made available and new developments emerging in the pandemic. There were new realities emerging all the time that all ministers, including the Finance Minister, had to react to. It is also important to put on record, uh, once again, as we have done in this chamber before, um, mine and my party's <clears throat> appreciation for the Herculean efforts made by uh, officials in the finance department and across executive departments uh, for uh, reacting to the bewildering uh, and I'm sure often terrifying developments um, uh, with fast-paced and novel policy interventions. And this uh, can't be stated uh, often enough. There are lots of officials um, who uh, really put their shoulder to the wheel to come up with novel ideas and deliver them in very short order, including and especially, I think it's worth saying, in land and property services. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm afraid uh, that does not mean that the past year has been a success in budgeting terms. Uh, even when we account for the fact of the pandemic, financial year 2021 um, has been an object lesson in poor planning and absence of strategy. I find myself, uh, unusually for the week and year that's in it, agreeing with some of what the previous speaker said. Um, it's a nice, pleasant change for me to be agreeing with a member opposite um, this year. But we have seen, uh, I won't agree with everything he said, of course, but we have seen really a um, striking and occasionally shocking lack of strategy. Um, this is especially uh, the case, Mr Deputy Speaker, when we reflect on the fact that in the absence of an agreed programme for government, the budget process has become the sole tool for strategic planning and priority setting by the executive. This is a really critical point. We, ha we still have, if you look at this document, the draft budget document for 2021-22, it still refers to draft programme for government outcomes from 2016. My God. 2016. I wish we were back in early 2016. It was before Brexit. It was before. <laughs> it was before the before we'd all had this thing in our lives. Whether you love it, loathe it, or somewhere in between, we're still uh, operating. Some officials are still operating because there's nothing else to replace it. The draft programme for government outcomes, which were never agreed, but still exist in some weird ethereal uh, hypothetical universe, and they need a strategy to work to. That's clearly crazy, and they've been doing that um, for the past year. Out with the COVID allocations, they've been doing that in relation to um, main allocations of spending. Clearly, that isn't um, uh, that isn't viable, and I'm afraid it isn't simply uh, enough. It's not good enough simply to say that. Well, uh, if it wasn't for COVID, we'd have agreed something more strategic, and we'd have agreed a plan. I'm afraid very often um, uh, COVID has been. Uh, an explanation for some of the way we have needed to develop schemes and assign money in a hurried way, but it can't be a complete alibi for the complete lack of strategy. Uh, and, and one example of it, of course, has been the failure uh, by the Executive Office to appoint uh, a head of the civil service. Um, we haven't seen, Mr Deputy Speaker, any real priority setting or strategy from the executive in any meaningful way, and I'm afraid it does fall uh, on the shoulders to an extent he, he might not like, and I can, perhaps I can understand why, of the Finance Minister in seeking out, um, uh, not just seeking out allocations to make or writing letters asking for bids, but in seeking to use the budgetary process in a more strategic uh, way that joins up uh, priority setting for, um, for the whole executive in the absence of a, an agreed programme for government. Mr Deputy Speaker, I have to point out, given the recent uh, fondness in the last couple of days for the Chinese government exhibited by some uh, Sinn Féin MPs, one would think that a, a five-year plan would be in order. Well, to be honest, I, I would quite like a five-month plan, Mr Deputy Speaker. It would be worthwhile. But turning to the specific figures in the spring supplementary estimates, uh, which obviously reflect and regularise changes in allocations made uh, via the monitoring round process, it is no surprise that we see large increases uh, uh, and movements in those uh, corrections, because of course we have had such a unique year. Uh, from the position at main estimates, we have uh, an, increased, um, uh, an increased allocation of around two and a half billion pounds. The largest adjustments are in predictable places, especially the health department and also uh, the department of the economy. But I do have to say the latter department, the department of economy, is a particularly poor study in poor management of resources over the past year. Uh, as has been pointed out more than once in the past year, the department has naively announced entire initiatives and spending programmes on the basis of completely flawed assumptions. Uh, we know last summer they were spending their time thinking about uh, 
getting North American tourists back in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, that was, seemed to be the priority of the department. They announced a, a, a plan to get people back shopping on, um, uh, on, in the high street in January. I'm afraid, looking back now, those look like almost darkly comic how completely flawed those assumptions were. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'll, I'll soon be drawing my remarks to a close. But really, we'll have a longer uh, opportunity tomorrow to talk about the budget process for 21-22 and what we're going to do uh, there. But I think it's critical that as we look back over the past year, we reflect on, I'm afraid, missed, missed opportunity to set any real strategic priorities. Yes, officials have done a great job at helping us get through COVID, but we've singularly failed to agree a set of strategic priorities and deliver them over the past uh, year. Uh, that's not to say that much good work hasn't been done by ministers and officials time, to get us through COVID, but I'm afraid we could have done uh, much better, and I hope we do much better going forward. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Andrew Muir. Um, Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I rise today to support both motions on behalf of the Alliance Party. I would like to thank the Minister for bringing the motions before the Assembly here today. I would also particularly like to pay tribute to the Minister's officials and indeed all officials of all grades across all departments for their work over the last 12 months. Mr Deputy Speaker, as elected representatives, we scrutinise the Northern Ireland departments on behalf of our constituents. This year, those departments have given out more money and supported more livelihoods than ever before. When the stakes are so high, there will, of course, be plenty of criticism. As politicians, it is our job to call it out when people and businesses are excluded from schemes, when money is too slow to get out the door, or when our constituents cannot get updates on their applications. But it is also our job to recognise the sheer scale of the challenges facing civil servants this year and the level of stress that they have had to work under. Many have put in countless additional hours to get money out the door to people who desperately need it. It is a thankless task, Mr Deputy Speaker, but it should not be. So, on behalf of the Alliance Party, thank you for your work over the last 12 months and for everything that has been done, uh, will be done over the year ahead as we hopefully emerge from this pandemic. Mr Deputy Speaker, the passing of the supply estimates and the vote on account are motions for scrutiny and debate rather than mere procedures. We know that supply estimates need to be approved and that the vote on account needs to be passed so that departments can spend money. To do otherwise would be unthinkable. However, given the unprecedented levels of spending that we have seen over the past 12 months, there are two additional areas that the Assembly must play its full role in scrutinising uh, the public finances. The first is to ensure that value for money is being secured. With so much money available and a limited amount of time to spend it, there is pressure on officials just to get money out the door. It is right that we push departments to release money to those that need it as soon as possible. We must get money out the door, Mr Deputy Speaker, but there should also be, and there should be no return of funds to Westminster. But that money needs to be spent efficiently and transparently to ensure good use of public funds. I would be most grateful if the Finance Minister could outline what spending is planned to ensure that money is not handed back but public funds are spent wisely and well. Is he, for example, considering a one-off top-up grant to LRSS grant recipients to enable them to cover the many costs which current recurring grant payments just don't cover, such as national insurance and pension costs payable for furloughed employees, and also adaptions being made to enable the eventual safe reopening? I note with disappointment the Economist Minister's response to myself today to say that she does not consider it feasible to do top-up payments for CR BSS grant recipients. Hopefully, the Minister for Finance can take action where others fail. The second reason that additional scrutiny is required is that the current demands are stretching the capacity of the civil service at a time when we know that it is not in good shape to start with. The Minister for Finance must ensure that a radical plan is put in place to improve the capacity and the capability of the civil service acting upon the recent Audit Office report. It must become a dynamic, authoritative institution where people want to work and progress their careers. Turning to that recovery in the year ahead, Mr Deputy Speaker, as a member of the Infrastructure Committee, I am acutely aware of the need to invest in our infrastructure as part of that recovery. Now is the time to bring forward those projects that will help us build a green recovery. The challenges facing our public transport network and our water system have been magnified. We also need to invest in the backlog of works required in our roads network, while at the same time rebalancing our priorities towards active and sustainable travel. Furthermore, to build an economic recovery is essential to provide support to our local businesses. The Lions Party welcomes the rates relief in the next financial year that has been promised to the sectors impacted most by COVID-19, but we need to go further. 
Now is the time for a root and branch independent review of the non-domestic rate system, with a particular view to support our local high streets and moving away from a system that focuses on bricks and mortar. Finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, while today's vote ensures that departments will receive the money they require, shamefully, hundreds of victims have still not received a penny for their victims' pension. The Secretary of State must bring forward funds without any more delay. Mr Deputy Speaker, there will be more time to debate the budget tomorrow, but today we must focus on the motions before us, which I support. In closing, I would also like to get confirmation from the Minister whether he has received any ministerial direction uh, from the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs in light of the announcement he made on Friday. Thank you. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I welcome the opportunity to speak today on the spring supplementary estimates. Northern Ireland's budget and public resources have been stretched to their limits through the COVID-19 pandemic. Huge levels of public spending have been required to respond directly to the health crisis, as well as the many consequences of it on our society, not least to our economy. Vast sums of finance have been administered to support businesses in Northern Ireland over the past year. Undoubtedly, more support will be needed to help over the coming months as our economy recovers. On this point, I very much welcome the announcement last week from the Economy Minister as she published the Economic Recovery Action Plan, which sets out a range of decisive actions to kick-start economic recovery in Northern Ireland and build a more competitive, inclusive and greener economy. The pandemic has also shone a light on many aspects of our health service that are long in need of significant investment and transformation. Mr Deputy Speaker, the spring Supplementary estimates suggest a total cash requirement across departments of £22 billion. In January, the Department of Health alone recorded having received well in excess of £867 million resource funding to address COVID pressures. The additional monies allocated to Northern Ireland on top of the block grant and the new decade new approach commitments have further shown just how important our membership of the United Kingdom truly is. It is obvious this level of public funding would not have been available without it. The financial benefits of the Union are invaluable to all our public services and to the economy of Northern Ireland. As a party, we recognise the difficult financial environment in which all our departments are operating, and we understand that there needs to be budgetary flexibility as the direct and indirect challenges created by this pandemic develop and change. Significant headroom is provided in spring supplementary estimates to allow for unallocated spending to be absorbed by departments on the basis of future executive decisions before the end of the financial year. The parties opposite often speak about the need for new stormant fiscal powers, and of course we need to look at ways of raising revenue. However, it is clear that the departments need to do much better in using resources that they are already given. The saga in relation to the review of welfare mitigations and the recent hundreds of millions of underspend are just some examples. How can, we, how can we, as public representatives, explain to our constituents that cancer surgeries have been cancelled at the same time as they hear on the news that £90 million in health funding is returned unspent to the Department of Finance? Ministers from all departments must put every effort into ensuring these funds are spent efficiently and not handed back to the Treasury at a time when the need for support in our communities is at an all-time high. In-year monitoring rounds and one-year budgets have become stock gaps and temporary fixes, and this culture needs to change. This is important, particularly in respect of areas like health transformation and implementation of commitments contained in the New Decade New Approach. It is deeply worrying, for example, that on the face of it, only £50 million of the extra £492 million added to the draft the health budget for next year is recurring. As society begins to emerge from COVID-19, the executive's focus needs to turn to those key commitments of the new decade new approach, none so more important than those in terms of our health service. New decade new approach promised to create more stable services and sustainable staffing to deliver an extra 900 nursing and midwifery undergraduate places over three years and to increase the number of funded IVF cycles to three. This must be progressed earnestly. They must be factored into departmental annual budgets. As well as the work which is necessary to achieve safe staffing levels, capital investment in our health service property to improve dated facilities and increase capacity to meet demands for Northern Ireland in 2021 is vital. At the heart of my own constituency is Andromeda Hospital, a hospital which has treated a significant portion of 
Northern Ireland's COVID patients. Many elements of the Antrim Hospital's infrastructure are now inadequate for the huge demand it experiences. This applies to in bed, uh, inpatient bed capacity, as well as in terms of operating theatres, ICU and the maternity ward. And I welcome the fact that the Department of Health have recognised some of this so far in their draft 10-year capital plan. I would urge the Minister of Health to commit to much-needed significant investment at the Antrim site. We should be under no illusions of the monumental task of tackling waiting lists in Northern Ireland, from elective surgeries to the massive backlog of autism assessments. The work to sufficiently recover, even just to pre-pandemic levels, will take time and not insignificant amounts of funding. On the issue of autism support, the PAC report published very recently clearly shows that children with special educational needs and their families, and I quote, have been failed for many years. Current data reflects that children with autism represent a significant and rising proportion of pupils across the school estate. We cannot continue to pay lip service. There must be a more joined up thinking between departments, particularly between health, communities and education, to improve and increase the levels of support provided to the autism community. No one should be left behind any longer. To, to conclude, Mr Deputy Speaker, valuable lessons should be learnt with all, within all departments from this pandemic in terms of prioritising funds and maximising budgets available to the benefit of our communities. We have previously argued that the budget process should start between April to June for the next financial year, with the draft budget being consulted upon in the autumn, allowing a full debate at the turn of the year. This would afford greater detailed scrutiny in advance. The move towards a multi-year budget must be prioritised, not just in the interest of more strategic spending decisions, but to allow for more effective scrutiny within the Assembly and committees. The public of Northern Ireland expect efficient and transparent use of our resources. Let us ensure that every effort is afforded to using these funds wisely to help our society recover. Thank you. I call William Irwin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. This has been far from a normal year, and as we know, given the massive and severe impacts of COVID-19 across the United Kingdom, for which Northern Ireland is an internal part, the pressures and finances have been extreme. It must be said that the Treasury has taken unprecedented action to provide unprecedented assistance to business, employers, uh, employees and the general population in order to try and stave off the worst effects of the lockdown measures. Northern Ireland has certainly benefit, benefited to a significant degree in this regard. I know many businesses in the province have been grateful for the, this assistance, and it is only right that such severe restrictions on our everyday lives financial aid continues to be forthcoming until such times as business can return to a level of normality. As I have said, uh, last year uh, our agri-food industry has not stopped for breath during the onslaught of COVID-19. Even with the associated restrictions and risk to health, our farmers, processors, suppliers and retailers have worked non-stop throughout this period and ensured that consumers have been able to access food, and despite initial panic purchases, have kept up with demand without disruption. That is commendable and indeed demonstrates the resolve and resilience of our farming and food industry. Indeed, that is why in this chamber last week I asked the Health Minister to consider this group of people, among others, for vaccination priority given the importance of their work. I really do feel their efforts are taken for granted, and this should not be the case. I encourage Minister Swan to consider this issue. I know Edwin Pooch has been back to work and is continuing his re recuperation before resuming once again his ministerial duties. I wish him well on this journey, and I also pay tribute to Minister Lyons for his work in stepping in to cover Edmund in his period of recovery. There are significant pressures on finances right across the board within our executive department, and it is certainly looks like this pressure will continue unabated for the foreseeable short-term future, given the fact we remain in lockdown and for some weeks to come. Indeed, on this point, I would urge the executive to provide a degree of clarity to the people, especially those in business, in terms of a likely timetable. I would hope and pray that this situation changes and that our province can return to a level of normality in the very near future. Of course, we, we all, as citizens, have our part to play 
and that uh, with responsibility, responsible actions and adher adherence to the advice. The agreement has published is for, for sustainability at the heart of a living, working, active landscape valued by everyone. That sums up the Department's remit precisely. Indeed, the word sustainability is very key, especially as we move away from EU payments and work in earnest to create our own system of support for the industry. Sustainability must be at the heart of the Department's efforts. The Committee has been involved in a number of discussions in recent months in regards to many issues currently facing agriculture and the environment, and not least the impacts of the protocol and the difficulties this is presenting, not only for businesses but indeed also for the Department itself. I think of a most recent example involving the supply of trees and the fact that orders for many thousands of trees has been cancelled due to the erroneous procedures and new rules based on a very damaging protocol. And this will have an impact, I presume, on the Department's own plans for planting, and I would urge a response to these concerns as soon as possible. There are many more significant issues arising for business, and I believe that the Department will require resources in order to deal with the unfolding difficulties. Indeed, more so after the so-called grace period comes to a close. I know that Minister Pooch, prior to his urgent surgery, was ensuring the voices of those at the sharp end of those in erroneous and costly checks have been listened to. And Minister Lyons, as his replacement, has also been very conscious of the realities of the protocol. Make no mistake, the voices calling for an end to the protocol are growing ever louder. On issues regarding the department spend, disease and livestock and compensation, for instance, around TB, continues to place significant drain on the era resources, and I also feel that in recent times focus has seemed to shift away from the real issues around TB and the 40 million per year costs of this disease. The issue of testing, herd closures and compensation are a very huge upset to many farm families, and the impacts are wide, widespread and costly. There is also an understandable issue with an attempt to cut the level of compensation, especially without any clear and recognisable path to TB eradication. That farmers have that have, uh, TB eradication that farmers have any confidence in. Farmers are doing their part in this regard, but a clear pathway to eradication must be forthcoming. There must be a renewed focus on this issue, as I do feel the wheel has slowly, in terms of rolling out a workable, ad adequate strategy to drive down this disease. There is a huge cost implication associated with continuing to drift in this regard, both to the farmers' financial resources and to the department's financial resources. The focus on farming in the current era and in the future, I would encourage the Minister and his officials to redouble efforts around the launch of the second tranche of Tier 2 of the Farm Business Improvement Scheme. I know in, recent, in a recent letter to me from Minister Lyons, he is actively looking at this, but does state any scheme will be subject to funding availability given the necessity of this programme to help farmers to further respond to environmental change and the level of support proposed, I would again urge him to work hard to ensure that any future direction on ammonia reduction and mitigation is factored into the scheme, this scheme to further assist farm business in adapting. Forward planning is vital around this scheme, and the manufacturing industry must be able to respond to the potential level of demand that will stem from this measure. I would urge clarity on this from the dear Minister to put Northern Ireland farmers and indeed our manufacturing base on its best forward footing. For a wider perspective to the start stop approach with regards to the budget must change to a much longer term strategy and an emphasis on forward planning. We must try to limit the return of unspent money to the Treasury and seek to maximise spend in a coordinated Can ask manner. The member to close? Understand uh, that an end of the year rush was pr proved ineffective and in my view can spend in a chaotic manner as opposed to the strategic, ba strategic benefit of priorities and management spend. I now call Pat Cackney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And thank you, Minister, for coming. And uh, all the times that you were asked to come to, to the committee, I want to thank your officials for coming and giving as much information as possible. I know that it was difficult at times. Uh, just to remind you, all we 
had a pigeon visit at the committee last week in the middle of it, and I would be tempted to come out and say, Minister, this is a turkey of a budget because there's a lot of gobbledygook, but I won't do it. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> but look, uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there's obviously been huge changes in our estimates this year, our estimations this year, not just due to large amounts of extra funding for COVID related mm-hmm. matters, but also because of the unprecedented position that all departments found themselves in over this last year. I think this year has shown us the deep need to regularise our budget process and create more transparency around how departments bid for funding, which criteria they use to determine whether the bid is necessary, and then how the Department for Finance makes the decision on which bids to grant and which ones are unsuccessful. If we look at this year, departments submitted 263 bids, the bulk of which were COVID-related. 141 were unsuccessful, and a further 56 were only partially successful. This equates to a shortfall of nearly a billion, 966.4 million, in what was requested compared to what was granted. If we look at the departments individually, four departments, the Department of Finance, Health, the Executive Office, and the Department for Communities, were allocated more than 89% of the funding which they requested. However, the Department for the Economy, the Department for Infrastructure and DERA were allocated less than 36% of the funding that which they requested. Now, I know these figures include multiple bids for the same thing over many monitoring rounds. However, I think there needs to be a clear understanding, Minister, of what makes a successful bid and what factors into the decision-making for financing one projects and not another. This is not a judgment on the decisions that have been made, and I think giving more clarity in this area allows for us as members to better understand the thinking of departments, but also provides cover for the Department of Finance in allowing them to stand over the decisions that have been made. Over one billion of headroom has been built into the spring supplementary estimates by the Department of Finance to give the executive the ability to spend the funding that has not yet been allocated. There are clear differences in the amount of headroom provided to each department, which is understandable, and departments need the ability to use any budget allocated that may come forward. However, There is a lack of information on what a lot of this headroom could be used for, and I think this needs to be cleared up to allow further scrutiny of the use of this extra allocation. The Executive Office have been uh, indicated uh, they have got the provision of 13 million for victims and survivors of LTD. I would like some clarity on what this provision is for. Does it provide for the pensions for victims? And if it doesn't, where is the funding that is required for this? Victims have waited too long for the support. They should not have to wait any longer, Minister. I would like to welcome some allocations of funding that have been supported projects in my own area of uh, Ligon Valley, I'm sure you will all be pleased to know and share with me how grateful we were for it. Part of the 4.5 million flooding uh, alleviation scheme is going towards the area of Lisburn along the Prince William Road that has been greatly impacted by the issue of flooding for a very long time. I have fought since my days in council for works to be carried out to resolve this issue, and I am absolutely delighted that this work has now begun. Also, the work to develop cycle paths at Blurris and in other places in my constituency have shown, particularly in the time of the pandemic, the benefits of active travel. I hope to see more of these being developed in the near future, and it is my hope that they may be connected with greenways and eventually the canal that will transform our ability to utilise active travel and bring us in line with not only the Republic, but many of our European neighbours. I want to make one final point on the end of year surge spending. I don't want to labour the point, but going in to the last three months of the current financial year, departments have no average more than half of the capital budgets remaining. Eight of nine departments forecast the highest expenditure to occur in March. 
There has been a lot of discussion in this chamber about the potential of funding being lost and having to be returned to Westminster, and members are rightly concerned about this. However, there is another issue with the quality of year and spending that is greatly increased, and it has the potential of funding projects that have been rushed through to spend remaining budgets. Without clear planning and procedures, put in place for managing and monitoring budgets, there is a huge potential for lack of value for money in what funding goes towards in such huge end-of-year spikes. Departments must work on creating a better distribution of funding throughout the year, while the Department of Finance and the Committee must continue their work to provide a greater flexibility in carryover of budgets from one year to the next, and ultimately the move to more multi-year budgets. Uh, I've gone back to when I was in business, and I could not have operated uh, as, as we tried to do here with the vast amounts of money unless I had projected years. In fact, we tried to work off five-year multi-budgets in order to find that through. So that was a small step, and that, that's what I asked the first time I spoke on this one year ago. And it still hasn't been delivered. Minister, I know that you want to get that. I know that you want to get there. And that would be a tremendous situation if we were able to have that and be able to deliver that next year. And it's not a big ask to make as we're going forward. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Mervyn's story. Thank you, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. And I rise in support of the spring supplement estimates and also the voting account. And, and I do share the pain of the Finance Minister having sat in his place in 1617 and having to go through this process. So we will try and, and shorten that pain for him if we possibly can. However, <laughs> which is the famous last words of every Assembly member whenever they stand in this House, I think this year, or the year that has, uh, has left us, we have left it behind, for us all will be a year that we do not want to see repeated. It has been the most challenging year for us all as individuals, as families, as communities and as a society. And, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, we pause to remember those families whose lives have been forever changed as a result of the pandemic. And for them, no budget reallocations, no spring estimates will ever change what has happened in their lives as a result of the loved ones that they have lost and the many others who have been affected by the pandemic. I think also, and it has been mentioned by others, we should pay tribute to our civil service. I have to say, sometimes I am not always a cheerleader for some of uh, the decisions that are made, but that is maybe more a reflection on the politicians than it is on those who have to enact those decisions. But our civil servants have had to work, our civil servants have had to work in the most extreme, difficult and challenging circumstances. And of course they have been put under huge pressure to get money out. And I say this, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, as uh, whether or not I will be back in this chamber after the next election or not is a decision that will be made by others. But when there is an inquiry into COVID and its spending, I hope that it will not be the civil servants who will be made the scapegoats, but that those who made the decisions in relation to the money that should be spent will be held accountable for those spends. Because be assured, when that inquiry comes, there will be problems that will be highlighted. Other members have raised the issue, and it was an issue when I was in finance and when others were there. The structures that we have are totally and absolutely uh, past the point of needing to be reformed. And of course, at the heart of that is a five-party mandatory coalition. What other business could be run by all your competitors sitting in the boardroom? It wouldn't work. The member who preceded me talked about when he was in business he had a multi-year plan or he would have to plan ahead. But we have a system 
that forces us into a government with people who want to spend, spend, spend and have no accountability as to where it comes from. Of course, we've seen that in recent days. On one hand, we have members opposite who are blaming the Treasury and the Chancellor and austerity. 4.4 billion. That wouldn't have come from a new Ireland. That wouldn't have come, I have to say, if anybody wants some, some midnight reading, and you'd have to read it in the dark, it, would make, it wouldn't make any more sense if you did read it in the dark. The economic policy published by Sinn Féin, and they tell us that the subvention could be reduced because you don't have to spend money on the military. You don't have to spend money on the security forces. And that would be the, sub the subvention wiped out. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have to worry about where the money's coming from. It's the politics of the primary school. And I have to say it's the economics of the primary school. The other reason I think, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, that we in this House need to take into account is the fact that the system and I, I hear what the Finance Minister has said previously, and no doubt what he say later. It's all dependent on what the bids are. So it's all dependent on it's everybody else's fault. Don't bring or bring me bids. In fact, the Minister said on one occasion, I think it was to the Minister of Infrastructure, who dragged their feet in relation to producing an outcome for uh, the coach uh, operators. And uh, he, the, the, minister, the Minister, the Finance Minister rightly said, bring forward a bid, bring forward a bid. But ultimately, the decision in regards to the allocation rests with the Finance Minister. And my colleague from North Antrim, Paul Frew, rightly highlighted the discrepancies in regards to the total amount of bids and the return and the allocations that have been made. And so I do think, and I agree with the, the previous speaker, that we need to see on the basis of what, because all we get is a bid and an allocation. We don't get a rationale. We don't get a rationale from the Department of Finance as to why one bid was more acceptable. Yes? Figures, Mr Deputy Speaker, that bids, sometimes bids are partly successful, and we have no, just, no justification or rationale for why a bid would be partly successful and how much of that bid was successful, whether it be 50 per cent or 100 per cent or 75 per cent of that bid. Members, next minute. Thank you. And I, and I think that, that is something that we need to have a better understanding of and a better understanding of the rationale as to why those bids are, are made successful. But I bring members also back. A huge amount of money has been spent this year, and rightly so, on health. And it is right to spend money on our health service. But I do have to remind members that in 2016, the former health minister introduced the Ben Goa report. And that Ben Goa report committed us to transformation. That was in October 2016. Come January 2017, the party opposite decided to pull down the shutters, walk out the door, and didn't care about the health service. And so when we look at these figures, and when we are planning for the future, there is going to have to be a radical change as to what we see as a priority. If health is a priority, then it's going to have to be funded. If we put in a document like NDNA that we need 7,500 police officers, then it's 7,500 police officers we're going to have to get because it can't be partial. It can't be one over another. It has to be what we said we would do. We have to deliver. And if we don't deliver, then I think the people have every right to question whether or not this place is fit for purpose to be able to meet their needs. I call Pat Sheehan. I've got a Kian Korla. And uh, speaking of delivery, uh, as this previous speaker was, uh, the start of the year was very positive. Um, we hope the a uh, new decade, new approach represented a new departure in terms of British government responsibility to the people here. Uh, there were numerous pledges in that agreement to invest in public services. There was a commitment to multi-year budgets to allow ministers to effectively plan for the future. Of course, we didn't get delivery. 
uh, surprise, surprise, the British government reneged on another deal. And the British government, uh, bad faith and the pandemic have combined to present us with a very difficult financial situation. Uh, and all that on top of a decade of relentless Tory austerity that has ravaged, ravaged our public services. Yes, certainly. Member for Kevin Wayne, he talks about bad faith and ravaging. Will he now take the opportunity in this House to condemn the economic policies of his party and the provisional IRA, who bombed the heart out of the economy of Northern Ireland for 40 years? Take the opportunity, and could he clarify, is Oakland O'Hearn still what he supports as he claims he was involved in that organisation? Because clearly he has to make a choice. Members, next minute. I thank the member for his intervention. And I would just say to the member, and I know he's a believer in creationism, you know, but listen, let's get away from ancient history. We're living in a new dispensation. There's been a peace process here now for over 20 years. Come on, catch up. Get, get, in, get into the 20th century, never mind the, the 21st, and come on. I mean, work. Let's start working together. Let's start working together for the people here. Yes, I'll give way one more time. I thank the member for giving way. Where was he for the three years whenever he and his colleagues walked out of this place, pulled this place down, pulled the shutters down, and blamed everybody else, including the British government? Where was he then and, and his rationale about working together? It's a bit late coming now. Can I encourage everyone okay. to come back to the debate that we're having here today, please? Or am I the last chance for that? And just the final word. That, that had nothing to do with our HI. But in any event, our education and, and our children bore the brunt of Tory party policy here. And it appears they're likely to go down the same route again. And I'm, I'm grateful that we have a finance minister who works on behalf of the most vulnerable in our society. And significant sums have been allocated to the Department of Education. And I note uh, Mr Storey also pointed out that it's the responsibility of the finance minister to allocate the funding. And he has done that for the most vulnerable. And I want to commend the Minister of Finance for his allocations in particular to support children with special educational needs, over £10 million for that, and also £30.6 million for holiday hunger. And this issue got a lot of publicity across the water when Marcus Rashford, the Man United uh, footballer, embarrassed the Tories in the pony and up uh, for uh, school meals for children during the holidays. And he, uh, I'll give way one more time. That's it. I appreciate the member giving way, but does he recall that the members opposite's colleagues at Westminster voted against the extension of free school meals? Minister for that intervention. I didn't really want to remind them of that, you know. But there you go. <laughs> so, uh, and Marcus actually, uh, Marcus actually got a, a gong uh, for the good work that he did in embarrassing the Tory government into stumping up free school meals. Uh, I don't know whether Sir Connor Murphy has a, a, has a good ring to it, but I mean, he. Uh, he certainly, order, he, order, certainly, he, order. Certainly deserves, he certainly deserves the praise of everybody in this House, and particularly from the most vulnerable in society, for what he has done. And, uh, and, and uh, lest we forget also, he also made a pay award for teachers. But even before the pandemic, the education system was already on the brink of financial crisis. Starved of investment for 10 years, and Marvin, you should know this because you were the chair of the Education Committee. The system was dealing with a £400 million shortfall. And in NDNA, the British government committed to investing in our schools to ensure uh, that they would have access to sustainable core budgets. Unfortunately, with the resources that provide it now, that won't happen. Uh, and this is particularly concerning in the context of COVID because there will be consequences for our children having missed so much time at school, both in terms of lost learning 
and emotional and mental health issues. Uh, the mental health champion, Professor Siobhan O'Neill, gave evidence to the Education Committee a few weeks ago. And she agreed with the, 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 with the assessment that there's a tsunami of emotional and mental health issues coming at us down the tracks. Our children have been badly affected by this pandemic, by missing school, by missing the social interaction, uh, and so on. And there will, all, will also be many children who have fallen behind in their schoolwork. And in most cases, it's disadvantaged kids who are going to be affected by this. And I have called on the Education Minister to make a substantial and ambitious bid for some of the 300 million COVID funding that, and this is one positive thing that the executive is now allowed to carry over. Because what we need moving ahead is a, a, a comprehensive, a coordinated and integrated strategy to deal with lost learning and emotional and mental health well-being as kids move back to school. Uh, and it has to be extensive. I acknowledge the Engage programme that the Minister put in place after the first lockdown. That was 11.2 million, but that's not enough to deal with the problems that are going to be coming down the tracks at us here shortly. So I'm calling on the Minister for Education to put in place a substantial bid to make sure he has a plan and a strategy in place uh, to deal with the issues that are going to be facing our children in schools. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of time to do it, but he needs to in in involve teachers, their unions, children, uh, the community and voluntary sector, sport organisations, and so on. Uh, he needs to make that bid, and he needs to do it quickly. I would now ask that Paula Bradshaw would be brought into the spotlight. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I must say that and, and I now call Paula Bradshaw. To me, as health spokesperson speaking in the chamber today, to discuss a motion which we have no real option but to pass. Certainly, we have never had a year where the estimates have diverged so significantly from the original budget, with 19% extra resource expenditure and 11% extra capital, even discounting the specific COVID-19 spending, which is why it is so frustrating that we have little time to scrutinise them fully. However, we are where we are. When I was last um, in the chamber to debate, debate the vote on account 10 months ago, I mentioned that the current crisis has shown that health spending concerns all departments as health is all encompassing. The impact of this public health pandemic is felt right across every, every section of society and every um, public service. The requirement for assistance is also felt across all sectors from the need to um, provide extra public spending to plug gaps to the need to support the community and voluntary sector to provide vital services at a time when it is most difficult to do so to the need to support businesses and those who work in the private sector who cannot for whatever reason earn a living at present this is a reminder that spending must be about practical outcomes not bureaucratic silos also, a little like when we discuss coronavirus regulations, the timing for discussing estimates and budgets is not ideal because of changes that are about to come. We're still uncertain about what lies ahead in the UK budget. An increase in corporation tax across the UK would, for example, raise the question of whether we wish to accept increased income from such an increase through Barnet Consequentials or ignore it and maintain the lower rate here. That has an impact potentially even on how we may wish to spend the headroom money allowed for in these estimates. At all times, we have to consider what lies ahead. Hopefully, we begin a recovery period in the second half of the forthcoming financial year. Notwithstanding what I've said about how all the, impact, all the spending impacts on health, even among specifically COVID-19 spending, health is underrepresented. The department's 1.04 billion allocation may be the highest of all the executive departments, but it is actually a lower share of the total than is usually allocated in the budget process. 
This is perhaps understandable in these specific circumstances, but the fact is that this cannot remain the case. As we rebuild and reform health and social care, if anything, that share allocated to health of, of any budgetary uplifts will in fact have to rise as a proportion of the total. We need not just to address the appalling backlog in waiting lists, um, treatments and diagnostics, but we also then need to um, increase our spending in investment and reform, um, things that should have occurred a long time ago. And I've heard uh, Ben Goa being mentioned there for me a few years back, so we do have a lot of um, space to recover. There are also uh, some aspects of health um, which were pledged in the Westminster legislation or in the new decade new approach, which are still not being provided for um, from the three cycles of IVF to back pay for workers in various parts of healthcare. These are not just pledges made on paper. They have real world impacts in areas which are a matter of urgency to many people in society who literally cannot wait for them to be addressed. Some of the extra funding in these estimates is very welcome. There should, for example, now be no shortage in PPE given the 175 million allocation. I do wish to put on record briefly, however, some of the key concerns for Department of Health spending heading into the next financial year. For example, long COVID is already a growing pressure on wellbeing and post-viral services. Um, they will need to be commissioned properly and properly funded uh, in the coming months. Um, waiting list pressures, as I've said, will inevitably need more than the current 1.1 billion budget allocation. Then there is mental health and wellbeing, which has also been raised in the chamber this afternoon, which accounts currently for only between seven and 8% of all health spend. Northern Ireland has higher rates of poor mental health than the rest of the UK, and we cannot just rely on Barnet Consequentials and remaining confidence in supply funding to deliver a comprehensive strategy. We need every member in the Chamber to commit to ensuring this is properly funded. In particular, I highlight that we have no extra funding committed either this year or next for children's mental health. I would like to turn to one of the issues which has been live in recent weeks and is very relevant to the decisions we have to make this financial year, and that's namely the £500 special recognition payment. It is important that we ensure, as we have now pledged from the uh, Finance Minister last week, that this will mean that the £500 payment will not create corp um, complications in tax, pensions and credits. Secondly, it is important that all key workers who have been placed under huge pressures and provided vital services during the pandemic qualify for this payment, and that would include those in the community and voluntary sector. The money is clearly there in the headroom allocation to pay for this. So in closing, Mr. Um, Principal Deputy Speaker, our job here today is to safeguard the finances for Northern Ireland and most of all, the people of Northern Ireland. We trust in folding through these allocations that we are very much helping to do the latter and that we must give them the benefit of doubt despite the rush. Thank you. I now call Linda Dillon. I'm not going to go over the position that we're in because all other members have already highlighted the fact that we are in the middle of, of or hopefully coming out of a global pandemic and the very difficult year that we have had and I would like to attach myself to the comments of Mervyn's story in relation to those families who have lost loved ones during this pandemic and our thoughts are with them. You know money is one thing and finances and we need to deal with it and we need to ensure that we give finances to ensure that we do recover properly in, in terms of everything from mental health to education to our, our health system and, and our justice system. But people who have lost loved ones, no amount of money is going to bring them back. So our thoughts are with those people and, and we will no doubt have to put in place services to support those people at the other side of this because I have no doubt that they have not got the support that they would ordinarily have got in terms of, of the proper processes around wakes and funerals. So there's no doubt that we will have to, to look at investing support and, and some type of remembrance around those people who died during this time. So I'm rising to support both motions as Sinn Féin Justice spokesperson. The wider criminal justice system has also has come under immense pressure during the COVID-19 pandemic with restrictions and social distancing requirements put putting new and additional pressures on frontline services. The loss of 350 million in new NDNA funding that the executive had received 2021 means that 
the 21-22 budget will largely represent a standstill position, but will represent in real term a cut for most departments, including the Department of Justice. The Department's budget overview and equality screening outlines the potential impact of living within its budget baseline without pressures being met, including the potential reductions in police officer and prison officer numbers, and an impact on a range of different services and plans such as hate crime review, problem solving justice and supporting victims of domestic and sexual abuse. In terms of the spring supplementary estimates, DOJ is different in some senses from other departments in that a lot of the additional funding for COVID was not spent on services or schemes, but rather it represents a loss of income which is not expected to be in place going forward given the business recovery across courts. However, it is disappointing that an easement of £1.2 million in ring-fenced COVID-19 funding was surrendered, particularly considering the increased backlog of cases awaiting court hearing. There is additional money to be spent before the end of the financial year, and when we are in a situation whereby inescapable pressures have been identified in the draft budget and where the current backlog of cases in the court system has significantly, significantly can almost say, increased in comparison to pre-pandemic levels, I believe more could be done to identify how this could have been addressed as part of the spring supplementary estimates. Speeding up justice is a priority for the justice system, and it is vital that the challenges facing us in terms of case times and backlogs are addressed. DOJ have identified inescapable pressures of £55.7 million, much of which fa falls to the PSNA. NDNA contained a commitment to increase the number of police officers up to 7,500, as has already been outlined by Mr Storey. Additional funding was granted in 2021, which allowed some increase to the numbers of police officers. But with the British Government still not providing the resources required to fulfil this commitment, we could end up in a farcical situation where police officer numbers are actually reduced. We also obviously have the, the situation where in last year, where we had no Brexit, the British Government gave us £16.5 million in funding for additional police officers in relation to Brexit, and this year when Brexit has actually happened, and we have seen the fallout of that in terms of security and, and particularly threats coming from within loyalism, that there is a reduction in funding coming from the British Government in relation to Brexit for the PSNA. I have shared my concerns with DOJ officials, and I share them here again today, of the potential impact of such cuts on frontline services and particularly concerns around neighbourhood policing. However, I do appreciate that the Chief Constable has outlined that neighbourhood policing will be a priority going forward and I do welcome that and have been given the same reassurances from the department to which the Chief Constable has also made that point. Neighbourhood and local policing teams have a key role in preventing crime and improving outcomes in many types of crimes, including drug dealing, domestic abuse paramilitary violence, anti-social behaviour, rural crime, child and sexual exploitation and many, many more different types of crimes. The cost of delivering a full range of priorities set out in NDNA is far in excess of the funding package provided by the British Government. And in October, the Assembly passed a motion which called on the British Government to provide adequate funding to take forward the NDNA priorities, including the commitment to enhanced local police numbers. It is very disappointing that they have not yet done so. so yeah. I thank the member for giving way, and I, and I concur with all her comments in relation to the additional police. However, I would say that I think what we need to remember in NDNA is that it said the executive will increase the police numbers. So I think the onus is on the executive. Failure in the Minister of Justice to bring forward a uh, business case in terms of this issue, keeps batting it back and forward. And also, let's remember, 20 years ago, Patton said 7,500 police officers. Members, the next minute. Thank you. I welcome the, the member's intervention. However, I have seen time and time again, as already been outlined by my colleague Pat Sheehan, where the British government make commitments, they do not stand by them, they do not fund them. They have done the same as we have seen in terms of legacy, which I will come to in a few minutes. The probation board's budget represents approximately 1.8 per cent of the Depart Department of Justice budget 2021-22. However, their importance in the justice system is much higher value than that. The 
upcoming resource in terms of the probation board and the difficulties that they have outlined to us as a committee that it's going to pose for them have been significant, particularly given that we have got a number of commitments and, and programmes being rolled out in relation to better engagement with victims. And what the probation board have told us is the budget that they're getting will mean that they will actually not only will they not have better engagement with victims, but they will have worse engagement than we already have. And I think that if we speak to some victims, they could tell you it couldn't be much worse than it already is. And this is unsustainable for the probation board. We also have a circumstance where social workers within the probation board are paid less than social workers in, within the health service and other services. And I think that that, again, is unsustainable. We need to look at how, how we equalise this and how we work together. And is there a way of the Department of Justice and Department of Health working together around social workers? As I've said, legacy is a real issue in terms of funding. And, and the real issue is the failure of the British government, not only to bring forward funding on commitments that have been met, but to bring forward the legislation around the HAU, which then creates a knock-on effect to the PSNA budget. With the member draw remarks to close. Yes, I would just like to say in relation to the pension, and obviously that falls under DOJ to administer, but it is only the administration, and again, it is the failure of the British government to fund legislation which they actually imposed upon us. I call Dolores Kelly. Um, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to take part in this debate and recognise uh, that uh, many previous speakers have already outlined the purpose of the debate and uh, their, their regret that we are not having uh additional and enough time to explore uh, many of the budget lines and to make the comments that we would uh, seek to make and to interrogate the figures a lot more. I think uh, if I could follow on from um, Mrs Dillon to say around police numbers and indeed from Mr Storey. Mr Storey is quite right. The uh, pattern numbers of 7,500 were set by pattern. They're not a new magical figure, but they were set within the new decade, new approach and something that all parties in the executive agreed to and it's most regrettable. Uh, that up to three to four hundred jobs in policing might be lost or not uh, not replaced uh, this year, particularly when neighbourhood policing is now across all our constituencies and is widely and broadly welcomed uh, by the community. And of course, the seven and a half thousand figure for policing was also set in terms of peacetime when there were no distant Republicans, when loyalist paramilitaries had largely uh, been expected to have stood down. And yet we have had recent independent reports from the Commission IRC uh, that to say that uh, loyalist paramilitaries are still actively recruiting in large numbers and we've seen some of the impact of that more recently in our streets, particularly around East Belfast. So uh, I, I would ask uh, that there be urgent consideration given again uh, in, in future monitoring rounds to the policing situation needs to be put on, the, on a proper and sustainable footing. The, the bit around uh, victims' uh, payments, I again agree that that's something uh, which uh, the British government has reneged upon. I know that uh, the Minister uh, of Finance has had a number of meetings with the Treasury uh, around uh, new decade, new approach commitments, and perhaps might be able to give an update on whether we've made any advance on that. I know that the First and Deputy First Ministers, or Joint First Ministers, uh, were meeting with the Secretary of State last week, and I understand that there there was no progress made, but we are uh, uh, reaching a critical date, uh, uh, given the, the judgment in the court uh, was that I think a uh, further two weeks is left before the time runs out around payments. So I would like to know uh, how the Minister of Finance is going to address that in, in the coming weeks and months, because there is uh, a court judgment there in relation to the responsibilities of the Executive Office. Uh, if I could then uh, turn my attention to infrastructure uh, as, as infrastructure spokesperson, and I think on uh, numerous occasions we have heard uh, the British Prime Minister talk about turbocharging infrastructure, although some of the ideas he's coming up with in terms of trying to, <laughs> to uh, bring forward bridges and tunnels and roundabouts, I think somebody said around the Isle of Man earlier in a debate earlier today, uh, are, are nonsensical, and we all know his particular record of delivery around the Garden Bridge in London, where uh, I think it's been abandoned, uh, much public money spent uh, and, and lost to the public purse on vanity projects of this particular individual. Yes, I will. 
I welcome the member taking an intervention. Would the member agree with me that it would be much more in line if the British government would give us money for the underinvestment in our infrastructure over many, many years? Member for the next minute. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for her intervention because that's a point that our minister and, and our party has made, indeed many parties have made, as they held the infrastructure portfolio, and it has been ha having to live on a hand-to-mouth existence uh, on monitoring rounds uh, rather than proper uh, investment both capital and resource. Uh, I, I welcome the fact that uh, we have had additional uh, funding in terms of the capital, but it is most regrettable that the draft resort budget uh, proposed is extremely challenging and if further funding is not secured, it will cause a really difficult year ahead. And it will also be difficult to deliver a capital programme of this scale without a corresponding increase to the resource budget. I, I must add that the draft resource outcome for a department for the department from the 21-22 budget is 420.7 million. This is an increase of 2.8 million. That is 0.7% increase on the 20-21 opening resource allocation of 417.9 million, and is proportionately less of an increase than all other departments, and less than the average departmental increase of over 6%. Uh, we all know uh, and have raised concerns, particularly about uh, rural roads and our roads maintenance. And in fact, numerous audit reports has underscored the fast underspend in infrastructure that we have had, uh, particularly in roads over many years. But not only is our roads at risk, also our wastewater treatment. An earlier intervention today during question time by uh, Martina Anderson highlighted the wastewater treatment that needed to be invested in in order to allow uh, our towns and cities and housing developments to grow and expand, and that is something uh, that I think uh, should be a key priority uh, going forward in relation to uh, the allocation of funding uh, by the Finance Minister. Um, I could also they say that we also, of course, face unprecedented challenges, not only around COVID, Brexit, but also climate change. And these matters should be uh, given consideration. I believe all parties have signed up to uh, commitments in relation to um, having to deal with these uh, challenges in a coherent uh, uh, fashion. Uh, obviously, it is a, a global challenge, and we have our own uh, role to play, but that all uh, costs money. And yet, we have uh, many communities uh, seeing what is uh, close to them in terms of uh, the street lights, the potholes, uh, the road safety uh, not being funded, and on extremely long uh, waiting lists. I think in my own constituency, about two years ago, I met with the divisional road manager, and I, we were asking about traffic calming measures, and we were told that uh, they had over 600 applications, but only enough funding for one per year. And surely uh, the finance minister uh, could actually ensure that other departments who are having to return large sums of money at the end of this financial year should be challenged to better uh, deliver on their commitments. And if there is uh, money in earlier monitoring rounds, given that uh, we, the, 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 the businesses and the, uh, the bidders need to be put in place in order to deliver on spend, uh, that that needs to be done much earlier in monitoring rounds. And it was a, a matter of deep regret that the £11 million bid by the Infrastructure Minister in June of last year was uh, refused by the Finance Minister. And uh, that has uh, left it even more diff a difficult situation, uh, much, much worse. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I now call Joanne Bunting, Deputy Chair of the Audit Committee. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I speak today, as you have said, as the Deputy Chairperson of the Audit Committee. As the House is aware, the Audit Committee scrutinises and agrees the budgets and estimates of the Northern Ireland Audit Office and the Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman and lays the estimates before the Assembly. The Committee also has an equally important role in scrutinising the budget for the Northern Ireland Assembly Commission. In recognition of the independence of these bodies, the committee carries out these functions in place of the Department of Finance. In-year monitoring is a very important feature of the budget process, and it should be acknowledged at the outset that due to the impact of COVID-19, it has proven difficult at times for bodies to make robust and accurate forecasts of expenditure requirements. This is borne out by the nature of the easements that were declared by the, these three independent bodies during the year. I will deal firstly with the Audit Office. 
COVID-19 and the uncertainties that existed around the implications of Brexit on the audit of the European Agricultural Funds had a delaying effect on the Audit Office's planned intensive recruitment schedule. As a consequence, an easement of £300,000 was declared in June 2020. Further easements of £400,000 and £100,000 were declared in October 2020 and January 2021, respectively. Again, these were the result of COVID. There were savings because of recruitment delays, but also considerable savings in the area of travel and subsistence, training and running costs. Turning now to the Public Services Ombudsman. In June and October 2020, NIPSO did not see a basis for making alterations to its budgetary position, although it should be noted that in response to the Department of Finance's separate assessment exercise, it did contribute £60,000 of its 2021 year budget for central COVID-19 countermeasures. In January 2021, NIPSO surrendered £100,000 because of the delay in the commencement of its Complaints Standards Authority role. However, it is hoped that this facet of their work will begin in the coming financial year, and the Audit Committee is content that NIPSO's resource plans for the 2021-22 year are appropriate to take that forward. Finally, the Assembly Commission. In June 2020, the Commission surrendered £1.745 million. This was due, in the main, to the impact the pandemic had on the Commission's plans for staff recruitment in the 2021 financial year. In October 2020, the Commission identified a net pressure of £2.295 million. A pressure of £4.146 million was identified as a result of the publication of the Assembly members' salaries and expenses determination, and the Commission subsequently received an allocation for this. Easements for the period were also identified, including £977,000 from staff salaries due to recruitment being slower than anticipated, again because of the pandemic. The continuing closure of Parliament buildings, the absence of external uh, committee activity and the consequent reduction in the full range of usual activity meant that admin costs would be reduced by £345,000 and an easement for that amount was declared. There was also a reduction in planned revenue expenditure on a number of large-scale projects requiring external consultancy expertise. For example, the Parliament Building's security system and the Corporate Systems Review Project. In January 2021, a further £906,000 was surrendered due to easements identified in staff salaries, admin costs, members' costs and constituency office costs. COVID again played a significant role in the easements identified in relation to staff and admin costs. However, the reduction for constituency office costs arises from an estimation that the anticipated recruitment of staff that was facilitated by the determination will not all take place in this financial year. The Commission carried out unforeseen work during the year to deliver remote working. and This has meant that a small number of anticipated capital projects will now be undertaken in the 21-22 financial year. This resulted in a surrender of capital Dell totalling £123,000. The Audit Committee is acutely aware that effective financial management processes are essential if significant overspends and underspends are to be avoided. As I have already mentioned, the past year has been a difficult one in terms of forecasting expenditure. However, we are moving into a new year where there should be slightly less uncertainty and working practices and procedures have already adapted to comply with the restrictions. It is hoped then that this will be evidenced by more accurate forecasting. I will. Member for giving way. Has the audit office, in the light of, of the amount of money that has been surrendered, particularly in relation to the Commission, will it have an opportunity then to see how the Commission has been able to operate in the environment of COVID and what work and practices could change that would improve so that the burden financially is not as much maybe in 2021, in 20, 21, sorry, 21, 22. The member's next minute. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Well, the member will be aware of that <laughs> the only rule the audit committee has in this regard is to scrutinise the budgets. Ultimately, the decisions are for the commission. But yes, I mean, I think that there's a responsibility 
on everybody to ensure that public money is uh, spent in the most effective and efficient way possible and that savings are found where it's possible to find them. The committee has carried out its assessment of the expenditure required by the three independent bodies for the 21-22 financial year in a rigorous manner. And members will continue to apply that rigour throughout the entire budget process. And I trust that that will give the member some assurance in that regard. Taking into consideration the wider public expenditure position, the committee has emphasised to the independent bodies that for the 21-22 year, they have to live within their opening baseline positions, absorb significant pressures and identify surrenders at the earliest opportunity. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I now call Philip McGuigan. Um, last can call you. In the year that uh, we are in, uh, it is quite right that the clear priorities for the executive have been to save lives, keep people safe, protect the NHS and attempt to thwart the spread of, of coronavirus. In the midst of a global pandemic, this was never going to be straightforward, uh, therefore, for the North's finances. I am conscious this is a debate on the supplementary estimates, which in a usual year would usually be a debate about money uh, already spent. This year is obviously slightly different, uh, and therefore I just want to make a few general points on our fiscal situation. Due to COVID, there are very good reasons uh, for the number and value of the in-year reallocations that have taken place. And given the late announcements from the British Treasury, uh, there are again reasons why there is at this late, late stage uh, considerable amounts of money left by the executive uh, to spend. The estimates we are debating contain within them levels of headroom which will ensure that departments will have the flexibility needed to get that money spent. Uh, the Finance Minister has, in his opening remarks, explained the rationale for this. Uh, I have noted uh, that the Finance Minister has repeatedly called on his executive colleagues to come forward with bids for funding to get this money spent prior to uh, the 31st of March. Uh, I am regularly contacted, I am sure everybody else is the same, in this difficult year that we have had by concerned businesses and members of the public who are struggling as a result of the pandemic and have yet not received any support. So it is vital that all is done to ensure that this money is allocated in the short time ahead and done so in a way that helps those who, who need it most. Uh, during the debate, I have listened to other members uh, allude to the need for multi-year budgets and the need for strategic planning. Uh, I totally agree with this. I'd be surprised if anyone disagreed with it. I think it needs to be continually pointed out, though, that uh, we don't have multi-year budgets, and nor will we have the ability in the forthcoming budget because of decisions taken by the British Treasury. We've also heard there is upwards of 200 million of COVID money, which the British Treasury have re refused to allow to be carried over into next year. This decision not to show flexibility ha has undoubtedly caused problems for departments trying to manage their budgets uh, as this money arrived late without notice. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm grateful for the member giving way. I, I, I take his point about uh, the Treasury. They really have late allocations all that this year. No doubt. You're not gonna, I'm not going to argue with that, even though I used to work there. I know how bad they've been. No, no questions. But it seems a bit passive that it's all the Treasury's, it's all the fault of the Treasury. Like, we have no agency here to set priorities. We could, for example, have set better priorities this year and delivered them. I just would put that to the member and, and to reflect upon. Members, next a minute. Thank you. I uh, mean, me the executive uh, does have priorities. We have a programme for government. But as everybody has uh, pointed out, you know, this is a year like no other, uh, and, and in a lot of cases uh, it has been firefighting and getting money out and reallocating money. I mean, the important point is that the, the money that the executive has should be spent and spent in a fair uh, and equitable manner. Uh, I mean, the key point that I suppose, uh, and I'm just following on from uh, continually attacking the Treasury, I mean, my, my key point any time I'm going to get up to speak on the budget. Uh, under the current arrangements, are we are almost entirely dependent on the British government to pay for public services uh, through the block grant. Uh, you know, I've listened to a few sp speakers uh, during the debate, particularly committee chairs, talk about the impact of Tory austerity over decades uh, and its impact on our public services. I mean, I was particularly struck by the, the comments of the health committee chair detailing the impact that that austerity uh, over a decade has had on our NHS during this pandemic, but also its impact on waiting lists for other vital, vital health services. 
vital health services that ultimately are impacting on lives and the quality of lives of our citizens. So, I mean, relying on a British government, especially a right-wing Tory government, is never going to be good for citizens on this island. I mean, in the short term, this executive needs greater financial flexibility with regard to public spending and the financial tools to do a better job for the people we represent. I, I welcome the, the Finance Minister's recent announcement uh, that he, he, he is setting up a, fin- uh, sorry, a fiscal commission uh, to establish, to explore I mean, that very possibility. Uh, in conclusion, uh, last can call you, uh, today, March the 1st, is the 40th anniversary of when Bobby Sands began his hunger strike. And despite the passing of time, Bobby Sands was 100% correct when he wrote in his diary entry 40 years ago today as he started his fast that only when the Irish people as a unit can control their own affairs and determine their own destinies as a sovereign people, free in mind and body, separate and distinct economically, would we prosper here on this island. I call Justin McNulty. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak, to speak in today's debate on budget. As members of this Legislative Assembly, we have three key responsibilities – shaping public policy, shaping public spending and representing individual constituents' concerns. Cam Carla, in my engagement with various departments, public bodies, arms length bodies and those who depend on the public sector for work, there is a real frustration at the way we manage our finances and plan our spend. Government spending here has been too short term, focused and too last minute. It does not facilitate better long term strategic thinking or long term planning and value for money. I want to touch on five areas of spend this evening, the first being on hospital waiting lists. We are all too aware of the need to tackle the long waiting lists for surgery across the different specialities. I fully appreciate we have just come through a worldwide pandemic. In addition to the obvious health pressures associated with coronavirus, it is only added to our massive waiting list problem. We have people waiting for years for routine surgeries. They are waiting far too long for a first appointment with a specialist, and then, and even longer, wait for surgery. New decade, new approach, promised action. It promised finance for surgery. What is being done to address the pending epidemic? of growing waiting lists, delayed operations and screening, the epidemic after the pandemic. Where is the action? Where is that finance? People are dying on waiting lists. People and families just want action. The second issue I want to touch on is an educational restart, physical education restart and emotional health and wellbeing. Cam Corla, our children and young people have been forgotten about in this pandemic. For very sound reasons, we turned our attention to the elderly and vulnerable. They are at greater risk from the coronavirus, but that has been at the cost of our children's education, their access to physical education and sport, as well as their emotional health and well-being. I don't believe the Restart programme goes far enough. I think it's a piecemeal, and a supp- it's a piecemeal approach, and it's supplemented by a young people's emotional health and well-being and education framework, framework costs at 6.5 million. Bluntly, I don't think this goes far enough. If we don't tackle the emotional and the educational catch-up needed under one strategic banner, I feel that too many children will be left behind and forgotten about. Thirdly, Cam Corla, as a constituency MLA, one of the biggest issues I get contacted about is the state of our rural roads. We have seen time and time again ministers tell us of the need for long-term strategic investment in rural and structural road maintenance. In fact, the now Finance Minister said in 2009 that better roads are vital to the North's economic prosperity. So you will then appreciate my concern at learning from the Infrastructure Minister, who bid for an additional $17.5 million through the year, monitoring the, year, the year monitoring last year. He allocated just $2 million. I want to see the Department of Infrastructure properly resourced and rural roads maintained. Fourthly, as a member of the Education Committee, I am anxious and deeply frustrated at the way children with special educational needs are constantly let down. Families and young people have to wait months for special assessment. When they do get that assessment, there is no money for the one-to-one support they need, and they just seem to be cast aside and dropped off at every turn. Their families are fed up with the lip service paid to them and their children. These children are our most vulnerable and needy citizens. They cannot be forgotten about, and it is imperative educators have the finance necessary to give them the support they need. 
Finally, Count Corley, I want to draw the Minister's attention to the support for the GEA. I know that the £20 million allocated initially for set aside for redevelopment of Kirsten Park is welcome, but we need much more than that. We need certainty that the Finance Minister, the Communities Minister and the Executive are, the, are committed to the delivery of the project. We need certainty that the money is there to fund the projected costs. Kirsten Park can be the phoenix from the ashes of this pandemic. I urge the Minister to support that vision. What's more, I want to take the opportunity to press the Minister on the need to support social clubs, sporting social clubs. Like many licensed premises in sports, tourism and hospitality, they have had their doors shut for almost a year now. Some of these facilities have had weekly support, but GEA clubs have been cut adrift by the Minister's guidelines and some are facing real difficulty. Can the Minister go back and review this policy? It is not hard to clarify the clubs concerned. There are many in our own constituency that we share, and indeed across the north. The lack of support is in danger of putting many sporting clubs or driving them to the wall. Carly, I could go on, but I know there are others who wish to speak. However, I will add one final thing. This place has been awash with money to deal with the, pan the pandemic. And I fear that much of it will go unspent, and the, the Minister will go down in history as the Minister who handed back millions to London when families, workers and businesses were on their knees. It won't be a question then of blame the Brits or Tory austerity if you have handed back millions to the, the Tory pot. Let's take the opportunity to invest now in the front line, invest in communities, invest in those who need it. I call on Kathleen Boylan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I thank the Minister for her statement and I welcome the opportunity to speak on the most here on the floor today. No doubt this year proved to be a highly challenging period for setting the budget. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has meant that the financial circumstances this year have been unique, to say the least. Primarily, we are living in a public health crisis as COVID-19 has a devastating impact on many families and communities as the virus spreads. On top of this, it has also become a severe economic and social crisis with nearly every aspect of society being impacted in some way. Throughout this period, the executive had to act quickly to provide funding to deal with this. However, the pandemic continues to exact a heavy toll on our economy. It goes without saying that the North was left in a financially precarious position even before the first COVID case reached this island due to the years of scathing Tory austerity that has stripped away at our very vital public services. Those same services, mind you, that continue in their heroic after efforts in responding to these extraordinary times. From an infrastructure standpoint, you need not look far to see the damage of the lack of sustainable funding. The central resource issue for the Department arises from the cut to the Department's resource budget evident from 2015, as the Black Grant suffered cuts at the behest of austerity. During this time, roads maintenance suffered from inadequate baseline funding, resulting, resulting in a skeleton maintenance service. Our water and waste serv wastewater services suffered inadequate funding, and the provision of public transport was only sustained by Trans TransLink's reliance on its reserves. For example, its reserves have reduced from 56 million in 2015 to a projected 24 million by March of 2020. As I said at previous speeches concerning the budget, if public transport was better funded throughout the years, it might have been in a stronger position to respond to this pandemic. Meanwhile, funds that have went to Translink could have been spent on other high priority issues during COVID. However, it was in a dire financial position before this pandemic even began. COVID has once again demonstrated that the undeniable priority of properly funding our vital public services. No doubt it has re reasserted the need to break away from such failed economic policies of the past. It is under this strenuous financial position that I commend the work of the Finance Minister in delivering what he has during his tenure. Last year, the Department for Infrastructure saw its resource budget rise by 8.6 per cent while receiving the capital allocation of £558 million, the largest ever made through the Department. 
Meanwhile, throughout the year, the Department was a large recipient of funding for COVID pressures, receiving around £200 million for pressures, with around half of that going towards Translink, which is a strong demonstration of the Finance Minister's recognition of the importance of public services such as public transport. The next financial year's budget is a standstill one, as it largely reflects the budget that was in place last year, when our block grant was £360 million in real terms below pre-austerity levels. And all this is without mentioning the woeful yet predictable lack of follow-through from the British Government with regards to the commitments in the new decade, new approach. Despite this, in the draft budget, the Department of Infrastructure has received an allocation of £135 million higher than this year's opening position, which I urge to be prioritised for the improved delivery of services and the decarbonisation of the transport network. This should include essential projects such as the flagship capital projects, including the S6, investment in wastewater infrastructure, as well as greenways and cycle lanes, the improvement of our rural roads and, of course, the improvement of road safety, not least at all through the delivery of the vital A1 safety improvements. However, it needs to be said that significant challenges will persist for all departments. For as long as we continue to be wedded to austerity policies, the North as a whole will be limited in its ability to deliver an expansive budget fit for the people of the six counties. In keeping with this sentiment, I would like to members to remember where the true structural problems lies when scrutinising our budgets and to look towards real solutions and alternatives such as the empowerment of our own domestic powers so we can have better control over our own destinies. I remain I now call Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Two or three issues uh, of a very general nature I want to address. Uh, the first is I really am surprised at the scale of the headroom that has been built in here. Um, a billion pounds of headroom. Now, surely the starting principle in respects of budgets is that you write them at this stage in the spring supplementary estimates and the budget bill, you write them to the last monitoring position. That, as I have always understood it, is the correct due process. That you don't create a false perception that you have money that you don't actually have. As I understand this billion pounds headroom, it's not that there is actually a billion pounds that is unallocated. There's the possibility of money to be allocated but the minister wants to keep his options open as to which department it should go to. And therefore, he builds in a headroom to each and every one of them. And then, at some point, a choice will be made to which the surplus 200 or 300 million might go to. But we, to build a headroom of what amounts to a billion pounds of money that, I, as I understand it, we don't have seems to me not to be a, a manner in which to, to proceed. It makes something of a mockery of financial legislation. Uh, financial legislation budgets, they should set a limit for each department to spend against. Uh, and then the, each department must, give account, uh, must uh, give account to its resource accounts as to how that many money is spent. But by giving each department this scale of overspend, then that means that next year, when they should be doing excess votes for money they spent that they didn't have, they won't have to do excess votes. And therefore, they won't have to apply explanations. So it's, a, it's an artificial creation, this billion pounds headroom, and it really is about causing the departments to escape the normal process of accountability through excess votes. That, Mr Deputy Speaker, is not being accountable to this House, and therefore I do seriously question why we are building in a headroom of that extent. Second issue, 
I want to address is the vexed issue of our provision for victims. We had the spectacle at last week's Finance Committee of being told that $430 million that was in the provisions was for the victim's pension, and then to be told by letter later, no, the officials had misspoke, it wasn't there. But surely there should be a provision in the spring supplementary estimates and the budget bill for the victim's pension. As I understand it, there are international accounting standards, and International Accounting Standard 37 is quite clear that you need to make a provision once a past event has led to a liability, and that's ticked in the victim's issue, once the legislation has been passed authorising the payments, and that is ticked, and once the liability has been reliably estimated. And the Minister told us last week that they'd had actuaries give us figures. So there is an established liability. The Court of Appeal has said it has to be paid. There is legislation passed uh, authorising it. There is a liability uh, reliably established. So why are we not putting a provision in in these documents for the payment. Is the Minister hoping that, oh well, eh, maybe it will be swallowed up in the headroom, maybe therefore it will not even have to make an excess vote next year, and it will just all slip under the radar? The proper way to do this, I respectfully suggest, is for the Minister to amend his own bill, the budget bill, to put a provision in. That would be the correct financial way to proceed, to bring an amendment to his bill to put in a provision for the payment of the pension. Now, the Department keeps telling us it will be paid. Well, if it's going to be paid, then make a provision for it in the bill. Why would that not be done? That seems to me to be the essential and proper course of action. So I'd like to hear from the Minister how, where we now stand on the provision of the victim's pension. Uh, we're sure it's going to be paid, but if it's going to be paid, why are we not putting a provision in the bill to cover it? That would seem the logical and natural thing to do. And the final thing I wanted to do, mention was the ubiquitous black boxes that have excited me from time to time in these debates. And uh, just before this debate started, at 18 minutes past one, we got an email. Uh, from uh, telling us that there was a, an amendment to the uh, spring supplementary estimates to give some further explanation. That's good. I welcome the fact that there is now more fulsome explanation as to why we, don't, why we ha- are relying to £50 million worth of expenditure on the sole authority of the budget bill. The whole idea of budget arrangements is that legislation provides for spending and then you can hold accountability to it. Where you do not have legislation authorising expenditure, then there is a provision for sole authority of the budget bill, but the guidance says it shouldn't exceed £1.5 million in any one incident. Would you Here we have close? an accumulation of £50 million including £40 million in welfare and £7 million on an overspend on the Social Investment Fund, uh, and no immediate legislation. The member's time I don't is think up. that's acceptable. And I call Gerry Carl. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The vote on the count obviously is required to allow the budget to proceed and money to be allocated accordingly. However, these estimates in the budget that will likely uh, come uh, reflects, uh, in my opinion, an unfair, unambitious budget in a time of severe economic uncertainty, societal upheaval in the middle of huge turmoil. People have obviously sacrificed a lot. They have lost jobs, lost income, and tragically, too many have lost their lives. And the response from the executive is that we will have a standstill budget, as it's being described, which, in further digging, uh, given that many services have been paused or halted, it is not an accurate description of what this budget will represent. A standstill budget in real terms, uh, with a society emerging from a pandemic, 
in reality is a budget that fails to support ordinary people and in many cases exacerbates the deep problems faced before the pandemic, through it and afterwards. And Mr Deputy Speaker, trodden along as normal while ruling out systemic and fundamental policy shift uh, is shocking but true to form from the Executive. And in this documentation given before this debate, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have many figures and numbers uh, and I want to ask for some clarity uh, on them. Some require explanation and further scrutiny as well. Uh, firstly, in Table 1, the summary of estimates for health resource, there is a proposed reduction of uh, £588 million from what the Health Department said it needed and what it is now getting or is now able to spend. And you can use whatever technical language you want uh, to explain this, uh, but the fact that the Health Minister is either uh, sp- uh, reducing or saying he can't uh, spend this money. Uh, which is about a half a billion pounds at a time when we have increasing waiting lists for elective surgery, a growing mental health crisis uh, with huge demand because of COVID, leaves a lot of questions uh, to be answered. Why isn't this money and further money being set aside to pay to train more counsellors, ensure every GP has a mental health service uh, in-house? My own constituency, 50 per cent of GPs, shockingly, do not have those facilities in place. So I would join with, uh, with others, Mr Speaker. Uh, scratching their heads uh, and furious about this move and and asking questions uh, about it. Old ways of doing things have to be discarded, and every single penny and pound must be used to protect people uh, and support their health, especially those impacted by the pandemic and consequences from it. When you further look through the estimates, um, Mr Speaker, you cannot help but be convinced that the requirement to increase public spending across every single department, and in particular those areas which are specifically designed to help those who rely on public services, welfare system, uh, etc., uh, is not uh, really there. And when you look at the budgetary estimates, there appears to be a reduction in child maintenance service provision. Why is this? Further digging shows a significant reduction, uh, as my reading of it is, happy to be corrected, in the discretionary support scheme. Uh, and I would ask how sufficient this is, given the massive increase in universal credit claimants, but also the amount of people who have struggled to get access to proper financial support uh, to socially isolate uh, through the pandemic. The current system is well uh, below what is required. We also see a housing benefit reduction, Mr uh, Speaker, and we need to see uh, an explanation as to why this is the case, given the financial pressures people face in the current period to be able to afford uh, their rent uh, at all. Uh, there also appears to be reduction in the money set aside for JSA and income support, and uh, I would appreciate some clarity uh, <coughs> on this as well. Uh, the estimates state, Mr Speaker, that the housing grants increased the housing executive is, is, to, is to increase, obviously, uh, and this is to be welcome, uh, but only if it is to roll out public housing rather than be a, a cash injection to roll out a scheme to privatise and rip up the housing executive as a public institution. Uh, and I am very concerned as well, Mr Speaker, the education estimates and provision that there is a reduction uh, in youth and other children's services and appears to be around £200,000 from my reading. We need to see greater provision uh, in new services coming out of lockdown. So how does this figure sit with the need uh, to meet that demand? And obviously there's a, there's a figure around a reduction uh, in net cash, requ- net cash requirement of uh, almost £40 million for pension scheme of people covered by the teachers' superannuation scheme. Uh, it hasn't said why that's the case, so I would appreciate an answer uh, on that, if possible, Mr uh, Speaker. Um, also, Mr. Speaker, there appears to be a reduction in the hospital, paramedic, and ambulance services. Uh, and again, I would ask why that is the case. The NIA, NIAS uh, needs greater funding and assistance. Uh, so, why is there a reduction in the money relating to this? It's also very, very concerning, Mr. Speaker, uh, when you compare the net provision compared with the new net provision for our trusts. There's a gap of uh, £676 million. Pounds. And given the pressures uh, our trusts and services are under, and the fact that we only heard this morning Chief Executive of Trusts saying that the health budget is nowhere near sufficient to meet the needs of people here, uh, and everyone clapped for the NHS, but the Executive continues, continues to underfund our health service. Uh, and we have a re- reduction, Mr. Speaker, uh, in the figures around the Northern Ireland medical and dental training 
uh, agency with no explanation as to why. And given the, the many issues in regards to dental health, I would question that and ask for an explanation uh, of that uh, as well. Uh, there is also just a final question, Mr. Speaker. Um, under the TEO headline uh, A6 provisions, there is a substantial increase, but uh, it has not appeared in the documentation anywhere what that is for, and I would appreciate an answer and clarity on that. So I do think we need clarity on these questions, Mr. Speaker. Um, this is a quite a frustrating process, I'm sure, for everybody, but especially for a, an MLA, a sole MLA and a small party, perhaps purposefully so, to blunt the executive from the real criticism of the impact of its financial decisions. So I think we do need answers to all these questions today, but ultimately what we need is a fundamental shift in the political and economic narrative. Uh, the rich have done very well throughout this crisis. They've been immunised from this pandemic, and it's now time for the executive and the finance minister to publicly and loudly not just state this, uh, but to fight to shift this imbalance. Otherwise, we will continue to have budgets and policy decisions that fail the vast majority of people here. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on the Minister of Finance, Conor Murphy, and just to advise you that you have up to 23 minutes of your time left. Uh, the debate today has covered many aspects relating to public expenditure, or perhaps a few topics not as closely related to the matter in the hand. Nevertheless, I will endeavour to address uh, as many of the points raised during the debate as I can in the time allotted. Uh, firstly, may I once again thank the Finance Committee for their agreement to take this important legislation through by accelerated passage. This agreement secures a, a timely trans transition of the legislation through the Assembly, thereby avoiding any legal uncertainty over the funding of public services for the remainder of 2020-21 and the early months of 2021-22. I listen with interest to the debate today. I'd like to turn to perhaps some of the issues that, that were raised, uh, some of the questions that were asked. Uh, the uh, the uh, chair of the committee asked uh, the, the point of a, a, called an epilogue, a final rundown. And it has always been my intention, rather than bringing uh, oral statements to the Assembly on a weekly basis, because we have been making allegations, hence the need for uh, quite a lot of headroom. Uh, we have been making a, a, a allocations uh, fairly regularly to, at the end of that process to come in and give a final summation of all of those uh, allocations. Uh, and of course, uh, in, in doing that, I have said publicly that, and I said in my opening remarks, that I would like to, uh, to try and deal with as many of those who have not yet received support uh, as I possibly can, but that is within the restrictions of the framework under which my department can actually uh, make some allocations. Uh, the, there were a question from uh, the Chair of the Economy Committee in relation to additional bids, and I have, I have listed uh, some of those. We, we have been told, uh, and I am waiting on, on one uh, final bid, I think, from uh, TEO for, uh, for travel agents. Uh, we hope to be able to secure some support for them. She also asked in relation to the furlough scheme uh, that, would, that would be an announcement. Of course, the furlough scheme goes to the end of April, uh, but I think everyone would recognise that emergence from this pandemic and the impact and the economic impact of lockdown will last long beyond that. And I would hope, as we have pressed over the last year uh, with Treasury on many occasions for them to continue on the furlough scheme, certainly uh, specifically focused at least on those uh, parts of business and industry that will struggle uh, to open up in the time ahead. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Chair of the Health Committee, uh, not surprisingly, asked about health funding issues. Uh, and the spending review, of course, as I stated in January, has not delivered the level of support required. Uh, and, and most people will be aware of that, the fact that we had been planning all year on a multi-annual budget and hope, and hope for a better budget outcome, and we end up with a, uh, an annual budget with uh, effectively a standstill of our budget position for, for most departments that, in, in, in effect, is a reduction uh, in, in the budget in the time ahead. Uh, so uh, I do think that the, uh, the, the, while the draft budget provides almost $6.5 billion of resource fund to the Health Department, a single-year settlement does not provide them with the platform for rebuilding the health services that any of us wanted. Uh, and that requires a sustainable multi-annual budget to enable effective planning, and the Health Minister is aware and that both he and, I'm sure, and the Executive remain committed to working uh, towards that goal, uh, ultimately. Uh, the, uh, the, just to, to go through some of the issues, uh, the, the, uh, there was some question I, I, I found it somewhat amusing 
Uh, firstly, there was a deliberate misunderstanding. I'm surprised at the former finance minister uh, who knows these things. Uh, I'm not so surprised maybe at, at some of the other uh, finance committee people, but uh, he'll know, of course, that uh, I recommend to the executive uh, what bids are met. The executive decides. And I have to say, from my memory, as this was raised by a number of speakers, I, I was thinking about I can't remember a single division uh, or amendment to a financial paper that I brought to the executive this year, an allocations paper. So I could argue. Uh, with some uh, degree of validity that I had unanimous support for all of the allocations uh, that were, were, were made this year. Uh, and of course, the, the executive ultimately uh, decides in relation to those. Uh, and it's one thing to present the statistics and say, OK, we, there was a, th this number of bids were made, but the actual important figure is how much money was given. Uh, as, as a consequence of those uh, allocations. For, and Mr. Frew highlighted the Department for Economy, only 31 per cent of its bids yet, but it received £644 million of COVID funding, 79 per cent increase in its 2020-21 opening budget. Uh, so some departments were more selective. Some departments su submitted multiple bids. At times, an earlier part of the year, I come back to the issue in relation to infrastructure, and I don't wish to get involved in this particular barney, but the SDLP members uh, appear to want to focus on the infrastructure bid and why roads didn't uh, bid for any money in the latter end of the year. Uh, but uh, some departments made uh, bids. Some of the early funding was COVID-related. Uh, that's the case in June. Uh, that's where the bids were invited for. And departments made a whole range of all of their bids uh, for, for everything that, that were non-COVID uh, and so uh, allocations. So it's more important, I think, rather than to quote the statistics of how many bids you made for, for multiple small schemes than actually look at the money that you got. Uh, which I think would be more uh, of interest. But Mr. Frew also mentioned confidence in supply. Uh, I made a rather bizarre uh, claim that confidence in supply replaced uh, and, 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 uh, and, in effect, cancelled out all the years of austerity budgets. And I haven't got both figures to hand, but I would, I would guarantee him that there's a massive difference between the impact of nine or ten years of austerity budgets and confidence in supply. Confidence in supply wasn't, addressed, wasn't designed to address austerity. It consisted of package of ring-fenced one-off funding for a number of specific projects. So they, they couldn't go into anyone's baseline uh, as part of their overall spend, and therefore they couldn't begin to address austerity. But uh, the, uh, I, I would say, as I say, in relation to the, the figures uh, that he came up with, I, I, I found that quite bizarre. Uh, Matthew O'Toole complained about the lack of strategic plan, and I, I share his frustration. I wish there was a programme for government in place. I wish we had a multi-annual budget to go along with it, uh, and I wish all of those things, but we're in the middle of a pandemic, uh, and we didn't get any of that. And uh, so uh, I, 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 I'm sure he would understand, uh, as his minister would at the executive, uh, that we, uh, are, uh, we have been uh, trying our best uh, to not only to deal with the pandemic itself, but also in terms of strategic planning, particularly in relation to spending and finance. He knows that we got right throughout the course of the year, unannounced, uh, with no forewarning, uh, allocations of COVID funding uh, coming across the Treasury, which we welcomed. I uh, would not be, uh, be churlish by not welcoming that additional money we got. But we were told in the summertime that we had, this was the guarantee we had ahead, and we received several tranches of allocations post that. Uh, and we're told that one we got pre-Christmas uh, we could carry over. Then we were told in January we couldn't carry it over, and we have another allocation coming. So I, I accept that everybody understandably wants to see financial plan in which they can measure over the years what we intend to do, what the priorities are, and what the finances are allocated against it. But there's no one can say that this year was anything but extraordinary in terms of the ability to look ahead and the ability to actually know what we were getting to try and spend out uh, the money that, that we had in relation to that. And Andrew Moore raised that point about spending out. And, uh, his colleague, Mr McNulty, who is away, is very exercised about this, uh, the spending out of our money. He is afraid that I go down in history uh, as not spent out. I can say that we have uh, firstly pressed departments to come forward with bids for that, uh, and that we have, uh, we have a contingency plans, which I intend to bring to the executive this Thursday. Uh, to make sure that we do spend out the money available. It is not the best way. It is better than handing money back to get money support out to businesses and others on the ground to try and assist in economic recovery, of course, is welcome. But it is not the best way to spend out money that we are we're scrambling to get this out. It does not have that strategic uh, direction that others would wish to see. I am happy to give way. Can I just ask him on that regard, in terms of um, Treasury allocations, is he anticipating, obviously he won't know until Wednesday, is he anticipating further allocations from the UK budget on Wednesday, and is that part of the reason why 
there are the additional the additional headroom that Mr. Alistair was talking about. No, we're not anticipating uh, uh, further allocations that will be able to go into our baseline for next year. Now, whether there will be additional money that's coming across uh, as Barnet consequentials or uh, indicative spend that, uh, that may come through to us, that, that is a possibility. And of course, we, we wait to see what that will look like. I, I'm, I sincerely hope that the, the announcements on, uh, on Wednesday don't herald a return to austerity policies again. Uh, but I, well, I don't anticipate getting anything which we can add to our baseline, and the inclusion of headroom is to do with the spending out of our existing uh, COVID money rather than anticipation uh, of more money being added to our baselines. Uh, Andrew Moore also asked uh, about the, the situation on the ports, and, and my view was at the time that the Minister did not have the authority from any legal advice I have seen to, since confirms that view that the Minister did not have the authority to take those decisions. And I think the sooner we get to uh, back to a sensible way of the executive dealing with all of the issues which flow from Brexit and, and the protocol are only one set of issues or a huge number of issues that flow from uh, Brexit and dealing with those sensibly around the table like adults, then the better for all of us. Uh, and, and an atmosphere which increasingly others are trying to agitate uh, and turn uh, into community tension, then I think every action or every word that we say in this, in this regard uh, needs to be very carefully minded to make sure that we are not contributing uh, to any of that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm briefly. I'm running short of time. Right, okay. Uh, would the minister confirm that in order to take decisions, as the nature has been outlined last Friday, that would require a ministerial direction, and that would have to be reported through to yourself and the executive? Well, the the the, the, uh, the statement or the, the letter that came from the minister for Fi or for agriculture was very short, uh, and so there's quite a lot of detail behind it as to actually what processes uh, took place. And I have no doubt the executive is going to discuss it again tomorrow. Uh, I think the committee is going to want to have a look at that as well, as to see uh, what instructions were given. But the, the, the statement made it clear that instructions were given to stop work, uh, which I, I am firmly of the view and, and remain firmly of the view uh, were not. The minister didn't have the authority to do because it was an executive uh, policy matter, uh, and it required cross, uh, cross executive support. And, and any issues of concern in the port of any of the protocol arrangements or any other arrangements relating to Brexit should be brought to the executive for discussion, so we can have a collective view in relation to that. Particularly, as I say, given the circumstances and the atmosphere that some people uh, are trying to, to raise. Uh, uh, the, there were a number of people raised uh, the issue of the, the, the victims. Uh, funding, uh, pensions and payments. Uh, and can I say there was a, 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 an honest mistake made in relation to the committee the other day. It was a verbal mistake. It wasn't a written one. Uh, it was one figure in a document of over 300 pages, uh, and the mistake was corrected within 24 hours uh, uh, to the committee. Uh, so uh, I, I hope people don't set the same standard for themselves that they seem to set for officials when they're coming in answering very detailed questions, uh, because there would be very few MLAs left sitting around here if that was the case. Uh, but as I pointed out at the Finance Committee, including a provision in the departmental estimates and accounts does not predetermine who will actually fund the cost of the payment. So the inclusion of this figure is necessary under accounting rules. Uh, and a, a, provision, uh, sorry, a provision is a liability of uncertain timing or amount and should be recognised when certain criteria are fulfilled. So it's an accounting concept, and as I say, the absence uh, of a victim's payment provision from the estimate will have no impact on TEO's legal power to make victims payments to victims in 2021-22. Uh, the executive fully recognises that the obligation to make payments to victims. The dispute is about how these are funded. Uh, and I notice again, I listened closely to Ms. Alistair. I'm not sure again he didn't come off the fence to say who should actually pay for this. I think he, he just, as, as he said on previous occasions, this, somebody, somebody should do something about this. Uh, but the, the question, of course, is uh, who designed the scheme, who legislated for the scheme. Was it the policy that the parties agreed to Stormont House, which clearly it was not? Uh, has the departure from what was agreed to Stormont House added significantly to the cost of the scheme? Clearly it has. Uh, have we accurate figures? No, we do not. We have an estimate from the Actuary Department, which is anything between uh, six, six or eight hundred million and one point two billion, uh, which is not uh, an accurate figure of which to go on, and we wish uh, to bottom that out. So the cost of, of provision uh, is something which is still clearly uh, very much uh, in uh, a question attached to it. Uh, there are estimates around that. Uh, they are probably as good as we might get in the time ahead. But the clear question is those who added to the scope. Uh, and the remit and therefore the cost of the scheme as to how they intend to meet uh, that which they have added to it. I am happy to give away. But surely, in budgetary terms, there needs to be a provision 
it needs to be, there needs to be an ambit in the budget to pay it. Uh, and why is the minister not putting that in? How is it going to be paid if there's no ambit within the budget to pay it? Well, I think we have uh, uh, arrangements and discussions ongoing with the government, uh, and we wish to see that quickly resolved. We, we have been pressing the government, as he knows, since last September for a meeting to resolve this. We only got one last week, uh, and we want to, uh, as I say, the, the provision in it doesn't predetermine who pays it. Our interest is getting uh, to the point of, of determining who pays uh, for this scheme. Uh, there were other issues raised. Uh, uh, Mr. I was going to come to your piece now in a minute, so I'm happy to wait. If you, if you have more you want to add to me. Uh, and I thank the Minister. Given the fact there's a lot of talk about, I think the quote he made was, those who added to the scope of the pension, will he now take the opportunity to agree with me in the House that those who are responsible for creating the victims should also be made to pay? And given the fact that the IRA was able to get a £25 million pension scheme for its members as a result of the raid on the Northern Bank, is it now time for the IRA and for Republicans who are responsible for creating victims to come up with money and to ensure that if they're genuine and moving forward, they pay for their past? Well, if the member can find somewhere to send the bill, then I wish him luck with that endeavour. Uh, but can I say, back in the real world where we're trying to deal with these issues, uh, Mr. Catney asked about multi-year budgets and, and the flexibility required to carry over, and he, he quite rightly says it's not a big ask, but unfortunately it's not, our, it's not up to us uh, to deliver in relation to that. Uh, issues were raised by a number of speakers, I, I think from a justice and, and, and policing perspective, about the NDNA PSNI recruitment. Uh, and I accept it says the, exec the, the executive took responsibility for delivery of NDNA, but in our discussions with the government at that time, they took responsibility for providing funding for it. Now, they withdrew that uh, offer or they withdrew that commitment within 24 or 48 hours uh, of, the, uh, of the NDNA agreement being reached. Uh, as soon as they got Boris Johnson back out the door, then they quickly uh, withdrew all the financial commitments. And, and there are a range of issues, including that funding for increasing policing, which we do want to see. Uh, that, that have, uh, have been difficult to address because we don't have the funding for it. There are a, a, a much bigger range of issues than that. And then allied to that, we end up with a flat cash budget for this year, which means, in effect, for the Department of Justice and a whole range of other departments, a cut uh, in their budgets for this year. And as others, I think the, uh, uh, Linda Dillon pointed out, uh, we could end up in the bizarre circumstances where we're actually losing uh, police personnel uh, in the time ahead. So clearly not what was committed to and certainly not what uh, is deliverable in the time ahead, although we certainly do want uh, to do that. Uh, the, uh, I, I, back to this issue of the, uh, the roads maintenance, uh, and I mean, I, I was going to say I've been down this road, pardon the pun, but I've been the Minister for, uh, that, uh, for Regional Development. It is a, it's a very difficult Thing because it has been under-resourced for many years. I acknowledge, absolutely acknowledge that. Uh, the, the road structure that we have would require vast sums of money to bring it up to standard, particularly our rural roads, uh, which are poorly built and have been poorly maintained over the years. And we got into a circumstance where you know, they are partially patched uh, and that does not really do anything for their longer-term structure. Uh, so clearly there is a substantial budget, but there was uh, the the Department for Infrastructure did get a resource budget of just under £418 million pounds and a capital budget of £558. Now, the capital budget, uh, 422 of that, was not ring-fenced and could be allocated uh, in, in accordance with how uh, the Department saw fit. Uh, uh, interestingly, Mr McNulty cobbled together two bids. There was a, a June uh, uh, funding bid uh, monitor around, which was COVID-related. Uh, so clearly, and it was vastly oversubscribed uh, by departments, uh, so clearly a lot of departments were not going to get uh, what they had asked for. The Department of Infrastructure did bid for roads maintenance and street lighting repairs, uh, and due to, the, as I said, the need to prioritise COVID funding, it was not possible to fund that. The department did get £35.5 million of the available funding in that, in that round, which is about 21 per cent of the funding. Mr. McNulty then adds on the bid again uh, to say that because it was another bid for the same thing for street lighting in, uh, in October. There were no further bids made for roads maintenance in either October or January. And as I say, having been uh, Minister responsible for road service uh, over four years, uh, they, it was a, a, a very 
well-established pattern of roads bidding for money at that time of the year because they had the possibility of spending out. And that's why I was surprised that there was no bid come in at that stage uh, for funding. And there's absolutely no doubt, I know from my own constituency, that there's certainly a need there. Uh, but there was no further bids come in for road maintenance. Uh, that's the, the Minister's decision. Uh, and, and she, of course, uh, can, can uh, explain and answer for that. Uh, but it, I'm, I, haven't been, I haven't been wishing to get into this particular uh, thing, but I find myself uh, answering press releases of statements and saying that I, I refuse to give uh, roads money. There were opportunities. Uh, there was a substantial amount of resource money available uh, since January, and there were no bids come in for that. Uh, the other, uh, some of the other questions that were asked, I, I, I mean, uh, Philip Wigan also referred, referred to the strategic plan, and I suppose the same uh, answer applies in relation to uh, uh, you know, the year that we have in, in it. And uh, despite any desire for strategic plan and uh, just the sheer impossibility of doing that, uh, Mr. McNulty again asked where is the finance for health that was promised. Well, he just has to join the dots. We get the budget we get. Uh, it comes from Treasury, and that's who decides how much money we have. And that's why we have a worse budgetary situation next year than we've had this year. Uh, and, and people should, at least at this stage of their uh, experience in this chamber and their representation, understand the basics of how our funding works. Uh, uh, he asked about long-term certainty for casement. Again, should understand also how budget works. Capital projects get the year the year's money that they need, and they have got that in full. Uh, they've got the, the money this year in full that they needed. The money for next year is committed to casement. It is a flagship scheme for the uh, executive, uh, and therefore uh, the, uh, the, the, the clear commitment from the executive to, to that project. Uh, and to say, well, we've got the money for next year, but then we'll stop building after that is a bit ludicrous. Uh, and I, I often wonder why someone who purports to support this project, ask questions about it, and then actually creates uncertainties in and around it when we have done that. The support for social clubs he also mentioned. Uh, and can I say that the, the scheme that the Department of Communities is operating in support of social clubs was designed with the sports organising bodies. So the sports, the GAA, Ulster Council, would have designed the scheme to support uh, their own clubs in relation to that. So if there are issues with that, uh, then he should take them up there. Uh, and again, as I say, he's very exercised about the possibility of me underspending, and I have to say I have plans clearly uh, to do that. I think we have uh, dealt with the issues. Uh, uh, sorry, Jerry Carroll asked a whole series of very detailed questions at the end, and I don't have the time uh, or the, the, the ability to get through my paperwork here to get the answers, but I can assure you I will ask officials to uh, take note of the range of questions you asked and, and get back uh, to you in relation to that. Uh, Karen Corla, I, I have to draw my remarks to a close, uh, but can I just say that the approval of the supply motion today and the associated departmental expenditure plans laid out in the 2020-21 spring supplementary estimates and the 21-22 voting account is a crucial stage of the existing public expenditure cycle. Failure to pass these supply resolutions at this juncture would put at risk the smooth continuation of public services and the vital support that our citizens, hospitals, schools and businesses require to respond to the COVID pandemic for the remainder of this financial year and into the next financial year. I therefore commend the spring supplementary estimates for 2020-21 and the vote and account for 21-22 to the Assembly, and I ask members to support the motions. Thank you, Minister. Um, remember, before we proceed to the question, it would remind members that it is established practice that the vote on this motion requires cross-community support. And the question is that the motion relating to the supply resolution for the spring supplementary estimates 2020 to 2021, as detailed on the order paper, be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. All those in favour say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Okay, so the, the eyes have that. Thank you. We will now move on to the motion on the supply resolution for the vote on account 2021 to 2022, which has already been debated. And I will ask the clerk to read the motion. The motion relating to the supply resolution for the Northern Ireland estimates vote on account 2021-2022, as detailed on the order paper, be agreed. I call the Minister of Finance to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. And before we proceed to the question, again remind members that it is established practice that the vote on this motion requires cross community support. The question is that the motion relating to the supply resolution for the NI estimates vote on account 2021 to 2022, as detailed on the order paper, be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. 
All those in favour say aye. Order. Just all those in favour say aye. Aye. I can't we know? The ayes have it. Thank you. The ayes have it. The next item on, of business on the order paper is the first stage of the budget bill, and I call the Minister of Finance. Can I beg to introduce the Budget Bill 2021? Clerk, please read the long title. <clears throat> a bill to authorise the issue out of the consolidated fund of certain <clears throat> sums for the service of the years ending 31 March 2021 and 2022, to appropriate those sums for specified purposes, <clears throat> to authorise the use of the public service of certain resources for those years, to revise the limits on the use of certain accruing resources in the year ending 31 March 2021, and to authorise the Department of Finance to borrow on the credit of the sum appropriated for the year ending 31 March 2022. Thank you. And that constitutes the Bill's first stage, and it shall now be printed. I can also inform members that I have received a letter from the Committee for Finance informing that the Committee is satisfied that the consultation with it on the public expenditure proposals contained in the Bill has been appropriate as required under Standing Order 42.2. Thank you. And item 4 on the order paper is the adjournment. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. Thank you. <coughs>